Hello, welcome and good morning on uh, the last day of this year's AS Electronica Festival. It's day five and it is our pre AS Electronica day. Um, we are here again, it's the last time that uh, afterwards, uh, uh, together with my colleagues, we explain you a little bit uh, what happened uh, yesterday, <coughs> uh, the same ritual like every day. But it is my honor today to be the, the main moderator and to give you a little bit of a uh, an idea what uh, programs that we are going to prepare for you. In session one, which is my session, uh, it is about pareidolia, which is this phenomenon where we, are where we are lying in the grass, in the green grass, looking at the sky, whether it's the stars or the clouds, and um, we're trying to find some textures, some Einsteins, some Marilyn Monroes, or so whom then ever. Um, with that uh, topic comes, uh, there are going to come two wonderful guests. It's going to be Sarah Petkus and Mark Koch, um, very well known friends of uh, the Ars Electronica family. I'm very much looking forward. Another topic uh, that uh, uh, where I'm honored to uh, welcome two guests is a rather sad one. It is uh, um, about the sad fading away of Joachim Sauter. Um, it is a tribute, actually, to Joachim Sauter. Let's approach this in a positive way. And uh, who else than Jussi Angrisleva, uh, his long-term friend and colleague, together with Gerfred, do a little, uh, do a 30-minute session with a focus on this wonderful person. Um, in session two, it's all about sound art and AI. Rashin Fahandey, um, a wonderful person with a wonderful piece that uh, is exhibited on actually two places here at the festival, will be joining us and it will be uh, about the pre-digital uh, music category and sound art category together with Cedric Fermont and Alexander Schubert. Uh, Cedric, um, a former winner and Alexander, the this year's winner, uh, here on stage. Um, part three is going to be about art thinking. Art thinking is uh, something that is deeply, a term that is simply deeply coined by Ars Electronica, actually by Ars Electronica Future Lab. Um, and uh, it's Amy Whittaker together with Joe Paradiso in a conversation with uh, Mr. He himself, our okay, Gerfried Stocker. And then part four is Clapping on our shoulder, hugging us virtually and real. It is the recap session, the festival closing. Um, we actually don't know yet what to do there. Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, in between there is an entire intensive day that Crystal will introduce of us later on uh, together with Veronica. Uh, but join us. Uh, I think you will see energized, very tired, but very happy persons talking about the wonderful festival. Uh, that uh, we have been uh, um, experienced. Uh, but now I uh, give the mic to my dear colleague Crystal and she will tell us a little bit what happened yesterday because yesterday was the Full Swing Festival Day. Crystal. Yes, thank you, Marv. It really was this Full Swing Festival Day. It, the sun was shining, there were Groups of people walking around everywhere. You really had the feeling everyone came, whether it was local uh, partners, local audiences, and as well, many artists, many international guests came to Linz. And it really felt yeah. the f like this festival day that we were so eagerly waiting for. And we had huge amounts of programs, whether it was AI lab conferences that went into depth of what AI and feudalism is about. But on the other side, we had those super charming programs of where the U19 winners received the awards, their golden knickers. And it was this, you know, the, the place uh, on Main Square in a way in the city uh, where everyone comes and looks at those young talents uh, very charmingly telling us about their visions, their ideas and thoughts. And this, this kind of mood this spread out through the whole festival we had in our sound park, uh, groups of people constantly lying around in the grass, looking in the sky, looking for patterns in the cloud, as Martin just said, or uh, enjoying, sleeping. or <laughs> sleeping possibly as well, of course, uh, enjoying the sun, enjoying food and drinks and company of the wonderful people. It was the day where the locals with the international groups met again. And I think, we all really, really enjoyed that day that brought us again together, that again gave this festival spirit. And 
We, of course, continued. The exhibitions are still open. Uh, we had in the evening a, a wonderful small nightline party also for our dear team members uh, that allowed them to dance a little bit, have some nice tunes. The band Frau Sommer was playing a really, really funky Austrian band and then followed by uh, a DJ set from Zanschien. And it was, yeah, it was just this amazing atmosphere here that I think we all really were waiting for. But let's have a look at some of those images, some of impressions. Well, and now I give the mic to my dear colleague, uh, Veronica. She will uh, introduce us into the free forum and uh, other interesting conferences, conference formats. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, as uh, you've seen, we had a really outstanding program yesterday, but there is uh, a lot of exciting program also ahead of us still on the very last day of Ars Electronica and it is basically our highlight it's our treasure it is definitely i would say the excellence of Ars Electronica our Prias Electronica of course and uh, as you all know by now um, Ars Electronica is not only a platform for exhibition projects uh, we also try to be a forum where everyone uh, who wants to contribute actually can also shape the discussions um, and this is or will be very much done so also today within the pre as electronica conference and uh, forums this afternoon so we will have both a conference here on site if you're in linz please come to the circus of knowledge the circus des wissens in the kepler's gardens or just attend via our streaming on our online platform swap card for all these forums, always a jury member um, of uh, this year's uh, Prias Electronica jury will host a discussion together with the Prias Electronica winners. And this year's forum include three different talks on the three categories we had. In the computer animation section, Helen Starr will be talking to Zhuang Li Liu, uh, Veneta Androva, and Eric O. Oh, the theme of the talk is the enchantment of humanism. In the digital music sound art section, Cedric Fermont talks to Alexander Schubert, um, then also Rasheen Van Day and Douglas McCausen about a pandemic um, that didn't stop the sound. And in the area of artificial intelligence and life art, Jens Hauser, together with um, forensic architecture, the Golden Nico winners, Masha Roux for the Award of Distinction at the Museum of Edible Earth, as well as Trank Xenolab uh, with Adriana Knuf, they will deal with IM material infrastructures. As I said, all this can be attended both on site as online as well as online. And it's definitely a big, big, big recommendation from our side. What's what's next? Do we have a video for this? Yeah, I think we do. Cool. Yeah, Perfect. we have Let's an insight into the uh, cyber arts exhibition, uh, specifically in the AI and life art category. Video, please. Welcome to the cyber arts exhibition. We are here in the category of artificial intelligence and life art. Sound for Fungi brilliantly translates art science research and philosophical reflections on the nature of networks into a convincing way of audience interaction. The interactive and generative video installation simulates Schubert's experiments. 
The golden Nike of the category artificial intelligence and life art goes to forensic architecture. There are several investigations combined to a fantastic video installation which brings together research from many areas around the world. With the help of facial recognition software, artist and activist Paolo Girio extracted the faces of 4,000 police officers that were taken during protests in France. He then created an online platform to crowdsource their identification by name. The next step of the project was to expose the officers' headshots in form of street art posters in public space. So this is my project TX1, uh, which launched fragments of my hormone replacement medications to the International Space Station. It was meant to enact a symbolic exodus to outer space for those trans, queer, and xenotypes who don't always find the Earth to be hospitable. Coupled with this project uh, is a three-channel video which uses the TX1 project as a starting point for exploring questions of queer futurities, how we imagine life in outer space in Alienus. The Transparency of Randomness is an interactive installation generating numbers by using the well-known medium of the dice. In every box, there is a different material. With all these different surfaces, every box has its own characteristic. With our installation, we want to invite the visitors to think about what real randomness is. They can also be part of the installation by taking control over one of the boxes with their own smartphone, and so they can generate their own random number. Geophagy is the practice of eating earth and earth-like substances such as clay and chalk. It is an ancient spiritual and healing practice and an integral part of culture in several countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Masha Ru's cross-disciplinary project, The Museum of Edible Earth, presents a collection of almost 400 earth samples originating in 36 countries that are eaten for various reasons by different people across the globe. Alison Parrish pushes language into philosophical and sometimes humorous territory through a combination of phonetic embodiment and machine learning techniques. What we see here is AI-based poetry. A model was trained with two parts, a speller, which spells words based on how they sound, and a sound outer, which sounds out words based on how they are spelled. With Slave Rebellion enactment, black social and political artist Dred Scott has initiated a reenactment of the Slave Rebellion in New Orleans in 1811. He is reviving the strength of the community as they fight for emancipation and freedom. The community performance consists of more than 300 black and indigenous people dressed in 19th century clothing and traveling with horses for two days before they arrive in New Orleans. The clean room paradox is a work that kind of unveils the praxis of kind of clean image of high-tech industries. Corroded smartphones as kind of an ink to produce this portrait. Play is a project uh, where cucumbers and an AI-controlled robot engage in play. They explore each other through cucumber tendrils, which move and search for something to hold on to. And the artificial intelligence has its own metal tendrils, which it approaches the cucumbers in hopes for some contact. And uh, we actually have a screen here that is doing time lapse in real time that shows the dynamic between the cucumber and the robot. Um, that was uh, uh, a little insight into a, a wonderful exhibition, I have to say, and really, I mean, uh, the harvest of the this year's free as electronica, not only in this category, was just outstanding. Outstanding due to the fact that uh, you could read, so to speak, the entire global situation uh, expressed by the, by, the, by, the, by the endless diversity uh, uh, of artistical expression. Uh, but you also could see that uh, 
artists are citizens of this life and they are more and more uh, getting out of their bulb into the into the huge challenges of the entire society to take not to take over but to participate there and to bring in their critical mindset and it is the critical mindset uh, that is uh, uh, the main focus for the next thing I uh, the next project point I'd like to announce it is about art thinking art thinking is a term that as electronica has been coining since um, some years and it is about the question what art artists and their critical alternative artistical thinking is able to contribute in other fields. Uh, today we will have the Art Thinking Forum in Kepler's Gardens in the Circus of Knowledge online streamed as well. And um, uh, it's going to be about a wonderful collaboration as Electronica has been running together with uh, the Hakuodo Agency of Japan uh, who is co-hosting this. And uh, we will have um, free panels and we are going to raise their free questions uh, in relation to this uh, core question of what art thinking is able to contribute to, let's say, the entire society. It's going to be about the art uh, as a compass, um, uh, then the art as a catalyst as well as the art as journalism. We will meet Hideaki Ogawa, the co-director of uh, the Ars Electronica Future Lab, uh, in uh, conversation with uh, Karen Palmer, Dominic Chen, as well as John Palmesamo and Anne Sophie Ranskirk from Territory Agency. Don't miss this. It is for sure a very interesting and uh, uh, good event. Another um, um, session or event I'd like to uh, bring uh, in is the Ars Electronic Animation Festival. The animation category you need to know is one of the oldest or first categories uh, coming from the uh, pre as Electronica funded uh, uh, 1987. In 2005, uh, we developed out of this growing community, global community, let's call it industry, um, uh, so to speak, a specific program that we specifically curate for uh, the sake of different angles and different topics. It is a wonderful, colorful, entertaining format that we actually send all over the world uh, that is an imminent part of our export parts and it is as well um, uh, a, a very good program point that bridges so to speak um, the world the digital world or the interpretation of the digital world of us electronica with the all-day lives out there um, Expanded animation was the next uh, evolution step there. It, it is uh, a collaboration um, with one person. It's uh, Professor Jürgen Hagler. He is on the one side professor um, on the Applied University um, of Hagenberg, um, where he's teaching animation. And on the other side, he's representing in our program uh, in, at Ars Electronica um, um, the animation sector. Uh, indeed, uh, it's going to be uh, a very interesting and deep dive into another reality, into an industry, into a world that via technology is able to create other realities. No? <laughs> okay, uh, but now I think we have a little video uh, that uh, shows us uh, the animation festival as a teaser, please. in the studio after this uh, uh, nice teaser video I'd like to hand over um, the mic to Mrs. Veronica Liebel <laughs> and she will tell us a little bit uh, uh, of a extreme cool program it's about the Festival University. Yeah exactly so from one 
really already established university like uh, the Applied University of Hagenberg to one which is in the making. I would say our festival university, it's a pilot, it is an experiment and frankly also one of the most exciting programs I think we realized within the last years. Um, I believe that we all absolutely agree that of course our global challenges do need a completely different set also of approaches of strategies but before even starting to solve uh, things solve our problems we really need to rethink um, if we are asking the right questions and also if we are addressing actual relevant strategies and not strategies of the past and exactly such questions like uh, what does it take to initiate actual change what transformation can students spark for a better tomorrow or what collaborative concept of transformational change can students from all around the world working together for three weeks actually great and the program was simply fantastic. It is still ongoing, it's still ongoing for a week. They may be already a bit tired, but not a millimeter less uh, inspirational and excited. Um, it's actually 80 young people from across the world being really here on site, plus an additional uh, 20 students participating online. Um, and they have already, um, taken part in, I would say, long, long, long hours and sessions for the last uh, two uh, weeks. Of course, joined both lectures, also informal exchanges, um, a lot of workshops in particular, for example, on topics like artificial intelligence, robotics, drones, circular economy, sustainability, art and futuristic thinking, um, also forensic uh, journalism was part of, uh, of the workshops. And we had an amazing crowd here. Um, it was people, and I just, I'm going to read the countries because this is one <laughs> thing which actually blew our, all our minds, I think, when we received the applications. It is Austria, First one, <laughs> of course. Because then, of the age. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this out somewhere. Only because of this. <laughs> Already followed by Australia, uh, a country which we mm, sometimes are actually mixed up with. Uh, Azerbaijan, Belgium, Bul Bulgaria, Brazil, China, Colombia, Cuba, uh, Czech, uh, <laughs> Germany, Egypt, Spain, Finland, Greece, Guatemala, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Iceland. India, Ireland, Italy, Did Jamaica Cuba as well. Yes, okay. Cuba, Cuba was, was part of the list. <laughs> Japan, Sorry. South Korea, Kazakhstan, Lebanon, Latvia, Sri Lanka, Montenegro, Mexico, Vietnam, Nigeria, Netherlands. Sorry, it will take me another couple of names. Nepal, uh, Pakistan, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Russia, Slovenia, Slovakia, <laughs> Suriname, Turkmenistan, Turkey, Taiwan, Ukraine. United Kingdom and USA. I wouldn't mention this in such a way if this is not such an exciting mixture of different backgrounds, different nationalities, different mindsets, uh, mindsets also visions represented in this festival university. And in case you didn't count, it was more than 50 countries. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely fantastic to have them uh, being part of the program and uh, if you happen to be in Linz uh, there is a presentation happening today at 2 p.m. at the Festival University stage. It's not the final presentation yet, it's a mid-term presentation as you say in official academic language uh, and uh, this is um, something I absolutely recommend from my side. Let's have a look into a short teaser of the Festival University. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to the official kickoff of the Festival University. For me, like the transformative power mostly comes from people I meet. And I don't think there was one day within the last 60 years where 100 students coming from more than 40 countries met at this at the same time. Then we expect that uh, the unexpected will happen. Like everyone is going for technology nowadays, but don't forget about art. And this diverse thing is just so interesting because we learned so many things about politics, culture from one another.
A university should not be a factory. Since my childhood, I always wanted to change in the educational systems. A university should be a festival itself. Hello, everyone. It's a really fantastic program and we couldn't be more excited to having uh, those 80 individuals, those fantastic students from all different kinds of backgrounds, from all different kinds of expert fields, expertises, um, also different age groups starting at 16 until uh, 25 here in Linz. They are our future and they are currently discussing exactly what this could mean. Now we move forward to what you all can experience on our online platform. Internationally, we have all the gardens again participating this year, this day, and as the final day of the festival. And currently, actually, we have our partner festival channel already running, and it is Auckland and Wellington that are preparing and showing us a guided tour through their diverse garden program. So don't miss it before it's gone. And later today, we will offer a live guided tour through our exhibition here on site. It is about this topic digital and end life and how our lives are already so interwoven with the digital life that we hardly can distinguish it anymore and that we really need to see and discuss what different questions this, rises, uh, this brings up and how we can deal with the challenges that come along. Then we have another workshop actually um, and a guided tour which is digging deeper into this topic, linking it actually to the Festival University of Education for Future Generations in Art, Technology and Society. And this tour, this workshop is in collaboration with our garden in Birmingham, in Jerusalem, as well as in Newcastle, um, Australia. And another guided tour online is happening by our Moscow partners. They are going through the exhibition, it's a curator's tour, the exhibition is called Uncanny Dreams. And it is a project that has been developed together with um, two very dear friends, two artists, Helena Nikonole, that is in Moscow now working together with students that she's teaching um, on thinking about how the technology during the times of pandemic influenced and changed their own lives. And then the f final, not the final, the final program of the garden in Hong Kong actually, it is a very special event, it's called the intergalactic, the galactic wine sharing party. <laughs> and don't miss this. It's gonna be great. It is um, a hybrid, a dual event in a way that is linked and connected to the garden in Hong Kong, to a physical space at Osage Gallery, where there are going to be on-site guests. Uh, there's gonna be a guided tour through that exhibition. And then many of our international friends and partners will join to have a conversation, to share some time with each other and to have a gathering of friends. So don't miss that. We're going to be there as well to, of course, uh, have some chats and see you all then. I hand okay. over to you. Thank you. <laughs> so before I introduce you now in the next session, um, I'd like to thank you, dear ladies and colleagues, uh, for this insight of uh, what is going what we are going to have uh, as programs online and on-site uh, today and also thank you for this recap uh, it was a wonderful day yesterday yeah. and uh, together is not the last day of the festival until we end up this uh, festival i mean we have plenty of programs <laughs> and uh, it's my honor now to take over this uh, moderating sessions and uh, uh, we will welcome um, interesting guests talking about extremely interesting things uh, and their projects and as the ritual of these sessions is always this garden teaser video I will allow myself to change a little bit uh, um, uh, the rhythm here and uh, to introduce you before we uh, to our garden so uh, we will travel then afterwards to Jerusalem um, into the Garden Jerusalem, into a mystic cave with uh, artists making uh, rather cool performances. Um, and then we hop to the Garden Hong Kong um, with the title Artificial Intentional. Inten inter 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 <laughs> <laughs> intentionalities. Um, 
and I, um, uh, from, our, from our partners, City University of Hong Kong School of Creative Media and Neurodesign Lab. Um, it's quite a complex text, but uh, uh, that, that description, but I think it needs this, uh, and I try my best to read it proper. <laughs> uh, during recent decades, technologies raised and erased borders, hybridized and uh, segregated cultures, while also collapsing distances and time zones. But we have too often remained trapped in, my, in a myoptic, anthropocentric system of logic and ideals in our quest for new technological aspirations, structures of controls, or even in finding new possibilities for collective participations and agency. And you see, our gardens program is so diverse from uh, entertaining programs, uh, programs deep into intellectual discourses all over the world, all over where we have our gardens. So now, uh, please start the video and I meet you later on. Welcome here in our streaming studio on the last day of uh, this year's Ars Electronica and uh, I have a very good friend here together with me. You see he is uh, not only himself uh, a very excellent innovative artist since uh, decades already. I don't actually really know when we met the first time here at Ars Electronica. Oh dear, that must have been something like 2000, 2001, something yeah. like this. Well, okay, so he's still young, as you <laughs> see. <laughs> but in his then very short career and young life, uh, he has also become, I think, one of the really important new generation of designers, creative artists for Atlas.com, and therefore, of course, I think also a very dear friend of, of Joachim Sauter. And this is what this next half uh, an hour is all about, a little uh, memory 
and uh, tribute uh, to the wonderful artist, to the wonderful, how should we say, human being, uh, Joachim Sauter. And uh, we prepared some uh, material uh, from his very early history here at, at Ars Electronica, uh, but also, of course, uh, with some material of a, a new project. Uh, that you realized for this. So here we see uh, Joachim, I think, in, in this very typical position and both, I would always say, I mean, it, it, it really is, uh, talks so much about his approach to be the human person, the human face, the communicator between something that looks to be very complicated and weird in the background. <laughs> no idea what it's really about. And, and all the people out there who are interested. And I think this is one of the really uh, exciting uh, things when we uh, remember Joachim Sauter, no matter who you meet, who knew him, everybody comes up with these same memories of a person that was uh, always so friendly, always so warm, always so understanding, but at the same time, incredibly precise and how was it for you? When did you meet him the first time? Well, uh, so we like so I was that so uh, actually I got the it was a rather strange introduction in that I was studying at the time and somebody uh, so Mina Hagedon who uh, was working at Artcom at the time who was studying in a, in in London or had been studying in a school where I was then studying and she called me say hi would you like would you like to come to to Berlin for the summer. <laughs> so, and that's the, that's how we first met. Then uh, through this channel, he was uh, also the external examiner in 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 my my study times. And then I came to Berlin for one summer. Had a yeah. wonderful summer. Uh, maybe the highlight of the summer was that there's actually uh, one of the legendary projects from uh, uh, from Joachim uh, and uh, and Dirk was the invisible shape of things past. Yeah. And it has also been shown here at Ars Electronica. There was a... a so, so you knew his work before you knew the Not person, really. I must say, okay. I did not really know his work before. I was a newbie in the <laughs> media arts. I was uh, just, uh, in the middle of my studies and uh, the world, I mean, my eyes were not really <laughs> <laughs> opened yet. I hadn't yet discovered everything. So I really discovered it from the, from the within. But, uh, but really the introduction then, so I came to Berlin. I was working on a project to uh, create an exhibition for Goethe Institute in, uh, in, uh, uh, um, in Portugal uh, for the, uh, to, to showcase the invisible shape of things past in a, in a new light. So I worked on that and I went to, uh, to Porto uh, to work on the project to install it. But somehow there was like, so Joachim was coming then uh, for the second trip but I was there first as the artist, and suddenly I ended up uh, kind of as the artist. Like so, so suddenly I was kind of in the place of Joachim, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was totally uh, yeah. So, you know, so this was the, the, the really most wonderful summer internship mm -hmm. I've <laughs> I could imagine, yeah. and then uh, yeah. So then then I I I I studied further and worked somewhere else, but Joachim kept on calling me should come to Berlin yeah. and then yeah. for the I mean last for 16 years. For older people yeah. like me, of course, uh, the invisible thing, uh, shape of things past is uh, not even an early work of him. No. Yeah. So in, in, in my case, actually, I knew about his work before. So in 92, he was uh, showing together with Dirk this, for me, I mean, it's uh, one of really of the seminal milestones of media art at all, uh, Der Zerseer. I don't even know what the English translation ever was. The viewer. The D viewer. Okay, well, yeah. I, I think sometimes translation doesn't That's even work. No. Cersea is just uh, so much a better word because it really has this almost aggressive, energetic thing uh, uh, element when you dare things apart. And uh, this was also his first uh, project here at Ars Electronic, and from this point on, um, he really became something like the inventory, part of the inventory of Ars Electronica. He has 
been very, very important and influential in the conception of uh, the um, Ars Electronica Center when Hannes Leopold Seder in the early 90s then started to try to convince the politicians to build uh, this Ars Electronica Center, and uh, he invited uh, experts from all over the world, among them, uh, of course, Joachim, to help him with uh, creating visions. And I think one of the reasons, besides this uh, human being, Joachim, uh, why uh, everybody immediately was so excited about him, and everybody wanted, of course, to work with him, uh, is this very special quality of how to communicate an idea. And I think this is something that we see perfectly well when we look at this short video from 1992, where uh, we see a short documentation of how this uh, important work, Cersea, was installed at Ars Electronica. Maybe we can start the video now. Stop, 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 wait a minute, what's going on here? The secret lies behind the wall. Let's take a look at what's behind the painting. Here we have a camera, a PC, a graphics workstation and a monitor on which the painting is being displayed. The camera is pointing at the viewer's eyes. This picture is sent to the PC where it is digitized. The PC analyzes the video signal and locates the reflections of a light source in the viewer's eyes. It can then calculate the XY positions of the eyes, which in turn enables the PC to identify exactly which part of the painting the viewer is looking at. These coordinates are then sent to the graphics workstation, where an algorithm is distorting the picture at exactly these coordinates. This means that as soon as the viewer looks at a particular part of the picture, that part is distorted. Through the confrontation and fusion of the traditional arts and new media technology, this interactive installation attempts to democratize the dialogue between art and its audience. Whereas in the past an old master might leave an impression in the mind of the passive onlooker, now the onlooker can leave an impression on the old master. If no one looks at the picture for more than 30 seconds, the painting is restored to its original condition after the new eye painting, which has been created by the viewer, has been stored to disc.
So, so this would have been then, well, literally at the source. So when arriving in Berlin at t in, in the year 2000. But, but actually, I must say, in this case, I was just during the festival, we were talking with some students and like, uh, uh, one student of mine from Berlin uh, was just reminiscing how happened to look in the in the uh, in the office at the at the university some old works from ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and uh, and realized that you know there's still like wow so many things have already been explored and now we're starting a new and like is there anything new that we can do because it feels like there's this wealth of 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 work that that has already done what we're trying to do now and we're rediscovering this. So 30 years ago, this work, if it was on a small computer with small camera <laughs> in a different frame, uh, without knowing this, it would yeah. still feel absolutely fresh, right? So if you don't see, the, see it in the context, so I think, and this is definitely the quality kind of, that really has, like, for me, has, has kind, of, kind of crystallizes Joachim's qualities, is this sort of, critical understanding and thinking of the medium, as you're saying, like conveying it in a crystal clear way. Sometimes yeah. whimsical, uh, playful, humorous, very much beautiful, but also in this can case also the kind of, it's clearly not about technology. Mm -hmm. And of course for us, when we are learning technology, it takes a lot of time to, like you need to make the LED blink to understand what it means, uh, and for that, rediscovering these kind of principles without being discouraged by somebody saying, yeah, but it was done already 30 years ago. This is the sort of fine balance that I find in teaching, and this is the discussion that I had with my student who was kind of disheartened that what can I do because there's already so much of these kind of works that have already been found, so what can we do different? And I think for that, Joachim again, like his quality is definitely in that it's this kind of attitude about technology and reflecting it for human meaning and not for the showcasing technology that really transcends it, that make it, makes it timeless. So 30 years ago, there's many other works that I could say when you don't frame them by the whims of the current technology, but by the ideas behind them, they have this, this kind of quality. You mentioned something which I think is very significant or was very significant for Joachim. Uh, you probably find a lot of people, uh, especially among the pioneers of media art, when they talk to young artists who are trying to do more or less the same they would rather discourage them and say, oh my God, forget it, I've done this 30 years ago. <laughs> this is something you probably never would have heard from Joachim. And he had a way to rather encourage people by referring to that he has considered this or worked about this, contemplated. And he gave you really the feeling that you now as a youngster, when, when you are also kind of going into the turf and trying more or less to imitate or even copy him or so, that this is another step. And I think this not discouraging, challenging people, but always encouraging them. This was a very important point. You had also a lot of contacts with him as a professor. I mean, I know him as the artist coming to Ars Electronica as the jury member and like uh, once in a while he came with a new project and suddenly it was there and wow, everybody was excited. I mean, how was this? Uh, I think this would be two interesting things for me if you could reflect a little bit. He, how did he act really as a teacher in university? Mm -hmm. And the other one is, when we look at this project, also the next one, the invisible uh, shape of things past, I mean, these are not projects that just happen. They all look like, when, when you know them a little bit more in detail, like many years of uh, considerations, refinement, and, and you also worked with him as a colleague. So how did this happen? I mean, was it like in the morning he was coming into the office and say, yeah, I have a great <laughs> new idea, or <laughs> maybe well, you can? Well, I mean, First, like in the context of, of the university, I think uh, there's definitely this kind of, so uh, maybe like three aspects of the same thing, like seeing the best in people, uh, giving them the freedom to express that, 
but expecting the best. So the kind of uh, the autonomy means responsibility. And this would manifest in like uh, how we then designed or, or kind of tried to coordinate also the, 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 the sort of operational side of the university teaching. Of course, there's so much work also, yeah, so, so a lot of Joachim's work is still, it's, it's always together with people. So the community is of course essential and ev everybody is teaching in, in, uh, um, in media arts know that the studio class structure, the informal exchange between, between the students, defining a place where things happen, that is absolutely essential and the last two years on screen has not really been the easiest uh, to, to share is that quality. But it also, for, for us it was all very much so, uh, so, tr like defining the access to technology in a way that it is as direct and unmediated as possible. So, yes, there are some dangerous things like CNC mills and laser cutters and expensive kit that can break, that can sometimes in, in sort of research context be then protected because it's so either dangerous or expensive. But if you add that layer, then you also create the, like you, you disempower the creative exploration and the sort of discovering your own sort of attitude to something. So for us, uh, we really have been always pushing for 24 seven access to workshops and then trying to keep it so that the lethal devices will be then out of, out of, uh, out of scope, but everything else, if we can, Things that can break can be replaced, but to be able to own the place and therefore develop your own critical attitude is so much more than somebody else telling you what you should be doing. So, so therefore, this sort of, as you were saying, this like so. Instead of like Joachim would never sort of saying, "Ah, don't do this because it's been done before." It also means like, so it was a kind of a strategy of deciding at what what point suggest the existence of these things in the student's process so that you see that they already have defined their own attitude and then they can reflect how it relates to the existing work rather than be discouraged, oh, then I have to do something else. Because of course, there will be always something new and it's the person who defines the, the way so it will, be ever, it will never be the same as, as something that uses similar techniques. And I mean, Joachim, in a certain way, one could say was uh, anyway three persons in one. <laughs> I mean, he was the teacher, the mentor, uh, with really a long and very successful career at the university. He was the original artist and creator, but he was also the mastermind and the head of Artplus.com, uh, a company, a studio that worked a lot with uh, the industry, that uh, also had to survive some of the major crises of the uh, digital age when suddenly the markets were tumbling down. And uh, many of these design studios vanished, but Art and Com survived. So uh, how did he manage also to guide a team of creatives and artists like you through also, I would yeah, call it like the jungles of commercial application and relationships? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And right now I'm at the sort of deep end of that, asking it myself, how, how this, like, how did he do it? Because, um, yeah, so, so yeah, so now that I have to deal with many of the the aspects that are more about the business, it's really difficult to, to kind of like balance the creative freedom and the optimist and the sort of positive attitude to what you're really thriving, f driving for and thriving for, and then the sort of the mundane realities. Um, and I think we talked about this before. I th yeah, so the, the German word ermutigen, I think really, I think that was Joachim's really like superpower in dealing with this so that he could kind of frame things and position sort of vision that, that, that kind of gave people working with him this sort of clarity that yes, this is the right thing to do. And of course, this again requires the autonomy and independence of everybody being 
experts in their field and having their freedom to use that expertise for its uh, the best uh, best result. But but it's not easy to to have this feeling that I know I I have a license to do this and I I have a f like. I know this is the right thing. Oftentimes, it's based on intuition, and you would like to try things out, but but it's not like a mandate. And I think he, he, he was really excellent in kind of, without knowing yet, but like knowing the people and knowing their qualities, knowing what is potential in that. And, and knowing what to expect. I mean, this I think, uh, again, uh, with this uh, Art and Plus Com career, um, one of the really great things is that all the projects that Art Plus Com did, no matter which clients, they all had this kind of super high level of aesthetic quality, but also technical perfection. So I think this, again, is, is you know, really be like the guiding star on one side, where you see, okay, his ideas, his approach, you can't be sure of. This is a direction where you can trust in. And I think that's uh, extremely important, again, for both things, for students, because with this kind of guiding light and not the guiding hand yeah. who takes it, say, do this, do this, but shining up there and you know this is your, like your polar star where, where you can orient yourself. And it's really interesting that this also worked so well in uh, basically running a company, yes. a creative company, which is one of the things that uh, nowadays so many people are concerned with, how can we also find ways to put our artistic creativity also in, in, in some sort of business. Unfortunately, the time is running fast, and of course, we could speak hours. I mean, we just basically spoke about one artwork <laughs> of his. <coughs> but there is this wonderful archive of Artplus.com, so please visit their webpage. Also, in the archives of, of Ars Electronica, you can dive very deep. We have wonderful videos of uh, Joachim also uh, giving lectures here at the festival where he kind of tells not only like, you know, all the works uh, presents all the works he did, but really, when you listen to it, you get the kind of feeling of his very special approach. And you and and some colleagues, because he was also working with many uh, other artists, uh, you have now put together a very wonderful installation web project, uh, dear Joachim, to uh, to the memory of Joachim, but not just as kind of one statue that you would put somewhere, but as a kind of living organism. So maybe you can tell us about this project. Yeah. So this is uh, this is now something that yes. So we. We, we yeah it, it came together very quickly and it was really in response uh, to so after after his his, uh, his passing away um, I received and yeah I received and many colleagues received lots and lots of questions like how can we is there anything we can do is there some form to contribute where to send the flowers where to attend things and of course it's not only the pandemic situation but also the the community is global, so the physical being there, it's not simply possible. Um, and then we looked at, is there some, like, th some format, some things that, that would be appropriate, and really realized that, well, firstly, that traditional culture, oftentimes religion, have very good formats and traditions and rituals that fulfill this function, and you know what to do, and you have this, method of, of being together and 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 do this sort of a uh, trauer together this uh, morning but uh, it's really not so easy to translate in the in the digital so uh, in parallel just last year uh, a group of uh, uh, UDK members and students um, they had developed this project called future voices where it's a kind of endless stream of hopes and wishes and worries about the future. This was this technological foundation that then kind of felt very appropriate or matching. So Dear Joachim is basically an audio piece where you can go to the URL, to the website, and you can tune into this audio condolence book, uh, which is basically reflections, words, discussions, something that we did at the university around the big round table on daily basis. Exchanging ideas, passing, reflecting, discussing, sometimes performing. Um, and I felt that this kind of dialogue format 
was very appropriate. So you can record a voice and, and that becomes part of that sort of a endless discussion. And, and then in retrospect now, so we installed then here at the festival a 10 channel sort of a physical manifestation of this ritual. Of course, most people will, will access it online, but, but to know that there's a place also means something. Uh, I really felt now in retrospect, on one hand, it still like stops you, like when you are confronted, what would you say? It's very kind of intimate and personal situation, but you don't have to. You can just, just like in the sort of traditional forms, you can flip through the pages of other people's thoughts. You can just be in this space. And by having the voices in different languages, in different tones, you kind of really get the feeling that we tried to get out of it. So this is, a, this, is this online memorial hosted at the UDK website for years to come until some server standard uh, new framework, something rather will break it, but, uh, but it is meant for, for, for the longer term. Uh, yeah, so. so I, I think we have a little video about it prepared. Maybe we can see the video of dear Joachim here. Yes, definitely a video where you probably should anyway remain silent afterwards. And um, it was really many, many touching moments here at Ars Electronica because this was a place where Joachim, I think, really felt at home in a certain way. And in all these decades, he really became a member not only of the visitors community, but uh, really of Ars Electronica itself. So many new developments uh, that we made in all these decades were inspired by him, or at least he helped helped us very strongly, again, with this uh, guiding star that he always was, uh, to do it the right way. And this year is the first time in this uh, period now of Corona that so many visitors were coming back to us Electronica. And it was really like all of them coming back, but Joachim, of course, not. And then having this place, this quiet place among the beautiful trees here in this old park uh, is really a wonderful situation, and I think uh, it won't matter at all if the server crashes or if there are new standards. I'm sure there always will be people who will start a new version, uh, who will come back uh, to this memory of Joachim and definitely, of course, uh, with all the wonderful work that he did. And uh, I leave it up to you to find the final words <laughs> to this. Yeah. You have 48 yeah. seconds. <laughs> well, I think I, I don't need that many seconds. I really just have to say as an audio track also to the installation that dear Joachim, you are so much missed, but your work, as I see now also in this festival, will really, I mean, really, really live on in the kind of transformation that and the kind of polar star, as you were saying, that you have set for the, for the field of media arts. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to everybody, in particular to Joachim. We see uh, amazing resolution in 3D. So um, you can see that the, the, the white here is a little bit higher than the rest. However, around the white, there is also some material that has been pushed, uh, pushed down. So um, if you want to understand this, uh, in a better way uh, as, a, as a scientist and you want quickly to see, okay, where is the highest, where is the lowest, um, you can use here um, 
pseudocolor, pseudocolor which represents the height. So the blue is the. Um, uh, okay, let me go back to the. Okay, the blue is the deepest and the red is the highest. So here, just by looking at it, you can see also very interesting thing on the, on the cracks. Uh, they are not they are not just like a little opening. They are actually um, going up, so it creates a little bit of mountain and sometimes a bit like iceberg uh, moving uh, together. Sometimes some are higher than others. So here, for example, you can see this one is significantly higher than, than the things around it or than the painting around it. And um, here you can see little fiber. Well, and um, you can uh, choose whether you want to have the true color, the pseudo color, or uh, only the height uh, information, and even uh, a wireframe. The wireframe here uh, shows the, um, uh, the, the only the, the mesh uh, of the point height, basically. And um, now we we made a few uh, scans, uh, inclusive here the the, the blue uh, background I was showing before. And again, here you can see the ice or the, the mountain uh, <laughs> of the surface. Um, so it was it was pretty amazing to be able to do a 3D stitching of this size because usually 3D stitching are very small and those are several centimeters. And um, it's yeah, it's it's a great help for for restorators as I, as I said. So maybe we can have a look. Um, you remember sh before I showed very quickly. Uh, when I was doing the scan, um, I was scanning this double dot. So Fermer um, uh, added a lot of these small dots uh, in different paintings to create this relief feeling, this uh, height uh, feeling. And here uh, it's a very nice example uh, showing this, uh, this double dot. Um, and you can have a, a feeling of a mountain of the surface, which I'm sure you would have loved to, to see. Um, and maybe one more is the reflection of the pearl, which is also uh, very interesting. Um, again, here you can notice that um, the height here uh, of the reflection of the pearl is not much higher than the surface. And uh, next to it, you have some kind of cavity. You have to keep in mind that this painting is more than 300 years old. And the goal, the, the whole goal, not only is to understand the surface, but most importantly, is to know how to keep it alive. So this is the, the very important work of, uh, of conservators and museum restorators, is to make sure that in 300 years or 500 years, you are still able to enjoy this, uh, this painting and uh, not only a picture on on internet. Um, well, this is uh, this was pretty amazing. And uh, however, I did uh, after this was all done, uh, we were very happy. Everybody was was excited. And then we thought, okay, what's the next step? Uh, the next step is uh, the bigger object and bigger scans. Uh, because here the girl with the pearl ring is only 45 centimeter times about 40. So the bridge system that we developed, you can place 50 times 50 centimeter, and, and that's, uh, that's about it. So what about uh, paintings that are, um, that are bigger, if I may? Um, and also, um, well, those are a few, a few pictures during the inspection. There was also for the public some uh, some explanations uh, on on screens. Uh, well, I I didn't tell you the whole story. We had to do the scans at night, uh, and we could control remotely uh, with Team Viewer uh, the microscope. We could see with webcam in a museum that was closed with nobody inside except for uh, security uh, people, obviously. And this was pretty surreal to be able uh, to uh, from your laptop. Uh, access to the microscope and see the scan in real time, start and end the scan uh, without being there. So in total, we had a uh, 10 billion pixel scan um, and probably around 455,000 
uh, we had 9,200 area and uh, I believe we took 50 images in each of the area. So you can see one single image is, is this, is a little square like this. So we did a quick test to see if everything is there. And then this is a very basic uh, test of the stitching. After that, we did a much better uh, one. And um, this is during the inspection uh, together with Abby. Uh, it was really day and night for three days. Um, and uh, yeah, what I wanted to, to show you quickly, which is also pretty, pretty fun, uh, some of the scans we did, so we did the entire painting and then we did some of the separate areas. And those separate areas, this is what I just showed you, this is this 140 uh, time magnification. And here we are in a bar or in a restaurant uh, in front of a fireplace and we are controlling the microscope directly from my laptop, selecting the bottom, the top, the start and the end completely remotely, which is I think the first time something like this uh, has been done. Uh, and again, my lovely colleague Vince concentrated. Of course, you have a, a lot of stress and responsibility, uh, but uh, pretty amazing. So this was the, the result, as I showed you, some 3D example. And uh, yeah, we had to do a little selfie with the painting. Now, um, what I was saying is, what about larger paintings or paintings that we cannot put flat? Uh, and then we developed this, uh, we call it the T stance, where uh, the, the, the lens is going horizontally. So um, this is a painting from my uh, grandmother and uh, we used it as a, as a test. Um, and this we developed originally for the Nachtwache, for, uh, for Night Watch, uh, the Nachtwacht. Uh, which is a Rembrandt painting, uh, one of the most famous painting and uh, the one of the highlights of the uh, Rijksmuseum. And uh, they wanted to look at this 3.6 time huge <laughs> uh, painting and how to look at it horizontally. So we developed this stand and then um, we had the chance to look at another uh, masterpiece uh, from Vermeer. Uh, which is the view of Delft, uh, which is also in the Maurice house. Beautiful, beautiful painting. And um, so this is the newest microscope, the HRX01. Um, and now you can see the, the horizontal T stands. Uh, and uh, wha one of the crazy thing here is that this painting was hanging in the museum with a glass, through a glass, with a frame we are still able to, uh, to get a uh, very good result. So basically at the end of the day, visitors left and we came uh, with a system and launched a scan uh, to do it overnight. Now you can see the reflection of the, of the window and here we used a, a side lighting for that. Um, and here, this is the signature from uh, Johannes Vermeer, which is here, uh, just a tiny one, but looks very nice. And um, now, if I may uh, get back the control, I can show you a little bit how it looks like because it's also really, really beautiful. And Delft. So this is the left side. And uh, this was made with uh, a telecentric lens, this new uh, 1020E, which is our newest uh, lens. And the, um, the resolution is, is just beautiful. Again, you can see a lot of little touches, uh, a lot of little small dots. And uh, this is one of my favorite parts here. Uh, it's, it's absolutely, yeah. quite amazing to, to see this. Um, and here you can see also some, uh, some little bumps. Uh, some people say that uh, he, he mixed some uh, sands to create this kind of effect. Um, and um, again, a real master painter. And let's have a look at the other 
at the other view here. And obviously here those two ladies having a chat. Now we also did the scan uh, at a higher resolution, which looks like this. So this was very exciting, and um, then we we received uh, a call from the SKD, uh, Staatliche uh, Kunstsammlung Dresden, uh, in in Germany, um, and they asked us, or they told us that they just made uh, an amazing restoration of uh, Johannes Vermeer, uh, das Brieflesendes Mädchen am offenen Fenster, uh, the girl uh, reading a letter at the open window. And um, this is in the Gemälde Gallery Alte Meister in Dresden, inside the Swinger. No, Statische Kunstsammlung Dresden. Inside Swinger. And the exhibition opens yesterday. I actually, I was two days ago at the opening in Dresden. Then I was quickly in Czech Republic. Then I came here just <laughs> nonstop. And, and I finished the scan, well, last week. Um, and it goes up to the 2nd of January, and I very strongly recommend you to, to go there. It's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful, it's the largest Fermer uh, exhibition in, in Germany, with uh, 10 uh, Fermer and over um, 50 uh, work of art from the, uh, f from the Netherlands. People, uh, museums from all over the world send them uh, their paintings. Now, this is a very special, uh, special scan, a special story, because this is how it was for the last 250 years. Now, people know this painting, it's, it's very famous. However, recently, I think about three, three, four years ago, they realized that this is actually the real painting. So this uh, here, all the top right parts, has been overpainted by someone. We, we don't really know who. And uh, they found out with infrared and, uh, and different technology that actually behind the surface, uh, the god of love, Cupido, was, uh, was there, which gives a special meaning also to the painting because she is reading a love letter and not any kind of uh, uh, shopping list. Um, and so this was pretty amazing. You can see also uh, the colors have been greatly improved. Uh, you can see also the mask, and, and the mask is uh, a stepping on a mask, which is a symbol saying uh, the no nothing hidden, true, um, true love and no secrets, kind of. And um, now, this is uh, uh, Christoph Schulzel, who did the restoration, micrometer by micrometer, uh, or millimeter by millimeter, with a scalpel, uh, I think for nearly three or four years, to remove the entire painting. This was uh, during the press conference, I think uh, around half, uh, to show, hey, look at what we found. And uh, he did an amazing job. Now uh, they asked us to come, and this time we thought, okay, we have to step up the game because this painting is is larger, is 85 or 83 times 65 centimeter. So we had to uh, to split and to do several scans and to stitch them, and we had very little time because <laughs> we started. I think less than two weeks before the opening of the exhibition, and we had to do the scan, we had to process everything, to do a, a panorama, and to have everything ready on time for the opening. So, mm, crazy challenge. But uh, we redesigned the tea stands, we uh, improved the software, and, uh, and we are very, very happy uh, with the result. Um, so this is a, a short video uh, showing uh, the, um, the process of uh, moving uh, the painting um, because we had to do several scans. We had to do really day and night for uh, uh, about uh, five days. And um, 
it's extremely important to have the alignment of the painting and the microscope because here we took 15,000 images or 15,000 areas, each of them about 30 to 50 uh, steps. And you have to think about it, 15,000 times one second is a lot of time. And so because we have to select the bottom, the top very accurately, uh, we started to do uh, a scan with a nanopoint scanner. So here we have a sensor uh, that is uh, measuring uh, only here uh, 10 lines uh, to measure the altitude. The red is the highest and the blue is the lowest again. And this helped us to align the, the painting with the axis as well as to know where is the lowest and where is the highest point to really be as fast as possible. Obviously, we didn't scan it at these speeds. Uh, <laughs> I think it's like 100 times faster or something like that. Uh, but just to show you a little bit. So you see every time the lens is moving uh, back and forth, uh, creating a multifocus. Uh, yeah, this was uh, a little journey, a life journey uh, uh, into our deep space. You know, this 8K room uh, that uh, um, uh, the uh, a media organ as the epicenter of our, of our um, museum developed by our Ars Electronica Future Lab. It is incredible, actually, what these gigapixel things are able to do. And I remember, I just want to quote uh, a professor when I was an art student um, in the 90s, when uh, the internet got introduced to us and the internet coming with all this new graphic power and so the digital world in general. He was standing in front of me looking sad at me and said, this is the dead of us painters. Well, uh, if we look at, uh, if you look at uh, the quality and if you look at the entire situation um, of the old masters, that at the end, these uh, legendary images, uh, these uh, wonderful paintings uh, um, are hardly, are barely to see. Uh, and if you can see them, you can just cannot closer. And there you see again what technology in the form of uh, deep space is able to do. I mean, it can, it opens this box again, this experience uh, again for um, a new generation of an audience. Uh, and um, our deep space is not just this space uh, where we are showing uh, the old master Vermeer. It is actually, it became a place uh, where art historians approaching us uh, to hire deep space uh, uh, and to also do lectures uh, for uh, the sake of interest, but also for um, the students. So universities are coming to us because this quality uh, to get so close to, this, uh, to these paintings, uh, to understand better the times in where those paintings being made um, is simply outstanding. All right, uh, that was uh, a little insight uh, and a little, uh, that was a move into our museum. Um, and um, during the festival, Deep Space for sure is one of the core stages. Um, it is the place where artists are coming and, uh, and trying to play, to play with this mega immersive uh, uh, place. Deep Space still is uh, an experience and we always compare it uh, with an organ in a, in, a, um, in a cathedral. So it's also an instrument that you cannot bring home. It's an instrument where you have to uh, visit uh, the venue because the place, the habitat, the venue around is part of the concept. Now to uh, another project, um, a project that I personally love a lot uh, because um, uh, we met this project already last year where the entire Ars Electronica organization moved into the wonderful parks of the Kepler University. LIT is just a symbol, the title for a series of projects where the local university is uh, fostering the dialogue between the creatives on the one side and the local institutions, the scientific, the hardcore scientists. And uh, um, LIT is the project where um, we try to prove, so to speak, uh, the influence of creative artistical thinking into core disciplines of science. And um, this project that I'm going to introduce you now is a wonderful result out of that. It is a technical physicist meeting a designer falling in love with her, but that's a private one. <laughs> um, and they were exhibited last year um, here at the campus and they became kind of a little star. Um, and they submitted it uh, to the Prias Electronica, this year's edition, and oh wonder, and we were not sitting in the jury, 
uh, the international jury voted uh, them into the honorary mentions and that is just a, a wonderful story it is so to speak the proof of what as electronica um, is always praying whether we call it art thinking or critical thinking humanizing technologies um, it is the proof that we are a good constellation of collaboration uh, we are the mashing up of different disciplines we can reach other targets beyond those that we reached before and um, to give you a little bit uh, a glimpse of an idea we're talking about 27 transparent boxes floating in space continuously generate random numbers by using well-known medium of the dice um, the entire idea, the ide ideology uh, and the philosophy behind is to explain us um, the phenomenon of randomness. It is more than ironic uh, than, uh, that uh, an, a scientist and an artist are playing with this topic because randomness, I would say, has a lot to do with uh, the lives we are living. And uh, yeah, let's just have... Uh, a little insight in this video, please. The transparency of randomness gives an insight into the world of random numbers and highlights the significance of randomness in current mathematical and physical research. There are an endless number of digits behind the decimal point of pi. Did you know it can be approximated by simply using a large set of random numbers? The more random numbers are available, the more precise this approximation is. Go left, now right, left again, now two steps up, one right, then one down. This apparent wandering based on a huge amount of random numbers is the fundamental basis for many scientific computations. The so-called random walk is used, for example, to calculate the movement of bacteria in liquids. 27 transparent boxes floating in space continuously generate random numbers by using the well-known medium of the dice. Structure and complexity of natural materials are influencing this process. Here at JKU Linz at the Institute for Theoretical Physics, our research focuses on quantum mechanical phenomena found in many body systems. Path integral Monte Carlo methods are used to stimulate the behavior of interacting atoms. This would not be possible without the fascinating field of random numbers. Immerse yourself into the world of randomness and become an active part of the installation. Yeah, every time I see this video, um, I really have to say, yeah, uh, it's the foolproof what I said before. Still, uh, I think it's a wonderful installation. 
And uh, those who are in Linz, please visit uh, the CyberArts exhibition. Uh, it is the last day, sadly, but um, um, it's a wonderful opportunity. I mean, the entire projects of the DCS Prias Electronica are just simply outstanding good. So, but now I'm happy and honored to introduce two dear guests and friends. Um, it's Sarah Petkus and Mark Koch. Hello. Um, the Ars Electronica community and the family would say well-known guests. Uh, um, and um, we will spend a little bit of a time because you are represented here at our festival with another, again, wonderful piece. Um, uh, uh, part of the part of your breed, another, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, we will talk about it later. But before we look at the video, and uh, then I'm looking forward to chatting with you a little bit. This is Sarah, and this year, 2021, Mark and I are working on a brand new project called Moon Rabbit that involves raising several unique AI minds. And this is part of an artist residency that we have with Ars Electronica and the Leiden Observatory. We're going to be teaching them specifically to look at abstract shapes inside constellations or planetary surfaces or other stellar bodies and pick out the shapes of things that they have been trained to be familiar with. We're going to be meditating on the concepts of abstraction and hallucination and this thing called, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but called paradelia, paradodelia, paradelia. Uh, which is basically this thing that humans and AI both do. We're trying to find meaningful data where there isn't necessarily any. We're going to sit back, look at how the data we provided, these minds resulted in whatever outcome we get, and then as parents we're going to sort of teach our babies how to grow up to be their own well-formed, unique, individual personalities. Because I think that the umami of self really does come down to opinion and taste. The way in which the exhibit manifests might change between now and the end of the year. We want to create a planetarium experience where you can look up at the ceiling and pin what you see or recognize within the stars against what our AI children see. In creating this environment, I'm hoping that those who visit our exhibit will be able to have an experience or a moment of meaningful relation with something that isn't another human. Our ability to relate to one another is very important to us. This is how we establish connections, and it's also how we foster empathy within ourselves. We go out of our way to share posts and memes on the internet because deep down we're hoping that others will relate to us. I hear that some people look up at the moon and they see a man's face, the man in the moon, right? And some people look up at the moon and they see a rabbit. I still can't see the rabbit. Although I can't see the man either. I can't see the man's face. <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm in my own lonely club of people who can't see the man or the bunny. And I guess that's sort of the essence of the project in and of itself. I have no idea where we're going to go from here exactly, but we're going to take those first bold steps and we're hoping that you will come along with us for the ride because it should be interesting. Uh, the takeaway from this is, yes, this project has everything to do with how we relate to technology, the development of taste and individuality as an AI and what that even means, and helping us humans extend our empathy to the machines that we share our lives with. So until that next video, keep making awesome stuff out there, and thank you for watching. Yeah. Thank you for making that video. Um, everything is set now. That was the chat. I wish you a good day. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us at the <laughs> studio. <laughs> you, should not, you should not do such great uh, introductions of your own project. I, I, I just don't know what to ask. No. Um, oh, no. Hey, welcome back again. Um, Thank you. Um, great video, great piece. Um, I start with my first question to you is. Uh, as I know your oeuvre, as I, I, I remember the, our first contact with this uh, European space thing and so on and so on, yes. um, it is uh, how come that you are all of a sudden doing such a 
romantic piece of art? Ooh, that's a good question. So, but because lying back, uh, as you describe it, and uh, um, um, just uh, let the brain a little bit floating and uh, looking for patterns uh, in the stars or in the clouds, that uh, is a little bit, uh, that, that is a contemplative moment. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Let's see. I think that after, well, coming out of the COVID era in the U.S., mm -hmm. or uh, going into it, rather, um, since it's still ongoing, uh, we wanted to get away from everything that we were previously doing, Mark and I, and uh, learn new things and just try a new approach and just do something fresh, because mm -hmm. it really felt like we needed to separate ourselves from what our life embodied uh, up until last year. And uh, every time we do a large project, like a residency, we try to learn something new. And we're not traditionally AI people, but it's relevant because we develop you know, machines and robots, mm -hmm. and that's a component, inevitably, uh, when you deal with robots. Okay. Especially like since I consider them my children, they need to have mind to me. So uh, I think this it is a relaxing, romantic kind of chill concept and I, I think that going into it it allowed us a lot of room uh, for it to evolve into something that we weren't expecting uh -huh. and it was just a way for us to explore another uh, aspect of parenthood because uh, as you know Noodle, my, my mm -hmm. robot, is our child that we've been working on for a while and I think one of the things we're, we'll develop for them next is a mind that's capable of developing a personality and making their own choices for their own sake. Which makes a lot of sense when you when 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 one know uh, what you guys have been working on for such a long time. I mean that that that, that you are diving into this AI is from my point of view just the next logical step of uh, uh, the evolution of a very interesting and funky uh, artistic pair that I um, really learned to respect uh, over a long time already. Um, I just briefly want to kind of uh, remind us where I think in my memory this endeavor uh, among us started. Um, I remember still that uh, my dear colleague Veronica and me, we were writing on our first big European uh, call and it was about uh, connecting the arts and the science and the science would have been represent was represented uh, from um, the European Space Organization and uh, we did that call to the guys there uh, and we were pretty it was a Skype at that time I remember that and it, we were super nervous um, because I mean us small farts from the culture side I mean asking with the big dudes with the robotic and the rocket things and so um, and it was immediately a very open-minded talk. Uh, he said, wow, yeah, 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 bring artists to our venue. Uh, and it was at that time even that uh, there was no position for financing uh, uh, your trip to this uh, other side, so to speak, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, to the scientific side. And um, with the concept uh, of noodles, which is um, an outstanding at the, at the very first um, moment, very humoristic, but at the end, deep going uh, deep and very serious concept of an alternative way to think robotic. Um, the mainly dudes, mainly men at this ESA think they were highly attracted, uh, dot, 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 they were kind of blown away because uh, in their high skilled life of, uh, um, of um, engineering, they, it seemed had just no idea that uh, this approach would uh, even be possible. Mm -hmm. So I saw all of a sudden scholars thinking that uh, noodle robots would, <laughs> uh, would send us the first images of Mars. And I think it was very close. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean and, and now uh, you have four wonderful new babies in your family. It is four or three? It, I think I remember four it is more. four. It's four, yes. Four more, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and you developed this actually out of this residency? Uh, specifically for, uh, for, um, for, for the presentation here at the Ars Electronica. So that means that you uh, did a residency during the pandemic time. Well, is that right? Sort of. Like, well, how are uh, residencies uh, in a pandemic? Well, kind of chaotic because uh, yeah. uh, it's really difficult to get overseas with all of the restrictions and everything. So we're actually going to the Leiden Observatory uh, after the festival. So we had to change our, our battle strategy for the development of the project. And I think that our goals, like a lot of this was just setting realistic goals before being here now. And I think for the festival, we wanted to create our infrastructure, mm -hmm. like the base. And then 
after this point in time when we go and meet with uh, all the new people, the new influences, the scientists and experts at the uh, observatory, they'll be able to give us feedback and then it will kind of blossom into something that we can't really expect right now. So uh, our goal for the festival was to get it to its raw functioning, uh, what we want, point. So the festival is just a stop? It's, a, it's like a uh, starting point. Yeah. Starting yeah, point. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, a little, uh, uh, well, a little intervention in a, in, a, in, a, in a shopping window, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. But just for the sake of uh, uh, understanding better what you guys created there. Yeah. Uh, that's that's very interesting, actually. Yeah. So, so you you also allow yourself that after this influence uh, uh, of Leiden, talking mm -hmm. with all the, the 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 clever dudes and and do that's there. Hopefully, also do that. Yes. <laughs> um, you f you you keep on further developing the piece. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we will see more of that uh, in in the near future. Yes. Like a, a very large part of uh, my practice is uh, documenting my work as it develops, like mm -hmm. the the video that you showed mm -hmm. at the beginning. And uh, I think that it's important to show the whole life of an idea as it grows and develops. Mm -hmm. And nothing is ever really done. I think that any time we exhibit work, it's just a it's a it's a window into the here and now, like where the development is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we find a way to make it something entertaining, something we can spoon feed to people, mm -hmm. so they they can uh, walk away uh, remembering it and feeling akin to it, mm -hmm. um, but it will be different the next time they see it. Uh, it will grow and it will be in a different place. I bet. Yeah, just like I noodle. totally bet. <laughs> yeah. So just um, uh, another question, uh, uh, again related to your, to your um, uh, residency. You have been in Linz for quite a time already. Yes. We've for been how here, long? Uh, we've been here for five weeks. For five weeks, yes. okay. And you straight came from, from Las Vegas? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, wow, what a clash, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. It's been from one isolation to the other isolation. Yes, let's yeah. say like that. How was the Austrian isolation? <laughs> um, it's it's a lot different here because uh, just the nature of the city of Vegas versus uh, the city of Linz. Um, Vegas, like if you're if you live as a resident, you're away from like a dense population, and you have to drive everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, here, like living in the city. Um, when you go out to get groceries or run an errand, you're like in an ocean of people, mm -hmm. which is uh, intimidating. So that took a little bit of getting used to once we arrived. But um, I think we're, we're into it. Like it was like jumping in a pool. Yeah. And uh, we needed it because, yeah, yes. Mark and I, for a year and a half, were Back just. Back into life, huh? Yeah, yes. yeah, we were going crazy like uh, in our lab, like every day watching uh, civilization collapse, or so it seems. <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of a, uh, or is like a, 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 a kind of a hardcore experience. Yeah, um, I have to say that uh, I, I, I met these two people earlier already, and um, uh, besides the wonderful piece that is fitting so wonderful into the narrative of the entire exhibition, I really have to say it makes so much fun walking through this entire piece of exhibition and via the art pieces, like in this associated space above, telling a story that uh, is so much related to the big fires out there, but also so much related to a species of people that we have here on stage and at the festival, um, like those two are representing that uh, um, will never give up, <laughs> that uh, are citizens on this planet and, uh, um, and that are fighting for the right and their role in this, uh, um, in, in for the sake of art, but also for the sake of you being individuals. Mm -hmm. To contribute to the to the big uh, big big disasters that we have to solve out there, mm. uh, there's a lot of talent uh, um, uh, in our theme exhibition, and um, your piece also is representing that. Um, before, and this is what I wanted to ask you, um, because I'm I was I'm anyways interested in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a place uh, that is that, that that is a myth, so to speak, uh, um, and for sure, um, I was asking how was Las Vegas in times of pandemic. I think it, um, Mark, yeah. yes. I think during uh, well when the pandemic started, Ve Las Vegas shut down. All the shows shut down. I worked for a show. I didn't have a job anymore, um, and it was dark for over over a year. No shows. Uh -huh. uh, empty theater. Uh, so uh, there was a time near near the beginning or the first few months where you could get into your car and drive the Las Vegas Strip which is generally lots of traffic, people everywhere, and it was like one of those apocalypse or zombie movies where you could drive by yourself up two miles, three miles of that, that 
area where all the hotels are, and there wasn't a single person there. And the empty. LED facades. Uh, yeah, for a, few, a few years before you would say neon facades, but now it's LED. I think uh, they were still on, or or yes, some yeah. of the signs were on, and uh, that, goes to yeah. that, that is but a scenario that you know uh, uh, humankind is already somewhere uh, yeah. became soil again, and uh, right. just uh, you know the batteries are still like. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it was very the, eerie. The solar panel batteries are, are, yeah, are illuminate, yeah, illuminating right. the humankind's traces. Well, it was eerie in that sense that movies have proposed, like, if the society, happened, yes. you know, society, society collapses, you know, and that lone person, you know, wandering up the street and hmm. things are, you know, automation is still running and they're by themselves and you could do that yeah, there. Yeah. You could go experience that. And, and, and to have that happen in your lifetime is like... Go, to go from science fiction yeah. to actually, oh, it's happening. It was very it's, it's a strong. It was yeah. a very strong thing to, uh, to experience. Yeah, and even worse. Yeah, I, I, just in my imagination, I get goosebumps there. I mean, it's 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 cool, but it's it's frightening at the same time. Yes. Yes. Yeah, especially yeah. when you, yeah, when it's when it is your home <laughs> in the now. Yeah. So uh, also because I I I, I uh, we talked before. Um, Okay, you, there was no job, not at all, and everybody relies on these shows there. I mean, to 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 have a, a second uh, uh, toe on some some regular incomings, I can absolutely um, uh, understand that. But what is what was the conclusion for you guys? I mean, um, working working further developing. Um, I think that uh, we had no other distractions because. Uh, my, I had a full plate in February for the year, and then by like mid March, it was all gone. Like all of it was gone. There's nothing going on in my life, and I think I really needed that because mm -hmm. uh, I think one of my unhealthy like behaviors is to just uh, become too busy that I can't process things. I'm like in the I have to keep pushing forward and working towards things, so I can't like think and gather my thoughts and mm -hmm. and assess like what I'm doing. And I think that the world kind of forced me to do that. And then we were able to work on projects that I think we would always have liked to, but we always found something like more important or uh, it was a better opportunity, so we'd push those things aside. Um, it, this allowed us to revisit those things, like learn how to do gardening or do oil painting again, or you know, we built a greenhouse and we learned how to yeah, grow learning, learning to plants cook. in the desert, which was fun. Yeah. So we did like a lot of great human stuff. Mark knows how to make sushi now. Yeah, like, yeah we, right? we uh, lamented is, you know, once a week we would like to go to a nice restaurant, enjoy a cuisine somewhere. And after a good year or even six months, I was like, well, I would love to go to sushi. It's like, oh, like well, but yeah. I want to sit in the Switch restaurant. Switch on the TV, then let's look at Where, sushi. So. <laughs> and you, you could go get takeout. Yeah. But I was like, no, I want to sit in the restaurant. I want the experience that comes with the sushi. Mm -hmm. And we're like, we're not getting it. So I, I have old cookbooks, and I look online, and I'm like, well, I guess I'll make, I'll make some simple sushi. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit of research, and I tried. And my first few attempts were very bad. Like it attempts. is when you start making sushi. <laughs> but, er, but every time I'm like rolling my rolls, and they're starting to look like what our sushi 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 chef gives yeah. us. Um, and it's starting to have the feeling, the feeling of when the chef gives you the food and it's so pretty. We, we and got to be, I focused on that, getting that element back. We, we mm, got to be you know. humans, I think. And be like, mm -hmm. feeling in human a, again. Yes. In a way that like, I don't think we really allowed ourselves to because we were like, doing life stuff. So uh, we got to just sit and watch what was happening in the world and just kind of yeah. like, come back to ourselves. Yeah. It, it had phases. Yeah. You know. It is so interesting to, to, I mean, you know, I mean, one of the most positive aspects of this festival is that you are representing people who jumped on a, a plane, on a train, in a car yes. to visit a festival because a festival without visitors, uh, without protagonists yes. uh, is simply a, a piece of a black hole yes. <laughs> or whatever and even a black hole. Uh, I don't want to blame a black hole there, okay. <laughs> This um, is an important festival, so it's it's worth it's it. Important it's totally us, yes. worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, then 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 a, a direct question: Did you like it? Was it worth though? Yeah. Always. Yes. Like it's always worth coming here and like meeting everyone mm. that's in this environment. Like I think I've I've written this 
I don't know when people ask, I'll, I'll answer it. But uh, it feels like this is the fuel that I take with me to like do things in the future. It feels like all the really great minds that have important thoughts and things to share all come here and they kind of share notes about like their how they're affecting the world, like what their, their approach plan is. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to have this impact if this is what I'm doing. And everyone kind of talks about that and uh, influences one another. Kind of like superheroes, like meeting together for like a powwow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then everyone's like, ah, oh, OK, go back to work. And everyone goes back to it's whatever an, uh, country they're from. And it's an alchemy of ideas. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's so important. So it's great to be here after kind of starving in that way for you know a year and a half. Yes. It feels like a feast. It feels like getting a battery charge. Mm. Yeah, I, I just I, I only can share this with you. I mean, this is also this this, this really hard work uh, and the hard time that we had before. This festival appears like a little bit of a payback. Um, Thank you meet you for people. Putting it on. No, come Thank on. You. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. For us, it was about disappearing. And in the global uh, uh, cultural scene was about to disappear. We were the last uh, um, to look at, um, or let's say, the bitter rest. And that's why already last year we didn't uh, allow us a millisecond to th even think about it, not to do it. Um, and also this year, I mean, it, 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 it's also a hybrid experience in so far that uh, um, that was a festival. Yeah, like could be more from my point of view. Sure. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, um, uh, also talking with my colleagues and also talking with your colleagues uh, that are creating our community, it was more than worth though. Um, and the weather and the sun is and was with us. So that was yes. also that was like good. magic. Yes. yes. Um, uh, and what that creates uh, is minimum a smile in the faces. Mm -hmm. And as Veronica and Crystal already described it that morning, um, yesterday the scenery here, uh, you know that 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 the nature aspect that calms people so down, mm -hmm. and then this uh, the projects and the quality and the the the, the depth of the of the of the um, communication due to the projects and the relevant uh, topics that we had there made I think a wonderful mix. Mm -hmm. It was not about entertaining. Yeah. Yep. Um, but anyways, yes. Uh, just quickly, I want you. You guys are posting things and you were testing the Austrian cuisine and you really made a hardcore test uh, and I think that was mar much more Mark's <laughs> <laughs> approach. I think you went through the entire range of uh, available sausages uh, 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 in the Austrian um, um, uh, them, culture yes. of food. Yes. Huh? Can you, because we are, we, are, we are slowly running out of time and I should wrap up or we should wrap up or maybe this is the wrap up. <laughs> what for those who may be next year visitors um, and only looking at this um, endless diversity of sausages <laughs> you find in Austrian supermarket, what is your strongest recommendation? What is my strongest? Oh. <laughs> oh, you have to pick a favorite. Can you? Um, can, can I give more than one? Like, sure. Can I give like, Handful Talk of all about <laughs> your favorite. Um, Sarah, Sarah likes uh, the sausages that have a little bit of cheese inside of them. Ah, the case kind of. And yeah. I wasn't really aware of this, uh, so I'm reading the labels, and you know, it, my my uh, my Deutsch isn't very good, right? So like, it, like I don't know the word cheese. So he's like, that's Kese. that means Kese mm. means cheese. I'm mm. like, oh, let's get that. So very delicious. Um, there's uh, the thing we don't find in America with with sausages is uh, the casing, the snap mm -hmm. when you eat it. And so that's a re rewarding texture thing. Um, cool. so Mouthfeel. <laughs> Mouthfeel, yeah. So that, uh, so the sausages that tend to have that. And then there's a spicy, it's a reddish color. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, that's oh. That's the so, Balkan influence so those here. Three, those three <laughs> gen were generally my, you know, I would try a different okay. one. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, yes. uh, uh, these two guys honored uh, the Austrians' uh, trash cuisine, I would say, yes. oh, yeah. <laughs> very much. It's like this snack on the menu, and I'm like, no, this is not no, a snack. Yeah. This is no snack. This, <laughs> this is my dinner. Yes. All right. Uh, um, um, but on the other side, I heard that you started growing veggies in your gardens in Las Vegas. So, yes. And yes. if you would ask me, yeah, um, please don't balance this. More growing, less sausages. <laughs> we are running out of time. I have to say that um, uh, I promise that we will further um, uh, follow you. Uh, we, we will not let you escape uh, and we cannot wait to see 
more of you guys. Um, I think we think that you're on a good way. It's, it's, it's wonderful where, uh, that we could uh, be a part of your endeavor. And uh, I wish you, I think you stay another week here in Austria and then you're going to Leiden. Yes. yes. And then you're going home. So you have uh, quite something in front of you, but that sounds um, super convincing and wonderful. Have a great time. Thank you for a contribution here. Um, I already now know that I'm very happy when I meet you again. Take care, please. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, so that brings us to the next program points uh, and Mr. Martin to wear the glasses. Um, and um, I'd like to introduce you now in the next, uh, in some uh, uh, program points that are coming in the next session, but also in the final sequence. It is uh, 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 the Hong Kong Garden uh, and the wine tasting party, which also appeared last year as some legend party. It is really that uh, even in the digital people find a way to drink alcohol. Uh, in that way it is wine tasting, it is about red wine and it is like a telepresence uh, hybrid uh, event um, in Hong Kong that was a little bit uh, a star in the last year's festival. And um, before we are looking at the teaser, <coughs> I'd like to introduce you then uh, um, in uh, um, some parts and program points in the last session, uh, like we have the ritual, we give you insight in the experts of the future, we, we will see something about taste your soil, um, and uh, you will see a focus of uh, the many, many programs that on this last day of the festival are still out there around. The festival is over, when it's over, when it's the last day, it's just the beginning of this day. Um, in front of us, another wonderful, intense experience of a festival, of real people meeting here in Linz. I thank you, I thank you. That was my last uh, session to moderate. I see you in the afternoon for the recap uh, and uh, enjoy life, enjoy the last program points and please take care out there. Bye bye. I never really thought soil would smell like this. It smells like Chinese herb medicine. Yeah. It smells good, you know, if it tastes as good as it smells. <laughs> but I feel that this soil is actually more than just soil because it's in front of that tree. It tastes like sand. Much better than the we thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if this was a tea flavor, I might even even drink it because it's so <laughs> oaky. It's mm. it's crunchy too. Dobar dan, zovem se Ilić Alexi. Što se tiče životinja, mislim da će sto posto se naći nove vrste, neki mešovi ne buba i i i životinja, što će biti veoma čudno. A također mislim da će ljudi jako nas predovati u misijama u svemir. Gdje ćemo da idemo u svemir? Najvjerojatnije ćemo uspjeti da prođemo kroz crnu rupu i tamo, nadam se, naći planetu pogodnu za život. I hoće biti budućnost dobra ili neće biti dobra? Svetla ili nije svetla? Mene pitate siva. Ja sam Lazar Stevanović i ja mislim da će budućnost izgledati... Pa skoro isto kao 
i sad mislim da će samo kola i zgrade se promijeniti. Šta mi za koliko godina će se to, to desiti? Pa kola? Za nekih 50 godina sigurno. Će kola biti skroz drugačija? Da. Kako na primjer? Pa da onako su malo podignuta od zemlje i da lete. Zdravo, ja sam Tamar Žuvinović. E, imam jed... Imam deset godina. Žela bi budućnosti da, da ima više električnih automobila i da budu jeftiniji, da bi mogli svi da ih kupuju. Voljela bih da postoje roboti koji čiste e, za ljudima, da ne bi bilo toliko prljavih stvari. Toliko prljavog mjesta. Arte exists in six languages for 360 million Europeans. 360 million ways of seeing. Arte.tv I'm Jake Elwes and I'm a new media video artist. The ZZ Project is about exploring the intersection between drag performance and queer identities along with deepfake technology and the ways in which art can help to demystify artificial intelligence. Meine Damen und Herren, Mesdames and Messieurs, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone between and beyond the binary, welcome to the ZZ Show. The ZZ Show is an interactive online deepfake cabaret where you can play with these deepfake drag artists that have been generated using artificial intelligence. Through the magic and mystery of artificial intelligence, we will create a deepfake bespoke drag experience especially for you on our virtual stage. As an artist, I'm so interested in when these systems break down. I think there's a lot of poetry in seeing these algorithms not do what they were originally intended to do. And I thought this is a wonderful place to work with drag performers because drag is about challenging society's notions around gender. So to use those performers to challenge these data sets highlights the fact that the people who have designed these systems and algorithms had a bias towards normativity. Well, my dears, it's now over to you to make your first decisions of the show. It's quite simple, really. Pick a performer, then pick an act. We made sure that we had a really good range of drag kings, drag queens, of different genders, different sexualities, and people from different parts of the London drag scene. And we created deep fake versions of each of those different performers. Representation and consent were really important considerations for us in tackling how these technologies are currently being used to exploit people, such as with deep fake porn or fake news. To construct a deep fake body, you initially film reference footage of someone moving around a room, you film them from every angle. This becomes your data set. You then do what's called skeleton tracking, 
you turn the body into all of these different points. The machine learning then comes in and eventually it creates a version of that person that is almost indistinguishable from reality. You can then feed in any new skeleton doing any new movement and it will create a synthesized version of that person doing that movement. I guess something for me that's always been really important in my work is to think about ways of demystifying artificial intelligence. There's so much fear that goes on, and that's often due to miscommunication around what we mean when we talk about AI. Deep fake is, in a way, an example of that, of our worst fears coming to life, that this machine is able to replace a human. That's not really the case, Right now, the issues are ethical and political and around policy and around power and aren't so much around are computers going to replace the human brain. The work deliberately plays with this false idea that AI systems are human-like. It constructs an AI character only to then deconstruct it, showing how it breaks down and making visible the technologies used in its construction. Now, my darlings, AI systems often inherit the bias of the cis-white heteronormative patriarchy that controls our society. But here at the ZZ Show, we plan to disrupt the data set by flooding it with a myriad of marvelous queer drag bodies. These huge, vast data sets get created by these companies. If the people gathering that data have a bias towards white, Western faces, then the software that they're creating will do a really bad job at recognizing black people or trans people. The ZZ Project is about tackling that bias. So thinking about how we can create our own data sets and take back the control. And as a queer community, thinking about whether we want to be recognized by these systems and can we queer these systems? So this idea of like dirtying the data or querying the data is something that I'm quite interested in. So we are creating a political piece of work, but it's, it's lighthearted and it's fun at its core. Um, it's silly, it's cabaret, it's like, it's an AI drag queen, but it does have this more serious dimension, um, which I hope that people will pick up when watching the piece. Hello, my darlings. My name is Me the Drag Queen, and I would like to welcome you to the gorgeous and historic Royal Vauxhall Tavern here in London. I am joined by artist Jake Elwes, and we are about to have a very fascinating conversation. So yeah, we're going to be talking about the ZZ Project. So it's the project I've been working on for the past few years, which is exploring the intersection of drag performance and artificial intelligence and deep fakes. And what we're going to do is answer a bunch of viewer, audience, fan questions. So uh, it's over to you for the first one of the night. Where did the name ZZ come from? Oh, should I take this one? Yeah, you do the you do the boring <laughs> bit of the name, and I'll do the funny bit. Okay. <laughs> um, so the name ZZ came from a combination of the Z vector, which is how you control an interface with artificial intelligence, and the Z pronoun, which is gender neutral pronoun. It's also the French for Willy. What is it like seeing your resemblance perform in a style that isn't your own? I think one of the most enjoyable things is um, actually kind of where you start seeing the similarities. Like, you know, when my sister Lily snaps Dragon, like, it's so clear that we have been 
working together for, for years and years and years and years. Um, so it's nice to kind of see actually where these sort of things intersect, but then being controlled by Chio's body and his like incredible movement that he does as a king was sort of like mind blowing. And um, yeah, it was just a whole like delightfully bizarre melting pot of <laughs> stuff. When will it speak? Well, Siri and Alexa, right? It's gendered. And often we talk about the level of trust in relation to the gender which the AI assistant is. So yeah, we, we were looking into doing a gender neutral voice, which would be really fantastic. And actually there are some researchers working on this yeah. right now. I think there's Equal AI and Copenhagen Pride a few years ago created something called Q, um, which is an AI voice, but it's been trained on a data set of gender neutral and trans people. AI systems often fail trans people. Discuss. Discuss. <laughs> it's not a question, just discuss it. Um, yeah, it's very true, it does. Especially for fac facial recognition, um, when people are on hormones and their face shape is changing and their voice is changing, often these things fail to recognize them. And I guess as we're using these things more and more to like access our bank accounts and all sorts of things, like obviously that's quite dangerous if it fails to recognize you. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess there's always that question of, of whether you want to be recognized. Kim's easy death drop. Ooh, um, she struggles, like me, getting up and up and down off the floor. Uh, when Caramel provided movement for the ZZ show, she did a couple of dropping into the split moments and then a bit of floor routine. And um, <laughs> then the AI generated people on top, just kind of becoming these melted puddles on the floor. I think it really struggled. As soon as the, the body started contorting out of the usual sort of like this into those strange floor-based positions, she couldn't cope with that, but it was it was enjoyable to watch. And like most drag acts, you know, getting down onto the floor isn't always pretty. <laughs> Would you kai kai with AI me? <laughs> I mean, I am a narcissist, so absolutely. <laughs> Why are you doing this? She's terrible at painting. This is the only way to make art. <laughs> I think, yeah, that. I mean, I, I'm really interested in the process itself. In like showing the materiality of these algorithms, of these processes, like trying to expose how this stuff is working. Because like we're all talking about AI loads, we're all talking about deep fakes. Like people don't really understand what goes into making a deep fake and what artificial intelligence actually means. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of use it. And I think in a way that was where it made so much sense to pair it with drag. So I guess that's why I'm doing it. I kind of want to change the narrative. I want to find a way of yeah, celebrating communities rather than oppressing them with these technologies, which are quite dark and exploitative by nature. What would you say to AI drag queens taking over the world? Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. We've not been doing so well ourselves, have we? Like, we've, the human race have had a long fucking time to get their shit together, and they are not really doing so. So maybe it is time that drag queen AI took over and ruled us all. I, I'm very much in the mindset that AI is not going to take over anytime soon. And actually, the most interesting things happen when it's humans collaborating with these super sterile mathematical counting machines and you know, the creativity and the quirkiness and queerness of a drag performer kind of paired with these cool technologies makes something really interesting. We do all have this idea of like the Terminator. So yeah, I'd probably argue that, that it's not going to take over. <laughs> Why drag? I mean, it's my job, so that's kind of <laughs> what I'm here for. Um, I just think, uh, you know, we, we want to inject the, the fun, the spirits, the community, yeah, for me it's like drag because drag is fun and celebratory and playful and can be camp and silly and all of those things and kind of take it into a completely different direction. But also drag for me is often about challenging ideas and notions around gender and around normativity. And that is something that is generally lacking or completely overlooked mm -hmm. by people building these systems. So. That's why.
Charmant, liebenswert und schön. Berlin sind wir zwar nicht und trotzdem Trendsetter. Awesome. Von uns bekommst du das etwas andere Österreich. Wir sind nicht perfekt. Aber eines können wir versprechen. Menschen, die dich mit offenen Armen empfangen. Linz ist Linz. In a world where people wrote things on typewriters and no one had ever landed on the moon. A lone speechwriter was given the task of drafting a speech for President Richard Nixon that would hopefully never be delivered. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. The speech would be presented to a global audience only if tragedy struck and the Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were stranded on the moon. It was never used and remained in dusty archives until two artists found out about it and decided to bring it to life. Was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing and we were sitting around a group of us who brainstormed regularly. We'd been thinking a lot about misinformation and how new technologies, in particular deep fakes, were starting to become more and more prevalent. And we thought, ah, oh, there is this speech that we knew of written by Bill Sapphire for Nixon. We thought, amazing speech that was never delivered plus deep fake technology equals It was just like, yeah, bingo, that's a good idea. But hold on. Aren't deep fakes bad? Deep fakes have got the potential to be dangerous like all types of misinformation. So we tried to walk this fine balance between making our piece as believable as possible to induce an emotional reaction in our audience, but then to quickly say, this isn't real, here's how we did it, and watch out for other situations where you might encounter this kind of misinformation. The majority of people acknowledge that the moon landing happens. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So by us creating a deep fake, we wouldn't be causing some kind of misinformation. I love the moon, you love the moon, everybody loves the moon. What could go wrong? But Fran and Halsey weren't technical experts, and they didn't even understand how deepfakes worked. We like, as artists and directors and journalists, to work with technology, but I'm certainly never the one who's coding. We're not experienced with things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, or really any form of synthetic media, so we needed some help. And the best people that we found in the game at the time were Kanye AI, who was doing video dialogue replacement, and Reese Beecher, who were making synthetic voices. They got down to work with the help of smart people and smart machines from these two companies. We wanted to make what we call a complete deep fake, which means not only creating a video of somebody saying something they never said, but also creating a synthetic voice that sounds exactly like the person we are targeting, in this case, President Nixon. To make a deep fake, first, they needed a target video. This video is what Kenny would manipulate by changing only the mouth motions. Everything else would remain totally authentic. We've downloaded loads and loads of Nixon speeches from the White House. It seemed that the resignation speech had the right kind of body language, the right kind of emotion in the eyes. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. We then needed an actor who was going to read the contingency speech. Good evening, my fellow Americans. An AI model was trained to understand human faces. Now that the AI could understand faces, it was able to map the actor's facial motion onto Nixon's. Fates has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest.
Watch the hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the hands. That's creepy. When we got the first video back from Kenny, which was a video of President Nixon delivering the speech, albeit in the actor's voice, we knew at that moment that this was really going to work. They also wanted a synthetic version of Nixon's voice, which meant they would need to create an audio AI model as well. Making Nixon's voice was way more complicated. We decided to use speech-to-speech -speech technology rather than text-to-speech technology because that enabled us to use an actor to create a performance of the speech which would be translated into Nixon's voice. Again, they had to feed the model loads and loads of data. The actor recorded hundreds of short clips from Nixon's Vietnam speeches. In a sense, the AI learns like people do. It is exposed to lots of examples. If this is the input, then this is the output. And then with those examples, it learns how to take any input and translate that into a corresponding output. I get the idea now. I sure messed up my test paper. So you need Nixon saying one thing. And then our actor saying the same exact thing. And we do this hundreds and hundreds of times. And do what I believe was right. And do what I believe was right. And do what I believe is right. Except the first defeat. Except the first defeat. I have noted, for example, that a Republican senator. I have noted, for example, that a Republican senator. So then once we'd got all of that done, it gets sent into the deep learning black box. And then magically, our AI learns to convert anything our actor says into the same thing in the form of synthetic Nixon. So we had a video of Nixon mouthing the words of the speech, and we had a synthetic version of the speech itself. All we had to do was put it together to form our complete deep fake. For every human being who looks up at the moon in the nights to come, will know that there is some corner of another world that is forever mankind. But the film isn't entirely a deep fake. How did they make the lunar lander appear to crash? So we really only wanted to use actual archival footage from the Apollo 11 mission, even though we wanted to tell a totally different alternative history. This is where we used a whole bunch of cheap fakes. We manipulated the archive film to crash the eagle onto the moon. The lunar lander was actually returning to the orbiter, not crashing. We listened meticulously to loads of audio from the control room to try and find any kind of anxiety in anyone's voices. So we found this one area, okay, let's repeat that, and let's repeat all the beeps, and then what we'll do is we'll cut really, really fast between lots and lots of, of visuals. Cheap fakes are tried and true techniques for generating this information. You can change the speed of the video, you can do selective editing, you can reverse things, you can repeat things. These are all very standard techniques that have been used for as long as film has existed, and that's what we did here. Although um, deep fakes are a problem in terms of misinformation, cheap fakes are actually more problematic. More people have got their hands on the tools of being able to manipulate video and audio to deceive people. But did the deep fake convince people? The first iteration of this piece was like as a physical installation. We were working with IDFA, the documentary festival in Amsterdam, and we had got inspiration from the 1960s watch parties that would happen for big events. It was really fun to watch the reactions of people as they tried to figure out what the heck was going on. Is this really President Nixon? Did he say that? Hold it, the moon landing happened, right? Oh, I never knew that Nixon actually recorded this contingency speech just in case. It was a challenge for us to strike the right balance between using synthetic media convincingly enough to make people realize its power, but not so convincingly that they didn't understand it was fake. We launched our website and also launched on YouTube as well. Oh man, we got some we got some great comments on YouTube and on Reddit too. There was an amazing thread going there and people keep on leaving YouTube comments. Lots of opinions. <laughs>
It's like they say, you can use a hammer to bonk someone on the head, or you can use it to build a house. Synthetic media is kind of the same. We definitely do need to find a way to combat deep fakes and to educate people around them. But there are ways that AI and synthetic media, I really hope and think, can be used in really creative ways. It's critical that we all do whatever we can to inoculate ourselves against the bad actors out there who will inevitably use it for nefarious purposes. So remember, kids, what you see and hear might not be what is real. Even I am not what you think. I am completely synthesized. Thanks to Respeecher. Good night. Hello and welcome once again to all our visitors, all our partners, everybody really tuning in to Ars Electronica Festival channel for a session called Sound Arts and Artificial Intelligence. My name is Tori Reichel and it's my pleasure to welcome you here in the Kepler's Gardens in Linz. Um, the topic of this session, sound, uh, arts and artificial intelligence, of course ties in perfectly with today's motto of Ars Electronica's uh, festival, 
Sunday, uh, the last day of the festival, is Arts Thinking Day. Um, and today we are deliberately focusing uh, once again on the artists, on their thinking, and above all, on their actions. Um, it's a day of the Ars Electronica in which the winners of the Golden Knickers um, will have an uh, extended opportunity to talk and um, explain their views and present their work. Um, what will happen within the next hours? Uh, we are, within the next two hours, we are going to have a conversation with the artists um, that contributed all this amazing work um, to this year's pre Ars Electronica. Um, and it's all work that, in some sort of way, combines music and sound art with elements of artificial intelligence technology. Um, what I am especially delighted about is we are going to meet some of the masterminds behind this work and like I said prior we are going to have um, plenty of time to talk to them about um, their work. One of them um, is Alexander Schubert, the winner of this year's Golden Nika in the category uh, Digital Music and Sound Art. We are going to talk about his amazing piece of work, um, Convergence. I'm already looking forward to that. Uh, we are also going to talk to Rasheen Fahande, the artist behind another very, very um, amazing piece of work called A Father's Lullaby. Um, it uh, was awarded with an award of distinction in this year's category of uh, music and sound arts. And furthermore, we are going to talk to Maurice Jones pretty soon. Um, he is one of the masterminds of MUTEC, a festival that is taking place every year in Montreal as well as uh, Tokyo. But of course, we are not going to only talk about um, the award-winning work. We are also going to take a look at the projects. One, um, yeah, but before we do that, we also have a lot of um, amazing partner projects that we want to introduce to you. One of them is, of course, uh, the Ars Electronica Gardens. If you have uh, followed the uh, channel throughout the last couple of days, you, of course, already know about um, our partner organizations uh, organizing the Ars Electronica Gardens really all over the world. Um, we are going to introduce two of the partner gardens that are taking place as um, Ars Electronica, once again, is a duo hybrid festival that takes place physically and virtually all over the world on five continents. Um, two of the places that we are going to hop into today uh, and going to visit is garden number one in Bologna, Italy. Um, in Italy, our partners actually um, have made a tour through gardens throughout all of Italy from northern Italy from the mountains all the way down to the south and um, to the southern coast of Italy. And garden number two that we are going to introduce to you is um, placed in Mexico where um, our partners in Mexico's third largest university um, created a decentralized exhibition all over Mexico City, one of the biggest cities in the world. Um, take a look.
Buta. E poi si sente l'acqua sotto. Si sente l'acqua sotto però. Sì, sì. Um, in Mexico and Italy. Welcome back to this session that is about uh, music and sound art as well as artificial intelligence. And we are now going to hop into a very uh, interesting project or actually a festival taking place annually in Montreal. It is called Mutech. Um, we are going to meet one of the masterminds behind this festival, but before that, I want to give you a short introduce, uh, introduction into Mutech. Um, Mutech is a non, not-for-profit organization dedicated to the development of digital, digital creativity in sound, music, and audiovisual arts. Um, its mandate is to provide a platform for the most original and most visionary artists currently working in the field with the intent of providing an outlet of initiation and discovery for the audiences we seek to develop, uh, they seek to develop. Um, Mutec is, its core activity is the presentation of the annual festival in uh, Montreal that has been taking place every year since the year 2000. Um, and furthermore, they are actually hosting one of our partners, gar partner gardens in Montreal. Um, we, are talking, we are going to talk about that in detail later on. Um, by now, Mutec has expanded way beyond the festival. They are also um, creating tours as well as um, another festival taking place in Tokyo, not to mention a record label. So they really have uh, business all over the place. Um, before we are going to talk to Maurice Jones, one of the creators of Mutech Festival, we are going to take a short look into the festival. Thank you. 
That was a closer look into Mutec Festival, and it is my pleasure to now actually introduce one of the masterminds behind Mutec. Um, he joins us via Zoom, and his name is Maurice Jones. Hey, Maurice. Hi, Tori. Thank you for having me. Thanks for taking the time. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of in information about you. Um, you are a curator, a producer, and an artificial intelligence policy researcher. You're based in Montreal as well as Tokyo. Um, in 2021, you joined Mutex Montreal headquarters in developing its market activities and the artificial intelligence related programming of the professional Mutex forum. Um, and also you are currently a PhD candidate at Concordia University in Montreal and a fellow at the Humba Uni Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. Is that correct? And that's all correct. Okay, great. <laughs> um, okay, let's really hop into the conversation. First things first, um, Mutech by now is a very well-known and prestigious festival when it comes to electronic music and music technology. 
But for people that never had the chance to visit Mutech, um, could you try to sum up what it is all about, where it started, and what it has developed into ever since? Sure. So uh, Mutech uh, started 22 years ago already in, in Montreal. Um, originally, like founded in the in the kind of electronic music scene, but quickly diving into that music technology, that digital digital art scene. Like uh, Mutech itself stands for uh, not music and technology, but uh, actually mutating technology. That means the the idea from the very beginning was how how do we as humans kind of uh, make sense of our our technological world, and explore that through the lens of of music and art. Um, so the festival has been around uh, since 22 years. It's been uh, quite, it's quite an institution now in Montreal, but it also started to form this uh, international network uh, of new tech editions around the world with uh, editions now in Mexico City, in Buenos Aires, in San Francisco, Barcelona, Dubai, and, and Tokyo um, at the moment. So it's really like this international network that developed, um, which uh, never was in the sense of a franchise in a way, but it was rather that local communities, like we founded it in, in Japan uh, six years ago, that we felt that there's something behind that concept that really makes sense in kind of connecting that local community with, with the international uh, um, communities through this lens of digital art and electronic music. And um, I think it's been, been highly successful so far and um, for now. <laughs> um, you already mentioned that it is, uh, Mutech basically stands for a mutation and um, music developing. Is that what makes Mutech unique? Or what would you say, what is it that makes Mutech unique as an institution or as a, as a festival? I think the idea of mutating technology, especially at the time that it started, was very unique at the time. However, there's like other festivals, of course, uh, uh, that are like working, working on that topic uh, uh, a lot more, also especially in recent years. And that's actually like super, super interesting to, to start also those exchanges in different parts of, of the world. What I think makes Mutech unique and also what made us want to bring it to Japan six years ago was really this, this idea of um, developing that local community, um, really embracing the local talent, which is probably like one of the biggest strong points in, in Mutech Montreal as well. When the first time I came to Montreal and realized that more than 60% of the program was Quebec or Canadian artists, and that a lot of those artists, when you speak with them, some have been there since the beginning of Mutech. Um, and they really developed their career together with Mutech because that platform always gave them like space for experimentation, for exploring new ideas. Um, but then at the same time, connecting that with like bringing international people in, but not in a way that the artists just come in and they like showcase their work and then they hop on a plane and they leave but really creating that space for connecting the international artists with the local artists and like have new joint commissions, have new performances, have new collaborations. I think that's that's very unique about Mutech and I have seldom seen that um, in, in, in other places uh, around the world. And that's why, why it made sense for us to bring it to Tokyo because that's, that's exactly what we were looking for at the time. Um, speaking of Tokyo, um, you've established that festival, I think five years ago now. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience and also the choice to um, start it from all, all the places in the world you decided to choose Tokyo. Why was that the case and what has the experience been like? Um, it's been quite a trip, to be honest. So I personally, I used to live in Japan for, for 10 years. So I was already established in Tokyo before we started the, the festival. And at the time, we've been running uh, various kinds of events, uh, club nights, audiovisual events, concerts, and all these kinds of things. But it was around 2013, 14, when we felt that something something was missing. And what was missing, what we felt, was exactly that, that platform for experimentation, that it seemed that there was only space for like established artists to, to play on big stages, but that like young up-and-coming artists didn't have uh, the support and also not that space and the, the, the ability to, to get on stages and just experiment and try and it's um, it's okay to fail sometimes as well, you know, but that wasn't really provided and we've been looking around for different kind of concepts at the time 
of what could make sense. And uh, we looked like at the sonars, of course, Ars Electronica was a big inspiration. But um, with Mutech, there was something very special that, that we felt that would make a lot of sense, like that focus on, on live performance, especially because we're coming from that electronic music kind of side of, of live performance. But then exactly pairing it with, with this digital art, with that technology and just having like a broader scope of different touch points where we can like bring people in, which uh, especially in Japan, um, it's still like there's a big stigma on like electronic music and the club scene. So broadening it a little um, was a good way to kind of like get people into in, into that whole idea and um, also show that like uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto is not that far away from someone who might be playing electronic music at a, at a club venue and ex like showing these kind of intersections has been been quite a trip and um, it's been highly successful so far. Um, it's our sixth year this year. Um, we, we finally got acknowledged by the, it's called the Bunkacho, the Agency for Culture, which is the highest cultural institution in Japan, which are supporting us this year. So like, I think we're, we're doing something right and um, I'm quite excited for the next five years at least. Um, but I think this is going to be a long-term project, so. Um, you already mentioned you have lived in Tokyo for a longer time. You live in Montreal, you've been working in Germany. And um, one of your, your core um, interests and things that you work with is artificial intelligence in combination with music. Um, do you feel that there is like um, a different approach to that type of technology in different places? And if so, how is it different from one place to another? Well, it's good that you're asking that because that's really one of my my core research interests, not only on the music side, but also like on the on the policy side in my PhD. I'm very interested in, in cross-cultural visions of, of artificial intelligence. Exactly that question, like how do people that have different cultural backgrounds, but can also be disciplinary backgrounds, really understand what, what AI is? Because AI, it's it's such a broad term and everyone has kind of like a different vision that is informed by pop culture or by professional backgrounds, by cultures. And when that really became apparent to us, or to me specifically, was we've been running a series of uh, AI labs uh, as part of as part of Mutech. Um, they were originally initiated by Natalia Fuchs, who's a Russian curator um, at the time at Gamma Festival, and then we brought it to uh, Mutech Japan and afterwards to, to Mutech Montreal. And um, we brought people from, we brought researchers and engineers and curators together, but we also brought people together that had completely different cultural backgrounds. We had people from Mexico, from Kenya, from uh, Bulgaria, Germany, Japan, Russia, Canada. Um, all over the place. And what really quickly became apparent was that what AI is is not clear at all. And it really depends on where you're coming from and what your artistic practice is. There was uh, one artist, for example, Hexosismos, I think he performed last year at Ars Electronica, who had like a decolonial approach to, to artificial intelligence. So the idea that artificial intelligence is just a new kind of technology that uh, colonizes people in new ways and maybe is more efficient at doing that. While, at, on the other hand, um, if we talk with uh, Takashi Kegami, for example, who is a Japanese uh, AI and artificial life researcher, um, he goes more into the idea of um, the, the idea of shared intelligence between machines and humans, you know, this kind of symbiosis between between human beings and uh, and machines. Um, so it's it's very interesting how how different the understandings are, and what's even more interesting is that even though these understandings are are so different, we still can kind of start and find common ground somewhere. Like we talk about completely different things, but still somehow we manage, or I guess we have to manage to to deal with these kind of questions uh, together. So yeah, that's a very exciting topic that I'm very passionate about, and I could probably go on for hours speaking about this, but. Um, I don't think we have that much time. I mean, so. we still have a little bit of time left. Um, and you already mentioned like your personal passion for the topic. Um, when it comes to artificial intelligence and music, what is, for you personally, which areas, which perspectives currently are like really exciting? I think, um, so the, I've seen a lot of this kind of style GAN transfers in different kind of ways when it comes to, 
to like rhythm generation and um, I don't know, lyrics generation and this whole idea of, of, of having an input and then synthesizing kind of <clears throat> like a kind of latent space, a common area where that input kind of intersects and then create new rhythms that might, or like melodies or something that might be new, but they're still kind of fed by, by what has been done before, which um, I think that has been going on for like a few years now. Um, and I feel that we kind of need to start pushing a little bit be, beyond that because people have seen that. It's also on the visual side, by the way, like there's a lot right. of this generative artificial intelligence visuals. If on one hand, like some people put like flowers and the other people put like, I don't know, other things. And then they generate like new flowers that have never been seen before. But it's get, starting to get a little mundane on that on that front. So I'm really interested in like unsupervised learning or like spiking neural networks that really um, are even more black box than other technologies that we're using so far, but are really um, like the artist Isabella Salas was describing as like like working with artificial intelligence as if you're like working with like a two year old child and you tell it to do something and it doesn't do that. And I think going in that direction is like a, a, a lot more more exciting than because with the AI, the, the state of AI art now, it feels like, OK, we're just recreating things, um, which at the beginning was fun because we didn't know what was going on. But now it's been done, and I feel like we need to start pushing pushing further again. And I think um, what the Ars Electronica is doing with the AI labs and the Future Lab is going in the in the right direction. And um, it's definitely something that we as Mutech are planning to to continue exploring in the form of labs, but also in the form of like the Mutech Forum, which we which we did this year as well. So um, I'm quite excited to see where it's gonna go. But I feel like it's time to to keep on pushing pushing a little a little further. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah. You've you just said pushing a little further. Um, something that I personally have kind of um, when I think about um, how people the discourse about artificial intelligence and um, the excitement that people used to have a couple of years ago. I feel that at the same like right now there's also a certain weariness. Um, towards artificial intelligence and technology in general. And some people feel like technology and artificial intelligence kind of betrayed us. Um, what do you think, um, what, what has to, to change in the discourse around um, artificial intelligence and um, how can people like, get the positive aspects out of it? Well, there's there's many ways to to approach this, but I think like one of the key things that I try to advocate as well is that maybe using artificial intelligence is kind of misleading because it gives you expectations about things that we are very far from achieving at all. <laughs> so the idea of maybe calling it like algorithmic decision making systems or algorithmic assistance or these kind of things gives people a more realistic kind of idea. Of, of what is technically possible. Like conceptually, of course, it's like beautiful to think about artificial intelligence and what that means on a philosophical level. But I think um, not only for artists, but also in the public, there's a big confusion of, of what AI actually is capable uh, of doing. Um, in some ways, you could say that most of the algorithms that we employ are just like statistics on steroids. They're like doing the same thing that we're doing, just like a thousand times or ten thousand times more right. more efficient. And that that might be scary to people, but actually, it's still kind of like like understandable uh, what is going on. And also the idea that um, the idea that if we if we call it artificial intelligence, it's also a good way to like give away responsibility for for, for like researchers or like uh, politicians, policymakers to just be like, okay, the algorithm decided that, so we're not responsible because it's like artificially intelligent and it's like that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how it works at all. Um, so there, there's many many facets that I think we 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 need to approach um, this topic. Um, from, but especially like breaking it down to what it actually is and what is the, the technology capable of right now. That doesn't mean we shouldn't think about what the technology might be capable of in the future. But yeah, we have to be be a little realistic and also like explain things to, to people. And I think uh, art and music is actually a great tool for doing that, um, to have that interaction with, with the audience. 
um, and ask those questions and inform the people of what is possible and what is not possible. And yeah, I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges right now. There's just a big confusion about what what that term actually means and what is what is a what it is able to do at the moment. Um, Mutech has also teamed up with Ars Electronica for um, uh, one of the partners' gardens in Montreal. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that it, uh, is exhibited there and um, the whole interaction going on with that garden? Sure. Um, yeah, so we, we got invited to, to host the Ars Electronica Montreal garden. Um, our festival, the, the 22nd edition of Mutech Montreal, just uh, finished, I think, a week, a week and a half ago. Um, we had a hybrid format again, that means we had like in-person events um, with like limited capacities, but we also had uh, like our virtual festival platform that is actually still running until the end of September. It's virtual.mutech.org. Um, it's for free, so you can watch actually um, almost all of the performances that were presented in Montreal on demand online. And for us, Electronica, we made a selection of um, a couple of performances, I think it's seven or, or eight performances um, that are kind of like the highlights of, of the, the, the last edition um, that we wanted to showcase here for people to, to, to get an idea. Um, if we talk about AI, I think there's three interesting performances that people should, should check out on the, on the swap card platform. I think they have been screened, all of them already, so they should be available on demand. Uh, one is called Montreal Life Support and Wolk Empty Vessels, which is a uniquely complex AV performance um, that merges uh, robotics with uh, violins that are like played by neural networks and gives this kind of uh, metaphysical approach to artificial intelligence. There's a piece by Miriam Blue, which is called Unsculpt. She's also been using machine learning. Uh, algorithms, um, which when I saw that performance in real life, I was quite blown away because it had the AI aesthetics, but it really pushed it to another level. So really um, very interesting to see where that is going. And then there's another piece called Alma Fragments, the Shape of Things, which is also working on conceptual approaches to, to AI. So as I said, all of them are still available uh, in the swap card platform for us Electronica, but also on virtual.mutech.org. And um, we also have a collaborative program with Ars Electronica on, on artificial intelligence. It's like a two-part uh, panel discussion that has been led by Ali Nikran, the, the researcher at the Future Lab at Ars Electronica. Um, so the first part of the panel discussion, um, the question of autonomy, human intention, and art and AI uh, was held during Mutech with uh, Ali and then Isabella Salas, Mayadira Ganesh, and Yuri Suzuki. And the second part has been held, I believe, already during during this Ars Electronica edition, and should also be available in our in our garden uh, page. So yeah, please go go and check that out. Uh, I think it's quite exciting conversations that we have there, and of course, we're very happy to to be presenting these um, amazing performances. We only have a couple of seconds left, so. Um what I would want to know from you is what are you personally um, going to do in the close future? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Um, so I just moved to Montreal from, from Tokyo, so I'm going to be between both cities. We still have the Mutech Japan Festival coming up uh, in December. Um, I also started my PhD just now, so that's going to take a lot of my time. Um, I'm also going to be continue working with uh, Mutech in Montreal on the, on the curation of the forum and the, the market activities. So um, I'm keeping quite busy, um, but Sounds it's a good like time it. to be busy. So, Well, good luck on all of your endeavors. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a super interesting conversation. And thank you very much, Tori. Thanks a lot. We are now heading into um, the next project that won an award of distinction in the category Digital Musics and Sound Art. It is a very touching piece of art um, by Iranian-American multimedia artist um, Rasheen Fahande, and it's called A Father's Lullaby. It is a very complex, emotional, and timely work focusing on the role of men in raising children. Particularly, it explores the impact of incarceration on fatherhood and on families um, and highlights racial inequalities in the criminal justice system of the USA. Um, I was personally very touched by this piece of work and um, 
would just uh, say, let's take a look into a father's lullaby before we get joined by Rasheen here in the studio. Please take a look. Stay home and my baby I'm going away on a sailing boat And if I don't come back Stay home and my baby Teaching me everything that I need to know. The birds and the bees and stuff like that. It just gave me so much, so much love and support. I mean, she poured her heart out for everything. It's just hard to describe. She showed it to me in multiple ways, but you know, even though she she I still was missing the other side. Did what she was supposed to do as a mother. Father. So she only gave me uh, as much as she could give me, which was a whole lot. I was a young kid, and I never used to express my feelings all the time to her. I used to be upset because I needed that. Other half. That was a little peek into A Father's Lullaby by Rasheen Fahandej. And um, it is my pleasure to actually um, have Rasheen here in the studio right now. Um, hi. Hi. First of all, um, <coughs> congratulations on winning an award of distinction. Congratulations on this amazing piece um, of work. Before we jump in, or maybe let's just jump in right away. Um, what was the origin for this piece of work? I think you already started um, working on this in 2015, so quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, where did it start for you personally, and how did it develop into what it is right now? Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited about this conversation. Um, yeah, so the, the work started in 2015 when I um, I became a, a, an artist in residence with the mayor's office in Boston, uh, which was an incredible opportunity to look. This was a, um, a new initiative to look into bringing artists and this critical um, creativity into city departments and look into the issues and challenges that city departments were dealing with and bringing artistic um, uh, exploration as a way of um, engaging with that and addressing that. Um, that. That gave me access to, you know, follow the police department, look at the city planning, look at the um, um, women advancement um, uh, department. So it was, a, it, as, as an artist, I think that access and that um, to be able to be embedded in the system was r critical. Um, the other part was that I can say that like the way the seed of this project, the genesis of this project started when I was actually an immigrant in, in the United States and um, it was, I was studying um, in, in university and I was teaching after school programs to youths in inner city United States. And uh, you know, the, the a very, um, like challenging question that I could not comprehend was that how is it that in, that in a democratic society like United States, the inner city youths were experiencing so much violence and trauma. One of the first thing they wanted to talk about when we discussed like what, you know, what topic you want to address for your documentary was rest in peace pins. So they were carrying these 
pains with them of the losses that they were experiencing. They wanted to talk about stop and frisk. And this is, I'm talking about 17 years ago. So, so that was the, the question that it was, I was carrying with me. But it wasn't until I became, in 2015, an artist in residence and really looking into this space of violence and then looking into policies, mm -hmm. looking into uh, like really the structural. For me, that was a realization that it's not just we have a complex ecosystem as human you know, society and there are flaws. There are actually embedded um, policies and laws that we are discriminating and criminalizing people. So for me, there, there was a very strong connection between the absence of fathers particularly mm -hmm. and how that absence manifests in the life of children right. and women and mm -hmm. lower income communities of color particularly in the United States. So, um, so that's sort of the, 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 the beginning of it. And also like now, working within the system and working with the system and the artist space becoming this catalyst of, of co-creation and, and, and collaboration between different sides of this narrative is a very important aspect of it. So Federal Probation Office is a, is a, is a partner on the project. I teach at Emerson and the research is coming into, into, into the, my classroom and I have courses that students and fathers and formerly, for, formerly incarcerated fathers and probation officers come together. I can explain about that a little bit more. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the conceptual framework of how this um, yeah, inquiry together. has started. Mm -hmm. um, so the core element of this piece of work is lullabies that are performed, recorded by incarcerated fathers um, which is a very, very, um, to me personally, a very touching mm -hmm. um, approach to the topic of mass incarceration. Um, how did you, how did you um, decide to take this, this route of addressing the, the topic? Mm -hmm. um, so to, to just maybe expand on, on what you mentioned, um, the project is, has two arms, like a con cont continuously in different aspects of it, when I speak about it, you would kind of encounter that. And, and one is that it is a very uh, close connection and, and work with the formerly incarcerated fathers and their personal memories and stories, especially it is focused on childhood memories. When, you know, like how this is started, how the criminality is made in our country, because when you listen to their narrative, uh, you almost think that you're listening to the same story again and again and again, right? The, the absence of father due to mass incarceration, due to the other challenges, uh, a single mom who had to work double job to, to provide, and therefore absence in a way, and silence uh, because of the, the, the challenges and pressure, and also trauma, like experiencing trauma. But then another arm of the project that is very crucial for me is the open call to everyone in the community to participate. Because I really feel the urgency that we need to act as a society and the, and the, and the uh, responsibility should not be on the shoulder of those who are impacted by it. This is a philosophical question for a nation, for a world, to think about how we treat each other you know, when, um, so, so when you come to the pub, you know, the, the installation, you, you're not gonna, you do, you're not gonna know who's incarcerated or not. Right. And that's the really uh, instrumental aspect of it. Because you come, you're facing, it could be a deputy chief of federal probation who's singing. Mm -hmm. It could be a father who just released and talking. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that for me is a very kind of giving, giving their voices power and equal power, equal right. space and giving us the responsibility as that if there is a social injustice in our society, you know, US and the world, uh, and uh, how, how we as citizens, we need to engage. And, um, and lullabies, um, I think that's the power of art, right? Uh, that we, we would be able to come create a spaces that anybody from different perspective could enter mm -hmm. 
and we would be able to hear each other and maybe sort of drive and like transform or arrive into a different space that we might not have the opportunity otherwise, right? So you come, uh, and that's why I think lullabies is, is really a beautiful space because it, no matter who you talk to, it, in, it immediately brings you to a personal memory, right? Absolutely. And, and the personal memory could be very, the, the, another beauty is that it's very diverse, right? Each one of us would go to many different places, but, but that intimacy and that love and that care being the lens for, for change, I think is, is quite important for me. Um, what you have mentioned um, earlier is that you came to the US as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you bit by bit um, got to know the, the system that is behind um, this phenomena of mm -hmm. mass incarceration. Um, what did you like? When you think about when you started the project in 2015, what have you learned about the um, American system um, that you weren't aware of necessarily six years ago? Mm. I think um, the important part is, you know, looking at an issue. We all know that there is problem, yeah. right? We all know in this sort of general sense that there are things that we need to change. But I think the specificity of what needs to change and what is it that is creating this systemic problem is crucial. Um, data is really important, right? But then, you know, what, what, what the stories do is make them personalized, make them really connecting. And, and, and then another part of this, um, so I would say policy and, and being very specific and, if, and, and really kind of looking at that as, as, as the vehicle for change. And I think there are many different point of views that we need to come at this issue uh, in order to address it. The other, um, the other aspect also is, um, uh, <laughs> I lost my, Trade of thought. That's, <laughs> that's, that's fine. We have, we have plenty of time. Um, the, the intersectionality of right, the problems. Right. So I think that's another one that you are aware of. But once you once you get deeper, you realize the interconnectivity. The interconnectivity of, of all form of injustices, mm -hmm. right? So it's the spatial injustice, food injustice, uh, health. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so all of these education. Right. It is one it, thing it's that you... one thing, mm -hmm. and we need to look at them as one thing because when we are just separating them, it's not we are not creating solution for them. Mm -hmm. That makes absolute sense. Um, one aspect that you um, mentioned is that um, you see, especially in, in the context of this project, you see art um, as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate on that? Because I would like to understand sure. it a little bit better. Sure. What you mean by that? Sure. Um, so for this project, when I started kind of thinking about this really huge topic of mass incarceration, I was thinking about society and how the society is an ecosystem. And in order to cre create a response, an inquiry, and an investigation into this uh, problem, the, the project needs to sort of, in a way, replicate and, and be massive and be uh, inclusive. So one of the ways that I think about the art as ecosystem is that it, it allows for intersectionality, for interinstitutional collaboration, the sustainability of the work, and it's not just one project that exists, and it's a growing effort and, and growing collaborators. Um, and also, another thing is the multi multiplicity of narrative and stories. So it's about creating an alternative story and history through this sort of uh, rippling effect and, and, and the multiplicity of the stories that come together. Um, so as I mentioned, so for example, um, MIT Open Documentary Lab is a partner that I was investigating the um, technology, the use of technology in, 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 in bringing you closer to your body and to carrying the, the narrative, or the city of Boston, or the school, or the community members. The, the, so that's, that, that's what I'm thinking about it. And also, 
um, for me, the, like in the visual representation, is almost like a Persian carpet that there are many different elements and flowers and and pattern, but it comes together in a in a unified form. But it's growing and expanding. It's not a singular form that exists. So, for example, where when the project goes to a new location, the idea is that it will be an open call to the immediate community and everybody can participate and it generates new conversation and dialogue around this issue and it's not just the art experience it's tool sharing it's creating workshop that people come and use the technology to tell their own stories so what you see in the installation is less than 20 percent of my time that goes into into the work more than 80 percent of it I'm doing that sort of community building and tool sharing and, and, and all of that. In the background. It sounds like um, it is not a finished body of work by now. Yes. It's, it's, it keeps ev <laughs> not evolving. At all. So, what can we still expect um, coming up yes. from that? Yes, thank you for that. Um, so, another, another two arm of the project was that to think about how it's possible to activate the physical spaces, the local community, and look at the public side as a critical space for discourse and engagement, and, and shifting our memories, our collective memories, or collective dialogues and conversations around a topic. Uh, and, and, and I was imagining, you know, people passing by and hearing their fathers or their you know, uncle singing. So, so that sort of intimate, immediate criticality in the public side. But then another arm of the project from the beginning was thinking about a cyberspace as, as, this, as the connective point between different localities that we could have a different experience um, and bring all of these voices together to create that poetic movement that I consider, right? So for me, that's definitely an arm that needs that I look for collaborators. <laughs> uh, so it's really reliant on technology and how it's possible to really reimagine uh, public uh, virtual commons that we could you know, engage critically and intimately through these uh, spaces of intimacy and love. But, but uh, um, yeah, so that's one arm. The other one is the expansion of the project. Like I, uh, it has started in um, Boston and, it, and, and I have built a, an ecosystem around it. But the idea is that the, the project is outside of me as an artist, and it would be able to just move to different side and, and generate the same form of engagement and experiences. So that's another side of it. And then the third element for me is the, um, the relationship with policy. Hmm. Like how is it possible to engage directly through these uh, projects, through these personal stories and narratives with the system and in order to change and shift. Uh, because I think until that is not happening, it's very hard to imagine the change. Do you think that it's necessary to bring in arts into discussions and discourse about policy in order to actually Absolutely. change things? Absolutely. Absolutely. So for example, to give you a tangible example, a course that I'm teaching now at Emerson um, it's like around community co-creation, so it's disrupting the traditional power dynamic of documentary filmmaking and really thinking about how this amazing process of creation could become an opportunity to share tools and work together and learn and bring the expertise of the community members as the, their, their lived experiences as an expertise into this space. Uh, there are also federal probation officers that they work with the, um, with the um, students. And then at the end of the semester, there are stories, whether through six, 360 video or uh, AR project, different form. Projects are created that the fathers and their children were at the center of telling their own stories. And then it become a vehicle. And then now what we are doing now is that, you know, we're in the conversation with judges. So for their last, their last presentations, there were federal judges that they came to the, to the program. There is a lot of discussion with federal probation office in D.C. and in Boston to really kind of engage because it gives them an opportunity to look into this life mm -hmm. and this experience from a totally different perspective. Mm -hmm. And we are all human, right? 
and we are all con Empa em empathetic empathetic and beings. I believe in all of us really wanting the best for for us and for everybody so it's just having that opportunity to expand your perspective and give and a human perspective on the actual stories behind yes. these numbers and, and yes yes and to be able to see these men from a different point of view now and i i think it's a very powerful and and you know i i, dr I drive that from the experience from mayor's office to now to federal court and i think it's essential to bring this artistic creation and, and investigation as a form of critical advocacy uh, for work because it's a different connection. It's a different language and we need all of our arms and hands and tentacles <laughs> to, do, to, to do this work. And, uh, and I think, yeah, the, story, the, the, the art and power of storytelling has that power to, to bring us closer together and move beyond the binaries <laughs> that we try to you know, create. Um, one aspect that I was personally like asking myself when I watched your work is um, how did you actually approach um, these people and communities mm. to eventually engage in the project? Because it's such a sensitive topic, it's so personal, um, and I guess you have to be so sensitive about uh, the way you, you go about it. So um, was that challenging and how did people react and how did it eventually work out? No, I, can, I can't say challenging, but I can say that is a very different ways of engagement. I don't have a singular way. Um, one thing that I do for sure is that I don't, um, as, if I'm working with the, with the people who are directly experiencing that trauma right. that I'm addressing, I try to not go I try to always go through a support system and a connection that already exists within their network. And I'm not just like going cold into that space. But also like within the community, I walk around the city and I just ask people to, you know, so there are many different ways. Mm -hmm. Or for example, with the course, um, it's a one full, one full semester of engagement that you kind of sustainly get to know each other and work with each other. But what I find is that like everybody is so like especially the fathers it's so much generosity and it's so much trust that i find that that like i sit down and we talk i, I don't have a lot of asks mm -hmm. so i usually they can just sit down they can talk uh or they can sing and and you know it just goes with the flow of how much they want to share but I find it to be like really a generous space in a way that um, that they they it's a side of a story that has not been talked about much, right? And it's not a very important part of it, uh, and they I think they feel it and they just give it, which mm -hmm. is like incredible. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I find it to be very like, constantly a very moving um difficult but very moving a space because of that amount of generosity that that is, exists from their side um of course Ars Ars electronica is about technology for a, a huge part mm -hmm. um and your work um, includes technology, but it also always uh, includes um, community work mm -hmm. and the work with, with actual human beings. Um, do you think that um, the way that we approach technology when it comes to those things, um, do we need to in, involve technology more into, in art and community especially? And do we already like mm -hmm. um, get the most out of it, out of technology <laughs> in that sense? I think for me it has two sides again. <laughs> One is that you know when technology is already uh, impacting how we think and how we act and how we explore and and uh, and, and it's a very fast pace mo moving, right? So it's the technology is changing. So for me, it's not that like engaging with the trend. For me, it's an ethical responsibility to be at the forefront, engage with the tools, and try to expand them and give them alternative 
you know, possibilities. So, and then for me is, is not just the artists, is how the community members would be at the forefront of this table and at the forefront of this exploration. So one side of it is that, that, that sort of ethical responsibility. The other side of it is that technology has this amazing power if we use it you know, pro properly in the right place that it is really an extension of our like, body and mind right. and it creates new opportunities for engagement, for encounter uh, that that you know we might not have it otherwise, and that's the beauty, uh, the beautiful side of it. So it becomes really be you know wonderful in that sense that it is not a um, solid form or a finished statement. It is an, a constant evolving and, and evolution and, in, and, and inquiry in how we could do it better, mm -hmm. not just the technology, but the connection, right? So for me, the, the, the technology is about how I can use this tool the most, you know, it, it's in its most capacity. In most to, impactful to, way. Yes, to, to connect and, and to move the participants, or I call them witnesses, uh, to, to bring a transformation in, into that space. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of um, <laughs> branches and things in mind that you still want to expand within this project. I don't, I don't know if that already take that could be enough for for months and years probably. <laughs> I don't know if you work on any other um, future projects. Um, mm -hmm. If you do, um, what are you working on, and where do you see like what's your final vision with a father's lullaby? Where do you want to take it? Mm -hmm. So I think the final, definitely, Father's Lullaby is sort of my main core project, but I'm also continuously creating um, like other forms of, of engagement. Uh, so for example, last year, uh, I was facilitating a series of workshops at Ars Electronica, which was through um, um, American Arts Incubator, and it was around art technology and social um, inclusion uh, in, in, in Austria. Uh, so I kind of consider, not, not kind of, like I definitely consider pedagogy as an extension of my practice and, and decentralizing this sort of artistic role and really using that opportunity to bring many other minds and bodies into this space of criticality around social justice issues. So definitely I'm, I'm putting a big effort on on like facilitation and, and teaching as, as a way of, of expansion of, of a father's lullaby. But also, as I mentioned, there is definitely the cyber arm of the project that I would love to have collaborators. You know, like I, the, this project is about extending beyond self in all capacity and bringing more people to envision things that I might have not imagined uh, that is around impact and it's about connection and, 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 and that. So, so that's definitely another another um, a part of the the extension of yeah, uh, father father's lullaby. Um, um, are there any like uh, types of artists or uh, anybody that you're thinking of specifically that you would work want to work together with? Or like, okay, I need somebody that's <laughs> like into technology or needs. You, you know. I'll take on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Come join the force. <laughs> um, um, no, I think there is a lot of opportunity. You know, the, the project is centered on audio right. and it's centered on visuals, but also it's not, it's not just art, it's technology, it's intersectionality of different, you know, I would love to have researchers and, and um, you know, anthropologists or like scientists. And uh, so I think it's, the, that's the, the beauty about you know, um, this form of collaborative engagement that all these different perspectives could, could bring a new light into this work and, and could expand the impact uh, through these different minds and bodies and discipline. Uh, so definitely advocacy group, definitely. So there is a wide range that I could just like list for you. Um, uh, but yeah, but I think co collaboration is an essential 
essential instrumental part of it. And I want to like mention this before, and I really kind of come to this um, from that experience that I said I grew up in Iran as a minority mm -hmm. that is persecuted and discriminated by high community in Iran still to this day. But one thing that it was incredible in that space that despite all the challenges, despite the systemic persecution, there was a, such a vibrant community in our home and a collective effort for positive change, for criticality and positive change. And I think I have a, a strong um, belief in, in our collective wisdom and, and bringing people together uh, to envision society and envision and reimagine the future based on this space of love and, and interconnectedness. Um, so a little bit less individuality <laughs> and a yes, little bit more sure. collectively would, would help us in general. Absolutely. Probably. That was a We're uh, done with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rasheen, thank you so, so much. That was an absolutely thank interesting you. and fascinating, fascinating conversation. Thanks for taking the time. And once again, congratulations on winning an award of thank, distinction. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Congratulations to all the voices that participated in this work. So I'm, I'm quite excited for that. Thank you. We are um, heading into another project, but this time it is not um, a, a contribution to um, Ars Electronica. It's actually a partner's project um, called LIT. Uh, basically, um, LIT and Ars Electronica have teamed up for uh, cooperation. Um, the idea behind it is to bring um, university and science work together um, with artists um, to create something that is, of course, scientific, but on the other side also has a creative and artistic component to it. Um, and in this case, the Institute of Process Engineering in Linz teamed up with artist and robot musician Moritz Simon Geist, somebody that has uh, frequently worked with Ars Electronica and does amazing work. Um, for a project and an installation called Sound of Bubbles. And we are now going to take a look into this uh, great piece of work. the installation Sound of Bubbles, do you feel stressed? Rising air bubbles create sounds in water and are forming a soothing and mesmerizing soundscape which is asking the listener to watch, listen and calm down. The sounds are picked up by underwater microphones and amplified. The stress relieving installation makes playful use of the scientific phenomenon known as multiphase systems. Multiphase systems can be found everywhere in our daily lives, like raindrops in the air, dust particles coming from Africa by the winds, or air bubbles rising in water. But we rarely think about the beauty of the interactions and the unpredictable complexity they create. A new digital field means targeted linking of measurements, data and algorithms in order to achieve added value. For example, for a better understanding of the apparatuses and therefore for reduction of, for example, CO2 in the industrial environment. At the same time, the new digital field enables direct links to teaching in which we would like to actively prepare students for the new opportunities in academia as well as industry in the future, which we especially want to develop further together. Therefore, in this project, we created an interdisciplinary team. It was particularly important to me to actively involve chemistry students and at the same time to integrate the aspects of electrical engineering and computer science into the project. In addition, a very good interaction with the artist, Moritz Simon Geist, 
especially with regard to the acoustic implementation as well as different control techniques, brought the project forward on many levels. While the setup keeps the industrial design look, the art has become a major aspect in the project and also led to some interesting discussions and revisions concerning the structure and design of the setup. That was Sound of Bubbles by artist and robot musician Moritz Simon Geist. And we have um, plenty of projects coming up right now that are actually um, all partner projects where Ice Electronica teamed up with some of our um, amazing partner organizations. One of them is called Taste your soil um if you've been on this um channel you've probably heard about taste your soil before that it is a community project um in, comp in cooperation with um a large network of partners and from these partners garden soil samples have been um sent uh, via photo and video and the soil has actually been tasted and we've asked people to describe the, so the taste of the soil um, from the place that they are from. Um, another project that we are going to introduce is called Expert of the Future. Um, it was created um, with Ars Electronica Future Lab and um, it is basically about, um, we asked experts um, what they think the future um, of our planet, of humanity, is going to look like in 25 years. Um, the special thing about these experts, um, by average, they are seven years old. Um, after that, we are going to take a look into another project, um, which is called Journeys and was created in 2020. Of course, last year, Ars Electronica Festival had its difficulties in getting people um, to actually visit Linz because of this pandemic. And one of the projects that was created out of that um, is called Journeys. Um, we gave our partners the opportunity to uh, create video projects and show us their favorite places, their workplaces, the places that they go to when they want to come up with creative ideas. Um, we're going to look into uh, the journey and going to travel to Berlin Garden. Um, yeah, just take a look into our journey from Berlin Garden. This soil tastes like Eastern Berlin like the former GDR. It tastes like industry. But it also tastes a little bit like new technologies and ideas and new design made by students walking on this ground. It actually tastes like gardening and country life, even though we're here on the campus in the middle of Berlin. Amina Bedmarkina, 
Y yo soy de México, tengo siete años y para mí el futuro es que va a venir una gran, gran, gran tormenta. Ok, ahora es el turno de Fernando. Hola, me llamo Fernando, vivo en México y tengo 10 años. Para mí el futuro es de que va a haber muchos edificios, a veces los trenes van a ir más rápido y van a levitar o carros levitadores y ya. Wikipedia tells, Berlin Ostkreuz is a station on the Berlin S-Bahn Suburban Railway and the busiest interchange station in Berlin. Andreas thinks, for many, Berlin is only the part of the city that lies within the Ringbahn. Everything outside this circle of influence more or less doesn't exist or is only known by hearsay. Moritz says, then let's move a little to the east and see what we find beyond this border. Andreas notes, for some of our students, the former dog biscuit factory and now the club Sisyphus is the place to leave their studies behind for a night now and then. Moritz explains, club culture and electronic music is certainly a very important part of the famous Berlin vibe. And I'm pretty sure that it will survive the pandemic-related closure. Andreas remarks, you haven't been to Berlin if you haven't seen this iconic building and heard a concert in one of the recording studios of the Funkhaus Nallepastrasse. Wikipedia knows, when a visitor enters the building's generous foyers with open staircases and representative entrance walls open up to him. The builders succeeded in creating an acoustically perfect building that still attracts musicians and orchestras from all over the world for studio recordings. The studio building is considered the largest contiguous studio complex in the world. Moritz knows, now we have reached the halfway point of our journey and we have to head three more kilometers in the eastern direction to reach our final destination. Wikipedia says, Speedy is a term used especially in East German cities for a kiosk that is open outside normal shop opening hours, often around the clock. Andreas quips, too lazy to remember supermarket opening times? We have Spaties. Moritz raves, I love Spaties. They are an important part of Berlin's cityscape and the ultimate meeting place for people from all walks of life. Wikipedia tells, with almost 14,000 students the HTW Berlin is the largest state university of applied sciences in Berlin and Eastern Germany. There are about 70 study programs in the fields of technology, computer science, business, culture and design. Moritz notes, the campus is very rich in historical heritage. It combines Berlin's industrial history prior to and throughout the GDR with today's idea of a modern university and think tank. Within the communication design program, we work with new media and technologies and address the question how design can face future societal challenges. In our laboratories and workshops, the installation setups are created in iterative development steps from the initial idea to the finished exhibit. Andreas states, communication design is a broad field. My job is to get my students to do things that no one has done before, with technologies that are still unused in design, and to play with the gap between design and art together with them. And did I say the funk house is iconic? Well, then a new term must be invented for this cathedral of industrial culture.
Wikipedia states, the Peter Behrens building was inaugurated in 1917 and was the tallest building in Germany at the time apart from church towers. Moritz says, I am fascinated and impressed by this architecture whenever I come here. Definitely an insider tip in Berlin. Wikipedia explains, the filigree iron truss construction was one of the most important achievements of engineering around 1900. In the last days of the Second World War, SS units blew up the Kaisersteg. The new construction from 2007 shortens the way to the railway station for the students, just as its predecessor did a hundred years ago for the workers of the industrial area. Andreas says, this cafe is part of my university life. My day often starts and ends here. Moritz tells, this beautiful cafe is located in direct neighborhood to our exhibition venue. The foundation writes, the Rheinmeck Hallen are part of a listed building ensemble. For decades, the factory grounds served as a production site for transformers and high voltage equipment. Andreas tells, I lived within sight of these halls for a few years, which were empty and abandoned at the time, and it is fantastic to see how they are now dedicated to promoting art, culture and education. Moritz comments, we are very pleased to have the 900 square meters of the large exhibition hall available to display all of the projects created by students during the pandemic. And we welcome everyone to the Ars Electronica Garden Berlin in September. Welcome back to our Ars Electronica session about artificial intelligence and sound arts. Before we jump into the conversation uh, with um, Cedric Vermont, um, a part of this year's jury in music uh, and sound in this music and sound art category, uh, we are going to see a little snippet of our cyber arts exhibition. Um, it is basically an overview about this year's digital music and sound art pre-projects showcased at Oka Center in Linz. Um, take a look. Welcome to the Cyber Arts Exhibition. The category Digital Music and Sound Art started in 1987 as the category for computer music. This category has changed a lot in keeping up with the digital development. Organescape is a work that tried to recall the tradition of, of uh, organ sounds, uh, focus on the idea of mimesis. So I create for this project uh, a set of compositions called uh, Variations, where I translate field recordings into uh, music for this instrument. And on the other hand, I create an automata with uh, different elements and small bellows that try to imitate uh, bird sounds. So it's like a, a mechanical ornithological study that uh, tried to uh, go the idea of the Baroque organs when they uh, imitate uh, some escapes and include in the stops of the organ this kind of sounds of the environment. A Father's Lullaby is a community co-creative initiative uh, that brings this philosophical question that what is at loss in the absence of love? And it's centered on um, the absence of fathers due to the racial disparities of criminal justice system in the United States and the role of men in raising children in society. One of my main critical inquiries when addressing systemic inequalities is how we need to reimagine A Father's Lullaby is a multi-platform engagement and immersive installations have three different layers of experience. One is the first encounter through this poetic lullabies and memories through multi-channel video and audio installation. The second 
is interactive component that memories of fathers who are incarcerated are activated through your touch. The third layer is a public call for action to everybody to participate by singing lullabies and sharing memories and creating voice for this social justice issue. Convergence, uh, high-end music, stage, theater performance by Alexander Schubert, got the golden Nike of the category Digital Music and Sound Arts this year. It's a performance in which avatars or AI-generated persons interact with the musicians in both kind of a dark stage, an uncanny situation. Peaceful. Convergence features a duet between composer and electronics performer Douglas McCorland and augmented double bassist Alexander Gabris. The project explores interactivity and agency between acoustic and electronic elements and the mediation of gesture and musical materials in three-dimensional space. Using eight microphones, eight transducers, a sensor glove, audio controls and machine learning, these ideas collide in a densely chaotic and gestural work which encourages both performers to push their respective limits and the limits of this complex performance system. This year, there's a new special prize, which kind of memorizes Isao Tomita, a Japanese musician and really a legend. He combined classical music and instruments with electronic devices in a very innovative and interesting way. Abtome by Kayam Alami and Counterpoint got this very first Isao Tomita special prize because it is a very innovative tool for musicians. It's a project and a software system which enable to go beyond the Western canon, especially the notation system of the Western is so binding that not all kind of musical production really fits in. So it's a way to go beyond. Welcome back to today's session about uh, music, sound art, and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we are now heading into a project that uh, eventually won this year's uh, Nika or Nika in um, the category uh, music and sound arts. Um, a project called Convergence by German composer and artist Alexander Schubert. Um, Alexander was supposed to join us right now. Unfortunately, he is stuck in rehearsals right now, so we are not able to talk to him right now, but eventually we are going to show um, the whole piece of work, or a very long version of it, um, by, uh, on the channel. But um, the actual highlight and the good the good news here is that we have somebody else in the studio who is um, uh, part of the jury, so somebody that actually knows a lot uh, about this work, and he's an amazing artist, um, drummer, DJ, um, has a lot of skills himself. Um, Cedric for months is with us. Hi. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Fine, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we want to talk about um, the winning project of this year, um, titled Convergence. I've um, tried to understand it. It is pretty complex. Um, maybe you want to give it a try and just break <laughs> it down into simple terms. What is it about and what made it so special that um, you, the jury, said this is uh, a Nika winner? All right. Um Prior warning, <laughs> I, must, uh, I did, not, did not fully understand the, the complexity of the, I mean, the way it works, this AI and so on, because I'm not a programmer. Right. Nevertheless, um, so this is an AI that is fed with 
uh, the voices of the musicians and uh, singers, uh, the performers, and um, this AI is creating avatars of uh, the, the performers, and there is an inter interaction between the performers and uh, the AI. Um, so um, they are facing a, a kind of uh, alter ego, <laughs> mm -hmm. and there is a, this interaction. But it has been a long process, uh, meaning that they needed a lot of sessions to feed, to, to uh, uh, allow the AI okay. to, to be fed mm -hmm. and to learn. And so there was an, an editing uh, in the end because uh, it was not possible to use all the, the sessions, I mean, to make a piece that would last probably <laughs> hours or day, I don't know. And uh, the result to me is uh, it's kind of really fascinating. Um, but I, I, I wonder how much impulse from the programmer there is in, in, into this uh, right. project, because an AI is never completely neutral, or not at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so that answer I can give, of course, I cannot give, of course, mm -hmm. I just wonder. That is something that we would have uh, <laughs> loved to know from Alexander himself. Yes, uh, indeed. But what you have mentioned is that, obviously, the, um, the project is um, very personalized. So the artist that um, is scanned by this artificial intelligence, um, it only works with certain artists, am I correct? Like with artists that the system already knows? No, because uh, as far as I understood, they started from scratch. So they are to okay. scan one artist mm -hmm. uh, at a time. So recognizing the face and, and the voice, the screams, um, the instrumentation and so on. Uh, later on, on the video, you can see uh, an interaction basically between um, the intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> I don't like to use that word because that they're not that intelligent. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, uh, um, so this trained uh, software and uh, the musicians. Um, but we found the composition really, um, emotionally speaking, really brilliant, mm -hmm. really powerful. Uh, to me, it raises also um, lots of questions, basically. Our interaction That's with right. uh, computer, computer science, and how far can, can we go. And what I found interesting is also um, the way things blend in, in, in the video, in the music, the faces that are uh, starting from uh, the face of one musician and uh, merging into another musician. Um, so there is a kind of maybe creepy side of it because of this, because of the screams as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, the charge of emotion is, is really, really mm -hmm. strong. It, mm -hmm. it, and I find it very beautiful as well. And it appears to me that that was um, by intention, this creepy component to it. Um, because of course, um, I can only imagine your uh, jury meetings and conversations that you had about the about the project, but um, I'm sure the musical and technical component was only one, um, one of the aspects that you took into consideration. On the other side, there is what are the ideas behind it? What is the message that it actually sends? Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What do you think? What is the eventual message of this project? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very tricky question. Because I'm not the composer, I right. can't really answer. What, how did you feel about it? Oh, uh, for me it was, well, I suppose, about the relationship, our relationship to technology and a certain future of music, one of the many possible futures of music. It's interesting to see that um, we are not stuck into some uh, composition forms, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think that, well, I studied electroacoustic music and I think that a, a portion of the electroacoustic music scene is a bit stuck somewhere. Hmm. <laughs> and when I see such project, I think I'll oh, finally something different, something new. Um, and uh, the result is a kind of uh, uh, 
collaboration in the end between these uh, AI and, and, and the composers, the composer, the musicians. Um, the music, of course, at a personal level, I can't speak about the other members of the jury, was very important. Because above all, I'm a musician and composer, so yeah. I always listen. So the, the first step for me is this. And I'm very picky when we speak about audio-visual compositions, mm -hmm. because to me, visuals are often um, um, distracting. Mm -hmm. But in that case, uh, they We're need to be there. The project. Yeah, they, they have to be there to, to help us to to comprehend a bit more uh, what what's going, going on, on, basically. Because in the end, if, if you only have an, an audio piece that is partly composed by an AI, uh, that is not that impressive. And you might maybe not suspect that there is an AI uh, behind it. While here, you, you see the, the whole process. You have this AI uh, telling the musicians to do things that they do. and this intelligence is scanning them, recording them, and uh, I suppose analyzing this. And the whole process was very interesting, I think, because it's not only about the, the result itself, the, the, the music piece itself, it's, it's the whole, or almost the whole process. We didn't see the programming, mm -hmm. but it starts from the, the scanning, this right. AI, this voice, uh, this uh, computer voice telling mm -hmm. them to do something. And I found it interesting that um, you have an AI giving orders to humans. <laughs> even, even if we know it's, it's staged, of course, but uh, right. it makes us uh, think, okay, is it going to happen one day that we will obby or listen to uh, advices or orders of an AI? Um, yeah, that's an absolutely interesting, fascinating aspect. As I had that with a couple of, of pieces of work, especially in your category, where um, it's not really the end result that is the artwork, but the actual process of it um, being created is the actual art. Um, but let's talk about the. Pro I mean, you've been. I think you've been uh, in this competition as an uh, artist yourself, as somebody contributing and now you're um, part of the jury. <laughs> um, how different is that experience and what was it like to, was it um, easy and c uh, clear to you that, okay, this is the winner of this year or was it a tough decision? Mm. <laughs> that was a bit tough. I, I must say that it, were, it was outstanding for me from, from the beginning. This yeah. one and, and a few other ones I thought, okay, that is interesting for this and that reason, this one also. Um, of course, it was not easy because there were so many projects for the sound art uh, category this year. Yeah. And I suppose it's uh, partly due to the pandemic. <laughs> um, so artists had the time to create projects that um, would be considered here. This plus I, I think uh, th there were really a lot of projects for, for this uh, category. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as a composer, as a musician, you often can play alone with a computer, why when you do um, like this uh, 3D printing art and uh, uh, gigantic installations and so on, uh, you, you need have a to team, go outside, you, you need to go outside mm -hmm. to, to go to a, a factory, whatever, and it was very difficult. Absolutely. Um, so I guess this is one of the reasons why there were so many projects. So we had to, to analyze uh, and listen and, and check all those uh, compositions and there was a large variety of them, and that made it very interesting and difficult as well, because you, you had these kinds of uh, compositions dealing with AIs and uh, electronic technology and so on, like uh, super avant-garde or something, right. while you had a few other compositions that were way more um, simple mm -hmm. and eventually using old technologies or uh, recycling uh, objects uh, and I found that very interesting because in the end even though um, we are dealing right now with all these AI topic for Absolutely. quite a few years uh, I think other ways of composition other ways of uh, dealing with 
technology should not be uh, omitted as well because they are older, because they, they, they use uh, recycled material and so on, which is also very important to me, the, the, the fact that a composer thought, OK, I'm going to um, make a piece with, uh, which is dealing with uh, our extreme consumption of, of gears, and I'm going to recycle mm -hmm. uh, the tools I'm going to use for so the even composition. If it's about music and composition, it's still about sustainability and not just leaving things behind and leaving yes, them in the past, exactly. but also taking them with you. Yeah. And uh, what we noticed uh, this year is that there were quite a few compositions that were social, political, or dealing with the environment, with uh, the mess we are doing right now. Right. Um, and I think it's uh, more and more obvious that artists are, uh, want to, 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 to share a message, uh, which was not always the case, I would right. say. That's what I want to say. I mean, you've been an artist, a musician yourself for the past last 30 years, I think. Um, so was it like a time when, as a composer, as a musician, it was kind of a, a contextless, just creating music for the sake of it, and now it's becoming more political and social and um, more um, loaded with topics like that? I like both, in fact. I think it should not be a necessity to carry a message. But I find it sad when no one carries a message. <laughs> and I think in certain categories, like electroacoustic music and music concrete and so on, uh, until I think the late 1990s, maybe a bit later, uh, it was very rarely political, but more into abstract abstraction mm -hmm. and uh, cinema for the ears and uh, a bit the art for the sake of of art, right. which is fine with me as well. I'm not right. against it, but um, I find it very important also to, to, to try to share a message, um, especially nowadays. And I'm happy to see that so many composers uh, did it this year also, and not necessarily dealing directly with the pandemic. There were many other topics like uh, Father's uh, Lullaby, for example. Exactly. Um, and. Uh, Maybe it, it renders this music a bit more uh, human for some people uh, because it's obvious to me that some, some people would dive more easily into such music if there is a message behind it. You're talking about like more avant-garde music, less popular, uh, with less popular appeal? Or <laughs> is that what you, yeah, what you I, mean I, by that? I, I'm afraid it is the case, <laughs> you know? But, but if, if you reshape it with, with, with the message, some people may... Uh, not especially focused directly on the music at the first uh, sight, but uh, listen to the message and then maybe swallow <laughs> the pill, uh, accept the music in, a, in, a, in an easier way. I think we, we can see that with the, with the cinema industry, basically. You, you can see some films contain music that most people would not listen home, but it's in the film and it's fine. And it makes, the them, it makes it enjoyable for yeah. them, actually. I, I guess that's like one aspect where people will check out music that is not like a three-minute song or like the classical structure and still enjoy it. Sure. <laughs> um, let's talk about, because we still have uh, a little bit of time left, and one, while we have you here, it would be um, a waste to not talk about <laughs> your project and, and your projects and your music. Um, what have you been up to? <laughs> and what are you planning to do, like, currently? All right. Um, so in, in the past uh, year and a half, well, during all these uh, pandemic mess, <laughs> um, I've been working a lot on uh, my ongoing research about electronic and experimental electroacoustic music in Africa and Asia, mostly tiny bit other parts of the world, like Eastern Europe and Latin America, but much less. Uh, um, um, publishing new CDs, uh, not only my own CDs, but also, also artists from uh, Sri Lanka, from Iran, from uh, various places. <laughs> um, and uh, writing, I'm, I'm currently writing a lot about uh, what I saw, what I experienced, what I know about um, Africa and mm -hmm. uh, electronic music in general. 
But this time, I'm not only dealing with the so-called academic world, uh, but also more popular music. So that means that I, I speak about electroacoustic music or noise music, but I speak about um, local genre, mm -hmm. uh, genres that, that, uh, that exist in countries like Tanzania, like the Singeli or um, uh, Kom in South Africa and Kuduro in Angola and so on. And I try to understand what's going on, who does what since when, uh, what are the influences? Uh, do they influence also uh, themselves, um, other countries or, or here, Europe, and so on? Um, so I'm reading a lot and writing a lot <laughs> and composing also. And related to Africa, if, if everything works fine this mm -hmm. year, um, there should be a festival in uh, Sweden called Geiger. Okay. Uh, so that, that happens normally in um, Gothenburg. But it might be mostly in Gothenburg and a bit in Stockholm uh, next year in, okay. in April. Uh, so with artists from uh, Africa or uh, the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been invited to curate uh, this part of the festival. There might be uh, talks and conversations and uh, music, of course. Uh, but a, a very large um, panel of <laughs> music, which is amazing, from uh, beat-oriented music, bass music, whatever, to more uh, electroacoustic and uh, ambient and so on. Uh, well, I think if I summarize I mean, that it, that is a <laughs> lot. I mean, I don't even know where to where to um, pick pick up at that point. Um, yeah, but let's talk about. Um, you mentioned that you're um, pretty fascinated with electronic music and the various um, also popular but sub genres that are. Um, currently emerging out of Africa. Um, you mentioned so many places. Which ones are like the ones that you are currently most excited about? <laughs> I wish everywhere, but uh, I would say Uganda. It sounds maybe like a cliche because there is this uh, Niege Niege tape um, label and festival that are really exploding right now. But it's a true fact. There is so much happening there and they do an amazing job. They are not the only ones. There are other labels. Uh, and people active there, uh, such as East African Records also. Um, so they mostly deal with um, so-called electronic dance music, whatever it means. It can be singular, it, it can be... It's such a broad term, right? Yeah, it can be industrial hip-hop, but they, they have also some more experimental stuff. And the festival is very open-minded also, even to um, electroacoustic music, for example. Um, I find it fascinating as a place uh, because it's a difficult country, Uganda, at many levels. The circumstances mm. are... Yeah. But, but difficult cir circumstances have always created amazing music at the same time. This is true. This is absolutely true. What I found interesting there is the, the solidarity because it's a very poor country mm. and uh, some of the musicians I met uh, can't afford to, to buy gears, to, to have a computer and so on. But many of them have access to a studio, to a friend's place, and uh, they, they are provide, being provided time to record and collaborate. So it's, it's, um, it's interesting to see those uh, structures uh, that we don't see everywhere, this, this kind of uh, support. And it's also a crossroad. So you have a lot of uh, musicians and composers from uh, the DRC, uh, from, uh, uh, from Kenya, from Tanzania, from South Sudan, and so on and so forth, also from Ethiopia, who lived there partly or permanently, and who compose, who sing. Um, so it's very rich, in fact. It's, this, this migration is, is very interesting to see. Um, maybe before we, before we wrap it up, um, this uh, festival that you talked about in Sweden sounds absolutely um, interesting as well. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the background of that? Um, I guess it's pretty difficult to bring um, African music or people from the continent to Europe currently, um, but you, you think you, can, you would be able to make it happen? Yeah, well, I'm not the one putting the money on, on the table. <laughs> no, the, the thing is that they, they are um, dealing with uh, institutions as well. It's, it's mm -hmm. not uh, entirely, uh, a, 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 it's not a small private festival. So they are talking with authorities to, to manage to get visas and uh, planes. Some of the artists live here in Europe. Uh, they are from the diaspora. 
uh, we haven't made a full list yet, and we need to, to think about also the restrictions. If in April the situation has not improved so much, uh, it's going to be harder for sure. But nothing is impossible, I think. <laughs> and uh, we can see that r right now there are people from um, the Niege Niege team who are touring Europe, like uh, Duma, this uh, duo from uh, Kenya. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that proves that it's possible to bring people here. Um, so I'm confident it's going to, to, to happen. The festival is not new. Um, it's a festival that, that juggles between academic music and uh, independent music, uh, from noise to uh, modern classical or things uh, blending both. The intersection <laughs> of it. Yeah. Um, they have talks as well, so it's not the first time they organize something. So um, I know uh, they, they will do a good job for sure. <laughs> Amazing. Um, one last um, topic or question that I want to bring up um, is um, your your approach to music in in combination with activism, and your your views on that. Because you already mentioned things seem to become more um, socially politically. Um, loaded, um, do you think that that's a, a necessity? Or for you personally, when you create music, mm. is it something that you want to combine? Often, yeah. It, as I told, it's not systematic with me. I, I like also really sound and abstraction, and I, I like to experiment like this and giving no, no special message. But uh, on the other hand, I, I want to share also some of my views of the world. But also, uh, as an activist, so to speak, I also try to uh, raise awareness about situations that, or problems that, that touch me a lot. So I publish um, uh, compilations to, to, to raise money, to, to help um, people, groups of people, whatever, um, in some parts of the world for a reason or another. So I've done one um, after the uh, explosion in Beirut, for example, because I have a band in Beirut and I've been there so many times and when I saw what happened and also knowing how problematic this place is, I mean, regarding the corruption and so on, I knew, <coughs> sorry, that it would be very hard for musicians there and people in general so I, I, within 24 hours, I, I wrote everywhere I could, and people sent me tracks, and we managed to get a, a, a lot of money, more than 2,000 uh, euros. I did this for Myanmar also, um, because I've also been there, had an amazing experience. and um, It's also beautiful to see that um, level of solidarity. Yeah, right. it, it is. It, for me, it's amazing also to see that people from all over the place send me trucks, even people from Uganda, for example, who have to deal with their own problems also. Uh, so for me, it's important. It's not a direct message that I'm providing when I do this, but yeah. Beautiful. Um, well, to come back to the beginning of our conversation, we are now going to take a look into the winning project of uh, this year's uh, music and uh, sound art category, the Golden Nika that went to uh, Convergence uh, by Alexander Schubert. Um, this is actually the end of our session. Thank you for tuning in um, and stay tuned. We have two more sessions coming up, including a keynote conversation with Amy Whitaker and Gerfried Stocker. My name is Tori Reichel. Thank you so much for tuning in. And now, um, finally, the Golden Nika winner project, Convergence by Alexander Schubert. This setting is called retrograde dissociation. In this setting, you will be captured as good as possible. Turned into a set of descriptive parameters. These parameters will change. Dissolve from you. Regress. Reshape. You will stare into the mirror too long. 
You will tell me what you see in these representations. What you find in them. What you lost in them. And what you dream in them. In the first section, your facial features will be scanned. Head center. Turn head to the left. Introduce variation to your position. Turn head to the right. Head center. Vary your position. Smile. Showing first and left. I know, it does not look like much. Yet. The more we scan, the deeper the result. In the next sections, we will iterate through this process over and over again. Improving step by step. Now, your playing movements will be scanned. Enter playing position. Move the bow to the instrument. Stroke up. Stroke down. Left hand glissando. Change direction. Stop. Basic auto. Bow in the air. Smile. Showing first and left. Now I move your arm. Release facial expression.
Enter stage. Enter playing position. Pizzicato. Turn head to the left. Stroke down. Enter. Repeat. Stroke down. Confused. Left hand glissando. Entering. Repeat. Left hand glissando. Hand center. Stroke. Change direction. Stop. Physical. Enter. Repeat. Enter. Turn head to the right. Echo. Surprised. Variation. Angry. Scream. Repeat. Synthesize. Repeat. Synthesize. Close your eyes. And sing. Synthesize. Repeat. Synthesize. Every sound I create now is based on your input. Every image I show is derived from you. This is how I see and hear you. Two, three, four, 
zooming in and entering. Listen to me now. I want to ask you a few questions. How do we differentiate if it is a hallucination, a dream, or the clean perception? All perception is constructive. No representation is absolute. Everything is encoded and decoded. We are parametric. Everything parametric can be altered parameter by parameter. That is the definition of such a model. See these sliders, these values, these adjustment dials, but they can move into our consciousness through illness, through hallucination, through drugs, through psychotic states. through computation processes, like in this case. We then see the constructive aspect of it, that everything we do is based on encoding and decoding. When we look at a partner, we can create a loop, a perception and adjustment loop. We can exponentiate that process by looking into a mirror. 
This is what we will do now. Recursive loops. You and me. Regression worlds. Segregation worlds. Adaptive coils. A semi-transparent foil. Speak softly to me. Read this poem to me as a speech sample to learn. A screen. A screen. A mirror. A mirror. An opened window. An opened window. Awaiting eyes. Awaiting eyes. Hoping. Dreaming. A face. Dissolving. An editor window. An anti-framed mirror. Breaking into splinters. And corrupted files. Try to imitate me. As I imitate you. Zooming in. Entering. Magnifying. Unlocking. Opening up. I'm letting go. Who do you see in this image? My dead father. Which aspects of your childhood are in there? A fever dream with a flashing light at night. Which parts will you exclude? The shameful memories. There is something growing inside you. Yes. You are not a solid self? Yes. There is something growing inside you. Yes. You are not a solid self. Yes. The trash I leave behind. Pride and vanity. Boundaries dissolving. The distancing. Further. 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 These are your ancestors. These are my lovers. Do you remember when you looked in the mirror too long? And you lost contact with who you are? Further. 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 
Until I start laughing. Until I start laughing. Further. 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 I don't know more than you do. I'm also just a mirror of you. As I provide a mirror for you. In a loop, we can try to turn the opacity of our perception into opaque variations. Like a brain lesion. A mesmerizing distortion. As in a sleep deprived state. Drifting off into a half word of a dreamlike morphed reality where we see that other representations of us are possible, that our self is fluid, fragile, constructed, and diverse, post human, like a genetic defect, beautifully disturbed. Genetically enhanced. Adjusted. In a recursive loop, I encode and decode myself in an eternal loop. Exaggerating every feature, like a facial distortion. Like an unsupervised inbreed, out of control. Go to sleep, child. Dream off now. Saturate with closed eyes. Dreaming of a future and an optimized tomorrow. Hand in hand, sliders adjusted. The night sky setting. As the values adjust. Peaceful. Invisible. A clear view of the night. Through a transparent interface. Always on. Always present. And. Always. 
loving. Hi, welcome. You're watching the Ars Electronica channel live here from the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, Austria. It is Sunday, the last day of the festival. My God, time flies when you're getting a lot of interesting and challenging inputs. Today is all about art thinking and that's exactly what this session is going to be about. We are going to look into the future of humanity and I'm also going to have some very interesting guests that I'm looking forward to. I'm going to welcome Gerfried Stocker together with Joseph Paradiso from the MIT. We're going to talk about uh, space, also about virtual worlds and about electronic music. All of these are search interests of Joseph Paradiso. And later on, my colleague Alex Veron is going to take over and he's also going to have some interesting guests. Gefried Stocker is going to stay here and talk to Amy Whitaker, who's researching the friction between art and business. So, art thinking, that term describes an attitude an angle to gain new perspectives. It's about the question how we can apply art to create a, an actual better future society. There's already the term design thinking, which is about uh, how to find creative solutions. And in contrast to that, art thinking is searching for creative questions because curiosity is the key for finding new perspectives for broadening your horizon that's what artists have always known the power of questions so artists have always been able to detect social and also technological trends that don't even have a name yet and give them a tangible form so that we can get a grip on them that we can grasp them and art also holds the power to scrutinize existing beliefs to cast doubt on common beliefs and that's how we learn to think outside of the box art thinking is what we're going to dive into in this session but before that we're going to have a look at two more of the gardens from all around around the world which are part of the Ars Electronica festival with a lot of partners and interesting projects the two gardens that we are about to see here now are first of all in St. Petersburg and after that we are going to Chicago so enjoy this peek into these gardens.
global environmental problems require revision of the relationship between human and nature. In our project, we propose the concept of grounding, where soil will become the ground for building new scenarios for the future. We turn to the figure of Russian scientist Vasily Dekuchayev and his soil paradigm, which states that soils are not some mechanical, lifeless mixtures, but, on the contrary, are independent, natural historical bodies similar to living organisms. This paradigm goes beyond soil science and expands on a large scale of life. Vladimir Vodnatsky extends Rikuchayev's ideas to the level of biosphere and noosphere that unites natural and technological into symbiotic wholeness. The significance and uniqueness of soils formed the basis of the collection of the Dekuchayev Soil Science Museum in St. Petersburg. Grounding project is a collaboration between Art and Science Center of Atmo University and the Dekuchayev Museum. These scientific institutions, which are closely situated together on the Vasilevsky island of St. Petersburg, constitute a fertile ground for art and science dialogue. The museum offers frozen time with evidence of past soil processes but it forms a distance between humans and soil. Our exhibition attempts to reduce this distance. Objects of technological art in a natural science museum will create a space for interweaving of analog and digital mediums. As you were reading this, you were being hit with radiation from black holes, solar flare sticks, and red meat, cheap glow sticks from Amazon. Hi, my name is Mariana Mejia, and I am the curator of the ATS Chicago Garden of the Ars Electronica Festival 2021. This year's theme is an invitation to reflect on the close relationship we have developed with the digital world and how we are dealing with it. The Chicago Garden will present work of the ATS community through a series of online and in-person events. These programs engaged in a multidisciplinary dialogue to reflect critically on our faculty to take action in the digital world and claim our right to participate in shaping the world we want for our future. And you can find all of them and stroll through them online on ars.electronica.org. Art. And now to the future of humanity. What will life look like in 20 years time? What challenges are we going to have to face? What technological possibilities will be, will be available? That's what four experts from different fields have been discussing. And their discussion has been integrated into a short movie about a fictitious character called Indigo going through an everyday, uh, an ordinary day in the year 2041. So the experts are the designer and artist Gyeongjin Jong from Korea, the key researcher Ali Nikram from Ars Electronica's Future Lab, the Lebanese-Syrian feminist and human rights activist uh, and education okay. human right education advisor Farah Salka, and the artist Simon Weckert from Berlin, who got a lot of media attention last year for tricking Google Maps with 99 smartphones. So here they are discussing future humanity. What would our day look like in 20 years? In this project, we invite four experts from diverse backgrounds to discuss the future of humanity. The discussion ranges from global scale issues to subtle daily joy, which is integrated into a short film that shows an imaginary day in 2041. 2041, a day on an island. In this scenario, our persona, which is called Indigo, around 30 years old, lives in a world where people suffer under heavy climate change conditions. In this time, a foundation 
will be created by the biggest companies to start some kind of residency program for people to give them a break from their everyday life problems. Those companies realize that they need to invest in their consumers and need creative minds to tackle problems in the world. The foundation picked Indigo and a group of people and offered them to stay on a so-called island where they can live and rest for a period of time without earning money or paying for healthcare services, etc. This program or this experiment is running for a period of time with a start and an end date with the idea to develop knowledge and understanding worldwide society. It's another spring Saturday in 2041. Well, it's supposedly spring now on this island, but the concept of four different weathers is sort of a thing of the past now. All weathers are overlapping with no clear beginning and end. Indigo's favorite weather used to be spring, and for that she's hopeful and excited to catch as much as she can get of it this year around. Indigo, who suffers from insomnia, is awake at 3 a.m. She can't sleep well. She has two pets, a nine-year-old animal pet and a one-year-old robot pet. Her robot pet Ruby came to her to sleep together. And Ruby is measuring the body activities like body temperature, heartbeat or blood pressure while Indigo sleeps. And this kind of health data is sent from Ruby to Indigo's doctor. Now an email arrives asking to reschedule an appointment. The personalized AI system answers the email with a 99% confidence level. She wakes up from her tired sleep, checks her notifications early on in the day, as she automatically does always. Her stress levels rise considerably. Too much information. It's been a very fairly overwhelming week for her so far. Reading the daily news is the next activity. Even the news of well-known newspapers is written by bots now. The most important events are personalized and summarized for each reader. People no longer get the same news as a consequence. The system knows exactly what is important to the target reader, and it also knows how to phrase the messages in a way that the target person likes them and takes the time to read or to listen to them. Generally speaking, uh, we can say that searching for relevant information and data in a massive amount of available information that also can have different levels of accuracy is a major challenge in this time. Indigo has some special interests into human and digital rights and this is also part of her personalized newspaper. It is the weekend and Indigo is on a constant hunt for anything that will bring her happiness, joy, comfort, soothing feelings throughout her journey, but also a sense of temporary pause from the incredible pace of weekdays. She needs some alone time to maintain her sanity and well-being. She does a bit of exercising around the house, jogging and swimming. She has a breathing class that she does every Saturday morning that gives her a relaxing and much needed vibe. At 9 a.m., Indigo has breakfast while having a virtual hangout with her 85-year-old grandma. She is always worried about her grandmother's physical condition. Unfortunately, Indigo's parents had died during the COVID-19 pandemic, and she's been ever loyal and caring as a granddaughter since then. She had a conversation about wanting to go to the moon with her grandma. Still, she doesn't want to go to the moon, but the fact that others in her community have been doing it is significant, and this potential trip has been on her mind all the time. It's now time for Indigo's weekly volunteer play session at the Children's Cancer Center. As a two-time brave young cancer survivor, Indigo rarely skips this, and these visits mean the world to her. It's the best coping mechanism and doubles as a way to give back. Her intervention talk with the cancer survivor group has been delayed to the weekend after, so that's relieving for her for this weekend. For the playtime with children, she always takes interactive videos of her pets to entertain the kids she plays with. She notices her dog is not looking so great on the video and is suddenly very anxious about it. He's nine years old already. 
She leaves at 2.30 p.m. to head back home from the center, and on her way, she orders a sleep vet support from her pet app collection, whichever one has the fastest availability. At 4 p.m., her calendar notifies her that she has a doctor appointment, and this appointment with the doctor takes place virtually, and that's possible because the doctor already got her health data by Ruby in the morning. And based on this data, the doctor can decide or work on the best uh, PRP for Indigo. At 6 p.m., she has gotten stress which causes insomnia. Thanks to her residence program, she has excellent health care insurance. Although Indigo doesn't have a partner, she wants to raise a child. And because she doesn't want to give birth, her baby is now in the first month of pregnancy with an artificial womb in a web tree. In the world where Indigo lives, usually um, the people are self-insured, so that means they need to pay for their work, health or travel insurance, but this time um, the foundation of the island will pay her insurance. After all these events, she decides to listen to some music. However, the music of the future will not be delivered in pieces as we know it today, but mainly in the form of flexible musical spaces. That is, uh, when a user plays a musical space, it continuously generates new music with specific musical qualities and structures. Users can listen to the music endlessly, which is always similar but never the same. When they switch to another generative musical space, the system generates the music in a different but well-defined and expected way. It's as we could play the same piece over and over again, but the piece is never the same. Many artists have adapted to this new creative concept already. They no longer think in terms of pieces, but in terms of spaces. They generate and sell their own musical spaces. At 9 p.m., she ate her dinner at the county kitchen and shared her experience in the Children's Cancer Center, where she works as a volunteer with friends. At the community kitchen, she meets people um, from social political activism groups for digital and human rights and in that time she gets an invitation for a hybrid birthday party which takes place virtually and physically where two or more groups of people coming together in a hybrid environment and for her it's it's fun and new as, and especially to her date who is intrigued and curious with what she is introducing them to. But unfortunately, in the time she gets a notification by her AI calendar that she will miss um, the coding class, which she set for Sunday to enhance her coding skills. Indigo is super excited about her Sunday evening plans of graffiti with her friends, weather permitting of course, as part of the community group she's in that wants to preserve the art of street graffiti on a wide range spectrum of feminist issues. Uh, she takes the overnight train to the capital to head to tomorrow's monthly retreat plans with friends and feminist community. It's been a great weekend so far. This was only one possible scenario and schedule of our imaginary person. In general, there is not much difference between the hours of the day in terms of activities. The activities remain very similar because everything can be done almost at any time. Maybe it is similar to the time before the electric lamp was invented compared, uh, compared to our time. Back then, you had to divide the day very precisely because of the daily light. Today we can do many things that we did uh, 100 years ago during the day, uh, also at night of course. In the future, we can do even more stuff at any time of the day because most of the activities are virtual anyway.
So now I welcome with me here in our studio, Joseph Paradiso. I'm very happy to have you here. Thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. Joseph Paradiso uh, directs the MIT Media Lab's uh, Responsive Environment Group, which uh, is researching new sensor technologies for interfaces on the one hand, but also for spaces which enable a new interactive experience. Um, something you've been working on, so various fields, some of them are, for example, uh, spacecraft control systems or also electronic music uh, instruments. Currently he's also associate professor for uh, of media arts and sciences at the MIT and I'm really looking forward to talk being able to talk to you now about some of the many things you're interested I'm in. I'm delighted uh, happy to fit in as much as we have time for. <laughs> so let's start in space sure. uh, on the moon so your research group has started several space-based uh, projects over the years and for example one of them is a sensor net slated to be possibly deployed on the moon uh, over the next couple of years. Can you tell us more about this project? Sure. It's something that, that, that actually I'm particularly uh, taken by and occupied by now in my group. It's, it's just such a great opportunity. Um, space is a different game now. There are more players involved. Uh, it's uh, very easy to, uh, relatively easy to get things up into uh, Certainly, zero gravity into suborbital flights. We've done many of those. We have payloads on the space station. We've done lots of them. But now the moon is opening up because uh, there are lots of missions slated to go to the moon. Some of them are commercial. Um, some of them have landers that do have available space. And MIT, I believe, is securing space on at least one of them, if not more. So this won't be necessarily one trip to the moon. It could be many trips to the moon. And uh, we've done a lot of sensor nets for monitoring environments. Uh, I've, I've even exhibited some of that stuff here at Ars Electronica doing artistic mappings on top of the sensor data. Um, so we're good at making sensor nets. Uh, one of my students who was recently joined the group from the AMS experiment at CERN actually was very interested in uh, uh, doing space-based projects and we converged around the sensor net for the moon. So we've designed one. It was part of his master's thesis. It's a very small. You know, We'll have some solar power capability. can last for a while. It can host a bunch of sensors. Um, we're talking to some of our colleagues at CERN actually now too uh, about little radiation sensors we can put inside. That's one of the interesting things you want to measure on the lunar surface over time. Uh, a few other things we can try to do. And uh, we've got a decent shot at getting it on that rover. So we've got to work really fast. Uh, the design's got to be more or less set within six months or so, maybe even faster. But uh, we already have the baseline design finished. So I think it's, it's refining it, finishing off the sensor payload. But yeah, at this point, you, the moon is not so far away. It looks different to me. When I look at the moon now, it doesn't feel like it's that far. And what makes the moon such an interesting subject of research? Oh, it's, it's certainly close. So we can start doing things on the moon more rapidly and quickly mm -hmm. and trying things out. Um, so yeah, people will go there and, and will, will perhaps even live. They can live anywhere in space. The moon is the place probably where they'll live at this point, at least uh, some sort of a colony because it's accessible. Not a great place to live. We can talk a bit about the feasibility of space colonies. It's really complicated. But uh, going to the moon is, is intriguing just because we can try things there. And also scientifically, okay, you look at the, the old universe, you know, you got to look at, at how things came together, where the moon came from, have some idea. We can get better ideas by making measurements. Water is a big issue on the moon. It's there. Can we find it? What is it like? Uh, so we can start to scrabble at bits of that, but just the fact that we can get there and try things, it's an opportunity. And uh, while we were talking, we were joined <laughs> by Gavrin Stocker. Good to have you here now as well. Uh, hello. Yeah, Normally we'd have an excited hello. We're on TV, <laughs> though, so we can't. <laughs> Gerfie, <laughs> such, he's such an old friend. It's so good to see you, Gerfie. Yes, thank you so much for coming, and sorry for sneaking in here late. There are so many things still going on, and people try to talk and present. That's and the festival life. Yes, yeah. that's what it really makes exciting. Yeah, I, I've walked through the festival with you before. I, I know what it's like. 
And it's even more so a real asset chronic when you're here to participate. Oh, it this is. is really, and we, uh, you probably were already talking about mainly the scientist, Joe Paradiso? Well, a little or bit. Already it, uh, about the musician. No, that I'm, I'm yeah, happy to talk been, about that, that too. That. <laughs> you know that part very well. But we've already uh, went to the moon by now. So, uh, and you've been explaining to me that uh, the interesting thing is that the moon is so close, so it might be something of a space laboratory yes. for, for space science. Yes, exactly. It's so going to become so accessible that we can try things, including our projects. I'm sure you're thinking about it, too, because there are payloads that we can all become part of now that are going there. So artists can start to think. And even these sensors we're putting on, you know, we're, we do a lot of work with artistic interpretation of sensor data. We've shown a lot of that here at Ars Electronica. Uh, we'll make music out of those sensors. <laughs> It'll drive some model with virtual reality visuals. We'll, we'll do something. What other things apart from radiation are going to be measured by the sensors on the, on, on the moon? Um, uh, at this point, we looked at trying to find water maybe with ground penetrating radar or uh, capacitive measurements. You really want to go deep. So we see if we're going to get a, a GPR like the Chinese have put in. Uh, there's one coming out of uh, Haystack, uh, Haystack Observatory at MIT that, that, that might fit into this payload. We'll look. Um, seismics, if possible, with an accelerometer. You can start measuring you know, some level of seismics with small accelerometers. To really do it, you need a bigger one. But we can start doing maybe some things. Um, those will be some of the main things. Temperature, of course, how it varies according to the day and the pole. But if we can have a chance to look for water, uh, with a GPR, that'd be that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the holy grails. You mentioned that some of uh, the work, your space-related work, has already been uh, exhibited at our Electronica Festival. So, Gaffrey, maybe you can uh, tell us more about some of the projects that we've already seen at the festival or at festivals. Well, how many hours do we have? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, the joint history of our Electronica and Joe goes back. Yeah, we go with really a very actually, far. I first heard about our Electronica. It was in the mid late eighties because uh, Comrade Schnitzler was here with his megaphone, right? And I was a real fan. I'm a fan of prog rock, electronic music, prog rock, all of that. And, and that, that caught me. <laughs> I had to come. When I heard about that, I had to come. Great. I, I still remember, I think, also a very early project where you had uh, this dancer musician yep. Uh, yep. wearing your special shoes. I mean, nowadays we see so many of these projects of students exploring, yeah. or also artists exploring uh, uh, sensors uh, to, to sense mo body motion and create music and, and dance. What actually were the motivations in these early years, and we are talking about the 90s here, uh, where you already explored this on a, on a very high level? That's why I came to the Media Lab back then. So uh, uh, I was doing a lot of sensors for other things, spacecraft and stuff like that back in those days. Yes, you were in Zurich also. Yeah, I was in Zurich at ETH. ETH. I don't know if you talked already about no, this no. Scientific, uh, European uh, scientific yeah. history. Yeah, I was four years in Europe working with CERN. Then I came back twice for summers working with uh, Large Hadron Collider. Yeah. So uh, I did a lot of high energy physics and I love CERN. We've talked a lot about CERN uh, during the, the heyday. And I'm so glad that CERN got, got closer to you guys too. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was doing that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> repeat your question, Gerfried. <laughs> no, it was, the, uh, in particular, the, the kind of motivation oh, to... the shoes. It, it, I mean, not, not only the shoes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, being, uh, how should we say, serious scientist at CERN and yeah. doing well. particle physics and then uh, coming into this field this, where this you... There's the other yeah. side of my life, which you know. Yeah. I've been building synthesizers <laughs> since, yeah, since I was uh, in, uh, in college, actually. I, I wanted always a large modular, which was the big thing to have back then. I could never afford it, so I had to figure out how to build it, and I did. Um, I think we are making too many shortcuts for our audiences because we know the story yeah. so well. <laughs> because <laughs> what I'm re referring to is that uh, Joe Paradiso is one of the fascinating pioneers of modular synthesizers, actually. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I guess I, I know all the real pioneers. <laughs> I take mine, which I built as a kid, really, and push it into weird spaces. It still grows, Griffey. Yeah, I would love stick. to bring it to the festival, but I can't because it's too big. <laughs> it's like... Uh, Rose Red, Stephen King's house that grows almost by itself. <laughs> so I'm still it was working in, on it. In 2004, it. when we had it here, and uh, just wasn't enough time to really dig in our archives and, and, and find the videos, because it's really like the, the 
a kind of almost uh, yeah the classical image of uh, modular synthesizers like a huge wall of something okay. and then you see a small little Joe Paradiso <laughs> in front of it and patching it, and it and was pivotal for me because I, I had done a lot with it before um, but when I brought it to ours I discovered a depth in that synthesizer I, I never knew existed uh, I do a different piece every day start in the morning go on and the kids that and, and the audience in general they're coming hadn't seen a modular. Now they're big again. They yeah, came back. Yeah, they're celebrating it, a big comeback yeah. Yeah. currently, modular synthesizers. Uh, but, but there's one particular difference because, I mean, there are many, of course, musicians uh, working in, with modulars and having the big assemblies, uh, yeah. but you built everything yourself. I you did. even developed it. I yeah, mean, it's not I just, uh, well, there is some instruction, some YouTube tutorial, and no. <laughs> you solder here, solder there. Yeah. You, you uh, I, I designed developed it. the circuits. Yeah. Yeah. The circuit boards, you yeah. solder it, you put it together, yeah. and you're playing it yeah. as a musician. Yeah, of course. That's why I <laughs> built it so I could have an instrument, the instrument I wanted to use and play. Yeah. And of course, my time is always limited since there's so much to do, but I, I, I'm not letting it go. Uh, I'm still doing a piece every year. I do a few pieces. It's so much fun. And yeah, uh, if I have a challenge to do a deeper piece like I did for the Plasma Fusion Center, I, I love it because that gets me immersed in it. And I keep finding something new. Of course, I'm always building new things. But just in what I have, there's always a deeper level to get to, which is, which is fun. And what makes you still making it bigger, still uh, trying to, oh, to, to I, the continue The ideas it. don't stop. Every time I use it, I think of, oh, it'd be good if I had one of these. <laughs> or maybe, uh, I could maybe buy a Eurac unit, kind of, but it's not really this. I'm just going to make it. The new, what I'm building now is a vowel generator from Bell Labs I had when I was a kid. So even before I had the synthesizer. And I trashed it over the years. I made some recording way back, but it's gone. But I found one on eBay, and uh, it's three analog LC filters, and I can digitally switch now the capacitor. I can drive into overdrive in many different ways. I can put it into different configurations. It's a big module now. I have to get the time to finish it before I forget what I, what I actually built. But uh, yeah, I, I can think of the kind of sounds I can make with that, and I'm just excited. Yeah. And of course, it won't do exactly what I think, but it will do great things, and I'll, I'll be able to use it. I mean, what I really like always being with you, and it's really dangerous. You know, I wanted to be Connie here with us because if we do are starting uh, going to start talking about yeah. this kind of yeah. techie things, yeah. we, can, uh, we can talk with yeah. a common language. <laughs> oh, I'm, so I'm the please, limiter. You know, I'm the limiter. <laughs> yeah, you're the limiter, the translator, <laughs> putting sense into the whole thing because I always get carried away with uh, your stories and this this kind of combination of the excitement that you have by being able to build things, yep. but also the excitement by being able to use things. And I yep. think this is a very interesting paradigm. We talk a lot this year about you know, how to deal with these digital realities, how to create maybe also new way to see the hierarchy between technology development, uh, the commercial application and, and the people. And I think in a certain way you are unifying this, uh, being this always super curious, uh, excited engineer, but also thinking about how can I use it yep, yep. and wh what does it mean yep. if I really apply yep. it to something. And of course the things that I do with it quite often aren't relevant for most people, at least when I do them. <laughs> Ten years later with the shoe, right, then you see Nike Plus and yeah. other things kind of coming. Yeah. But yeah, I think of, you know, this is so wild, this is just the power of the idea. We just have to, I got to build it because this idea is going to consume me. So I build it. And unfortunately, I have students that are very good and capable of building things too. So we, we, we're doing all kinds of projects. We're always building new things. And the people that come to my group, most of them are artists as well as scientists. You know very well the, the, the kind of people mm -hmm. that, that fill those niches. And it's just great to have a team like that at the Media Lab. I would like to step in now because I'm also personally very interested. You mentioned earlier that the space game has really changed recently oh, totally. and I would really like to know what you and also you so you both uh, think about this uh, the, the new players who entered the game is this good for space research space science or is it a problem that uh, private corporations uh, do now uh, have their interests in, in space science oh, it's so outstanding that we have this because there are lots of other ways to get stuff up and uh, there are a lot of opportunities we don't know what space is good for yet we know one thing there are answers. So we can go out there, we can put, you know, look for life elsewhere, stuff like that. There are answers out there. So how the universe formed, all the missions that are flying, we're learning so much. Uh, there are opportunities for, you know, artists or other people to, to do things now more than ever before. Um, and who knows, there may be a commercial reality to space beyond low Earth orbit. This is a dream. We don't know if it's going to really happen or not. Uh, I heard it in a seminar, one of the Air Astro faculty say, uh, 
we don't know if the business is still going to be photons going back and forth, which it is now, or actual material going back and forth. Mm -hmm. We're set up now for material. Let's see if there's a, a sustainable economy that, that can do that. But all things are possible now. So it's, it's exciting. And we can do stuff much more quickly. You know, who, who would have thought we could put something on the moon? We just thought about it six months ago. There was a chance to get on a mission, and we did. And uh, it, it was unthinkable. Gerrit, have you also always been enthusiastic about this new de development? No, I, I totally understand uh, this part of the enthusiasm. Uh, if you are in the position to make yep. use of it, to utilize it, like yep. in your case, and if you are backed up or come from an institution that is trustworthy, I think everything is fine. But then again, I mean, considering the huge amount of money that is yeah. already in play and, and as you uh, also uh, indicated, that will develop as a huge business. I think, uh, of course, there's a very big problem if private people are deciding about it. I mean, we had this in history. Uh, it was also like the private people, the merchants, uh, who put the money together to colonize uh, the world. And, and we know how badly they behaved yeah. because it didn't, yep. very soon you, you switch from ex exploration to yeah, exploitation. exploitation. And I think this is something where, I mean, it's totally fine if the rich guys pay for it. Yeah, they should yeah. continue to do this. Yeah. But I think uh, every time we go into uncharted territory, and, yeah. and I mean, we, we know enough probably about uh, at least the, the, the space around Earth uh, to know what we are doing, but in terms of consequences, what kind of businesses, what kind of influences could come, there are still many open questions. And we need somehow the public, the people, represented yeah. by the state, by responsible institutions involved in it. So I think at least we really may have to make sure that universities and, and research institutions that have also the public trust. Of yeah. course, like MIT, like Harvard, like others, yeah. like Princeton and yeah. all over the world, uh, they should be involved and shouldn't be only on the mercy of these rich, rich guys. I mean, it's, yeah. it's almost, I mean, it was like, long, long time ago, Charles Darwin had a great chance you know, to hop on a, on a ship, which was actually not really made to be, the intention was not really to be uh, a research ship, but it was more a commercial thing, and he could go there, and, and by the way, he discovered something. Yep, yep. I, I think we, we need to be more careful also or more, more purposeful and say, okay, if you rich guys are going to explore the space instead of the state, then you also have to take the responsibilities, not only the possibilities. It's a, it's a great comment. I mean, in, in many ways, Griffith, but I think the role of government is going to be to look further, right? This NASA's, I, I was going to JPL quite a bit and talking to the directorship there about ideas and projects. and. Um, it's just an amazing place, but they embrace all of this because they think, again, the more ways to get up there, the better. But also, NASA's role is really to look further out uh, to explore, and you know, the commercial role will be closer in. We don't yet know what the commercial role is going to be, but it'll be closer in. I think uh, if you just have a mad, conflicting rush of interests that, that aren't aligned and, and unaligned with the public, that's not going to be good. We don't yet know, again, what space is going to be good for beyond just, again, getting photons back and forth and internet and stuff. That makes its own problem with space junk, someone, and that needs government re regulation as well. So at so many levels, it's a dialogue between government, between industry, and then you've got to keep organizations like the ESA and NASA looking further out where there's no commercial application, but that's where the answers come from. So we, we've got to make these missions that are really going to I also us. think that the international collaboration will be extremely important. I oh, mean, we I have know. now not only Russia and, yeah, and yeah. US, we also have China, India, so more and more countries <laughs> are jumping into this. Yep. And, and I think, again, uh, in particular, I think, in, in the role also of universities. It, it might not necessarily be the government, because yep. the way how government is seen in US or in China or in Europe or uh, yeah. is so different. But I think universities are a kind of common idea that there is some fact-based knowledge yep. that guides exploration of new territories. And I agree, including the arts. I mean, universities also are bastions of, of all of that. Um, just for going to the moon, I mean, I, I agree with you with this international perspective. The students that's, that's developed the lunar nodes is a Chinese national. He's a Chinese student at MIT. He came to me by Sam Ting, actually, highly recommended. And uh, he's working with a German student at CERN. 
and uh, we have people at Haystack Labs at MIT involved, as well as you know us at the Media Lab, maybe Air Astro. It's a combination. So it's the Americans, including the, the uh, space establishment, uh, the Chinese, and CERN. But it's not official. We're not clearing any of this at a government level. These are MIT students, MIT affiliations. We're just you know for, informally collaborating with a certain guy. Hopefully, now that they hear this, they don't shut it off. <laughs> there is always a level of, of decision making and bureaucracy everywhere. But it's one of the wonderful things about it. It doesn't matter where you are. This is an opportunity. People come from everywhere. They discover things in themselves. And when Fen Zhang goes back to China, which he wants to do now to work in the space agency, he is a great contact between you know the global community of space research and the Chinese program. And let's hope that widens and doesn't narrow, especially when you look further out uh, at exploration. That belongs to everybody. And I think uh, the people at JPL believe this and NASA. Uh, certainly universities, we all believe it. Uh, it. It doesn't belong to any one country. Uh, and since you mentioned uh, also earlier that the NASA has to look further, yeah. uh, a very pop cultural question, but how intense is there still the interest of finding life in oh, outer space? It's the big question of the time. It means so, you, you know very well, but it means so many things. Uh, it's our own future, right? Uh, it's also, is all of this stuff just for us, right? Because the universe is big probably for a reason, because it takes a lot of probability space for to roll the dice enough to get life, advanced life like us to form. So many random things. Some of them are convergent, where you know thermodynamically it's favored and you'll converge towards something. But there are a lot of them that aren't. I think there are enough gaps in that chain that you need a universe full of stuff to make us probably. So I don't think there's much life, of, at least of any sophisticated nature. Uh, but we'll find out. That's the beauty in our lifetime. Uh, I mean, in your lifetime, yes. In my lifetime, probably. Gerfried, you're probably somewhere <laughs> yeah, where we're both up there. But we have a good chance. It's one of the things you want to stay alive for. Well, when we talk about space exploration, uh, I think that humanity is still at a, quite an early stage, even though it's already been going on over decades. But isn't it kind of a good thought to think, OK, we are going to get this right from the beginning because there's so many other things like we've been talking about digital humanism and how we can yeah. now uh, gain back the, 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 the put back the social dimension into technologies in the internet sure. that is now being controlled by the big um, capitalistic players okay. so how can we put the humani humanistic dimension already in space exploration from the beginning I and also how we treat space uh, yeah. that, so that we don't treat it like an um, all-you-can-eat buffet like we treat uh, our earth our own planet already now I, I think there's a lot of questions there that deal with things we barely understand right now but Connecting people to space is something that we're very interested in because we did it with Doppel Lab here at Ars Electronica, connected people to our building, connected people to a wetland at Tidmarsh, connecting people through sensors to other landscapes using uh, the vision of an artist with AR, VR to bring it together with the actual data. We're going to try to do that with space as well uh, so that people can go along with some of these missions in different ways. Even for NASA operations, right? You've got to combine all this information in an interesting way and bring it up to the the people that are involved. So the whole idea of what presence is, that's one thing I've talked about with people law for a long time. Mm -hmm. The definition of presence is changing with sensors and sensor nets that we can plug into. In terms of what we're going to do out there, I love uh, things like the expanse, all these sci-fi stories of this planetary culture that's all over the solar system. I don't know if we're ever going to get there because space is kind of difficult. It's not made for people. And uh, you know, you can't really go out in the beautiful air of Linz like we can. And are you going to be able to terraform? Maybe, but that's way, way off, not very probable. Uh, any environment we build in an actual large spacecraft is still going to have deficits. So though, you know, we, we don't know yet, we're inventing it. So who knows what role people have there? Explo exploration, yes. Going to the moon and, and finding things out, yes. Mars, further out, I don't know. Some people probably will walk on Mars. Will we go and build a colony? I don't know. By the time we do it, and this is one thing Gerfried and Ars understands, humanity will change. Will we still want to go to space by that time? Because we'll discover other things we can do. So I'm not sure that we're really going to go out in mass. I don't know if that makes sense. But we don't know yet. It could be. And let's, let's go with that dream. <laughs> I think it's fine for now. But you know, put a few checks on it. We've talked about several of them here. I, 
I would love to listen to both of you for hours and hours going on. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm quite sad that I got the role of the limiter in this in this conversation because I'm the one who has to break off now, um, <laughs> sadly, because uh, we are continuing uh, to the next point in this session. But thank you so very much for coming in and, and, and giving us a, a tiny glimpse into the broad field of research and interests you, you're doing and you're having. Oh, I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to come here. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I'm really afraid I, I had to do this because we are continuing now uh, to take you to our another of our art thinking journeys uh, in a sympo symposium we invited activists slash artists uh, to discuss the different roles that art can play uh, art as a compass art as journalism and also art as a catalyst and we're about to be taken on this journey now by uh, Kiyoko Kuno, who's a key researcher and artist of the Future Lab, Ars Electronica Future Lab. Uh, she has a lot of experience in creating interactive art and she's been also working in the fields of directing and uh, designing. And we will hear from Hideaki Ogawa, the director of Ars Electronica Future Lab. He's going to guide us through this uh, episode on art thinking. My name is Kyoko Kuno. I am an artist and a key researcher of Ars Electronica Future Lab. The theme of episode 7 is art thinking. Art thinking is the one of the research projects at the Ars Electronica Future Lab investigating the role of art in our society. Now, I would like to guide you in a journey to explore the role of art in the 21st century. We are now in the forest. This is the forest of flower of time. Get close to the flowers and let's have a look. The clock rotates 50 seconds per rotation and on the petals around the clock, the exhibition visitors wrote the idea of 50 seconds of time. This artwork aims to collect and share each visitor's idea and sense of time. In this way, art can invite people to explore questions and stimulate new ideas. So, what is the role of art for our society? Art is not only about beauty. Art is not just for some people who like art. Art can change people's perspective through the question, what if? Sometimes in a radical way, art can make us think critically. The topics that art provoke can inspire people and open dialogue and discussion. A good question has a power to make us consider. Creating our own questions, not just those asked by others, becomes good tools for us to think. We live in a certain society, and there are many social issues that we need to address. But how do we extract the essential issues from them? We believe that by applying the power of arts to society, we can discover essential issues that have never been seen before. And we can create new values and also encourage dialogue between people.
So now we have arrived our next destination, and I would like to introduce our special guest journey, the Hidewaki Ogawa, director of Arce Electronica Future. Thank you, Kyoko. Hello, everyone. Look, this is my piece titled Momentarium. It is a kinetic art piece that points at the direction of the future. Let me try. So where is the future for you? Have you ever thought about it? The future is, as you are now seeing, constantly changing. If you believe you are now into the future, but immediately the direction and also status of the future is changing. In this way, the future is not fixed. And the future is not one. The future is constantly changing. We are living in a future that no one of us knows. In an age of accelerating technological development, unstable economic and political conditions, and pandemics, how do we find our own compass and live in the new future? Let's talk about art thinking as one of the ideas to answer this question. Art thinking is a process to apply artistic thinking and perception to the broad types of societal technological challenges. Art creates creative questions, and design creates the creative solutions. Art holds the power to scrutinize existing beliefs, cast doubt on common perceptions, and find a way to think outside of the box. So look at this immersive map. Design thinking, see? Design thinking itself is effective for creating and shaping the product and the service for the future. It's like a direction. And on the other hand, art thinking, art itself is like a, you know, a process to observe the possibilities and issues as 360 degrees perspectives. Meaning, uh, design is effective for creating products and services for the future. And art is creating and providing us a new compass for the future. We at Sectonica Future Lab has been applying this process to a variety uh, of domains, including innovation for corporations, future education, urban development, and uh, uh, action on deep issues. Uh, with developing new uh, platform uh, tools and the environment, together with our partners, we are creating very unique creative chemical reactions uh, with our partners for our society. Here, I would like to introduce one example of how we, c we collaborate with the citizen of the uh, city of Linz. The tema was about how to create a world uh, together in the digital age. Krankbolke ABC project is a public participatory project created for a public uh, performance event called Krankbolke during the Architecting Festival in 2012. The participants uh, first prepared for Krankbolke at the Architecting Center. Using a letter assembly kit developed by FutureLab, the participant will be able to shape their self in the digital age, using LED and the radio receiver components to control the light of each letter at the event. Let me show you my letter made in Architecture Center. So, look. Is it looking like me? So I selected the C as a, my, you know, part of character. So you can see the LED stripe inside, and actually this letter can be interacting 
with uh, radio signals because we have the radio receiver inside. But the, as I said, you know, this character is nonsense as a single letter. So we need a partners and we need a collaborators to create something together. So let's find some, my friends. Oh, Kyoko. Great, she has A. We have C and A. Kyoko, what do you think? Does she uh, make sense? Maybe we need one more letter. Oh, Dennis. Oh, you have N. This means we have C, A, N. We can say, yes, we can. Through this artistic process, each student creates their own compasses, which resonates with other. Rather than creating a top-down world, we create a new future through patchwork. At the Future Lab, we see art thinking not as a uh, method, but as an attitude. We tend to want a map of the future right away, but a map is a path when it is created. Instead, we believe it's more important to have a compass, a mindset, to explore a new future. Future Lab also develops toolkits and platform based on art thinking. One of these tools is the art thinking card, used for creative brainstorming and workshops. Let's have a look. These cards inspire and support people in brainstorming and workshop to extract essential issue for themselves and for our society and to generate creative questions. The challenge to think about our future and our present society through art is not only happening here in Venice. Our approach to thinking about society through art has expanded beyond the world. The School of the Future project takes place in Tokyo Midtown, a complex in the heart of Tokyo. It is a place to discuss issue of our changing society and cutting edge topics that are not taught in conventional schools. Hi everyone, I'm at minus three of our Sextonica Center now. Can you see? So this is a exhibition called Understanding AI Exhibition. So there are many projects to deal with artificial intelligence. Then I can take you on a journey. But before going to the journey, I can show you where I'm. You know, you can see my hand. Then you can see myself. So it's a setting where you know you are diving in. So there's a setting here. Then you are utilizing the remote conditions to experience the live experience to talk to me or to to be guided in the remote locations. So let's have a look. We are almost react reaching the end of our journey. What we are seeing now is a video of Hide coming into deep space. This is a special helmet for the new online experience of the art called Ghost Dive. The helmet can deliver the vision and experience of the person wearing it. Since the global pandemic, Online participation in event has been increased. 
how can we use technology to create more live experience online? How do we get the perspective of the person walking through on site? And how can we create a resonance beyond a simply connecting through digital technology? This year, at the Arusa Electronica Festival, we plan to present this experience as a new festival-guided tour. Together with our team at the Paris Arts Electronica Festival, we are looking forward to taking you on a new journey. See you again in the near future. Hi, my name is Horst Hörtner and I'm announcing the final episode eight with a clear perspective on the presence and the future of the Ars Electronica Future Lab. In this episode eight, we will welcome many special guests. And among them is this newcomer, the alchemists of the future, the Ars Electronica Future Lab, the 25 years and beyond. Starting with September 2021, this book will be available and your, at your most preferred bookstore worldwide and on our website online. Uh, and of course, throughout all the info desks at the Ars Electronica Festival. This final episode is an opportunity to finally meet some of the alchemists behind the ideas and projects that we have presented in those episodes one to seven in the last months. We're looking forward to this final episode, the final episode of the 25th anniversary sequences. And we'll broadcast that at the Future Lab Day. The, during the festival, mark the date, it's Thursday, September 9th, 2021. Looking forward to meet you there in person or online. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to our keynote conversation format, uh, a format where we invite uh, several high-profile uh, guests to talk about their work uh, in combination with our festival topics. And I get the feeling today it will be a lot about uh, digital, digital democracy and democracy at all. And it is with pleasure that I introduce Amy Whittaker. She is an assistant professor of visual arts administration at the New York University. She studies the friction between art and business and proposes new structures to support economic sustainability for artists. Stemming from Amy's long-standing engagement in the social practice of teaching business to artists, her research has contributed to new methods of art market analysis that center artists and archival materials. These structures in turn inform policies of economic redistribution in democratic societies. Amy's work has been featured in Time magazine, The Guardian, Harper's, Atlantic, Financial Times, Art Forum, The New York Times, The New Yorker, among others. She's also the author of three books, Museum Legs, Art Thinking, and Economics of Visual Art, Market Practice and Market Resistance. Before entering academia, she worked for the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art and the Tate, as well as for the artist Jenny Holzer and the investment from D.E. Shaw and Co. Amy holds a PhD in political economy from Goldsmiths on University of London, an MBA from Yale, and an MFA in painting from the Slade School of Fine Art, and also a BA in political science. To my left is Gerfried Stocker, and he usually likes it when I keep the introduction short. Introduction <laughs> short. <laughs> so we'll just say he's a media artist and a telecom telecommunications engineer. He founded XSpace, a artist team and collective. Uh, and since 1995, uh, Gerfried Stocker is the artistic director of Ars Electronica. And ever since, he's a key figure behind the artistic direction and positioning uh, of Ars Electronica. So I uh, welcome. Amy Whittaker, hello, nice to have you here. 
Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Hi. So we can go right into it. Somehow you are a wanderer between worlds, I would say. And then again, you are not because you combine, combine them so easily <laughs> in your work, at least it seems uh, to me. Uh, not only, but especially, I think, in, in, in your book, Art Thinking, it, it seems somehow how very natural that you would progress there from business and art and you progress to this. So maybe you could, based on your uh, personal and educational background, explain a little bit uh, the topic of art thinking and what it is for you. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your generous introduction, Alex. And um, Gerfried has been describing these topics um, and at the forefront of developing pathways across these fields. So I'm so happy to be in conversation. Um, with you all. It's a very flattering way to start the Sunday morning in New York. Um, so my own background, um, as you mentioned, um, is a bit of a Venn diagram. I wasn't one of those people who was blessed with an exactly specific interest, and so I studied a lot of things. And political science was really a home for me because it, the development of these systems of governance were ways of talking about how we could all live together in a society and a democratic society. So I noticed that many people, especially in business, which I had gone to study because I originally wanted to be a museum manager because I thought museums were like these public libraries for imagination. <laughs> many people in business seemed cut off from their creative selves. Uh, and many people in the arts seemed uh, cut off from engagement in markets, not because they needed to make profit or think capitalistically, but because our societies had this engagement with markets that artists were disadvantaged from. And at the very least, I wanted to feel an invitation to participate in the conversation around. Um, so I, as you said, I did an MBA and then I did an MFA in painting after that. And when I was in the MFA at the Slade, I used to give these lunchtime talks in business that were not how to get a gallery. They were, what is the theory of how the market works? And watching artists engage with that was absolutely amazing and a privilege. People would ask me questions like, what if we did away with all the banks? And I would say things like, you never have to open this section of the Financial Times again, but here are the stock pages and here's how people believe that meaning is constructed through these systems. And so I have this sense of hopefulness that if anyone can help us navigate where we are um, in the world, how we might develop systems that are hopeful and just, I think that artists have every shot of doing that, and especially at this intersection of art and technology. Thank you. Uh, when thinking about art thinking, at least for me, creativity in business as well, what always pops up, you know how the, uh, the uh, private business is very good at taking a certain part of a method and using it for uh, uh, furthering their, their capital uh, and leave the rest, so to speak. So for me, at least art thinking, it felt, uh, when I read it, it goes against the grain. It, it really goes uh, against efficiency. It, it goes against uh, uh, building capital, uh, so to speak. Because when I think about uh, Silicon Valley, they always try to constantly better themselves and be creative all the time. But somehow I don't think that is the case with uh, art thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe I can just give a short working um, overview of art thinking. You were kind of asking me to do that before. Um, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, wrote an essay in 1947 called On the Origin of the Work of Art. And Heidegger says, um, you know, when there is art that enters the world, a thrust enters history and everything is changed. Um, the way that I would describe that is that if you are making a work of art in any area of your life, personally, professionally, societally, organizationally, technologically, you're not going from a known point A to a known point B, you are inventing point B. And exactly as you say, Alex, Systems of economics are not designed for that process of discovery, invention, research, and development. They are designed for processes of production. Um, the utopian belief of economics is that we have scarce resources and that markets can help us use them in the best possible way. And of course, we know that there are many things of value that markets struggle to describe. 
So what Art Thinking really offers is a way of thinking about a process of inventing point B. Similar to design thinking, it puts together creative and kind of structural practices, but different from design thinking, it breaks them out further apart. So there's more space for the messiness of artistic exploration and more engagement with business and economic structures as a parallel creative process. So, you know, when we all listen to Gerfried's um, prescient talks over many years, and Gerfried, you talk about um, how companies and societies and countries can save money by being aware of privacy, for example, or surveillance and choosing what to invest in. That is very aligned with art thinking as a practice of um, having real discipline about deciding what the question is that you want to explore, whether you know that you can answer it or not. And then uh, what's structurally difficult is that you have to invest resources in the question before you know if you will be able to answer it. And so you need systems to own equity in the future when value is discovered, and you need systems to cover R&D, research and development, when you're developing ideas. And so, so I think this, hopefully this process um, is very connected and resonant for this kind of larger exploration of democracy, developing the future, designing the world, because I think that ultimately we live in a series of point B worlds that are constantly being reinvented. And I think we would agree that we live in a quite vulnerable moment right now where we don't know what the genre of film is of the world we're inventing. It could be very bad. It could be a horror movie. It could be the, the kind of French existentialist movie that just kind of slides into despair. I, I don't know yet, but the sort of engagement um, in the construction of, of really these kind of democratic systems is, is um, I think, something we're all um, talking about working on. I, I really like, of course, this this uh, way how you uh, coined this with inventing the point B as one of these uh, uh, really truly almost original artistic contributions. And sometimes I think we even could go maybe a little bit further and say what what art thinking does is even inventing or yeah inventing accepting alternatives to a point B. Because it's not only to say, okay, well, I don't know point B, so we need to be creative to find another point B. Because this is, I think, uh, what the industry always would like to do us as creative people. And I say, okay, hey, we don't have a clue how to continue, so please help us with this. But I think the, 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 the real, the, the unexpectedness of, uh, of these artistic contributions, the, the will to think in alternatives, and maybe if there is no point B, well, why should we invent even one? Maybe uh, yeah. we should rather think of point C, D, E, F, G, or maybe even of, well, for a moment, let's stay where we are. And we maybe don't even have to go to point B. So th this is, of course, the point where it really gets complicated. I think the moment where for us as artists and creatives, and I mean, you are also an artistic mind uh, from, from your background. I always think the moment when it gets exciting for us, this is the moment when our clients or the, the people that we try to consult and help with, with art thinking, this is the moment where they get afraid of. What is your experience and, and, and what are your tricks, so to say, to build <laughs> that this uh, bridge of confidence that uh, the people that we're working with are really yeah, uh, courageous enough to follow us in this um, alternative thinking. Right, right, absolutely. I, I think you're so right that inventing point B, in some ways it's a helpful, provocative concept, and in other ways, the alphabet is a linear structure. <laughs> and the most important part is the part of being inside the point A world, you know, being alive to the present moment and being open to grounding ourselves in the questions that matter to us and the values that we intend to put forward in the world. And sometimes that that absolutely means putting in a lot of um, work and care um, to maintain parts of this, the ongoing point A world, that yeah. it's not static, right? And then sometimes it means moving backwards, moving to the side. Uh, but the, the tools that I think are really helpful um, 
you know, the, the art thinking book has two halves. The first half is about the mindsets of art. And the second half is about the tools of, of business, inclusive of some tools of democracy and politics relative to business. But on the art side, um, I think what's most helpful is first orienting to this kind of idea of being a whole person in the world, that nothing is wasted, you know, that we are alive to our own experiences. Uh, I was incredibly inspired by stories of people who thought all was lost, but actually discovered something indirectly or a side piece of their life was actually extremely important to a discovery they made. Um, and then um, being a, uh, realistic and optimistic at the same time. So uh, just orienting to the idea that um, most of the time when we see other people's breakthrough creative work, they've been struggling in obscurity for a long time before the moment we see. And um, there's that feeling that, you know, someone else is amazing and they have it figured out, but the bumper of my car is held on with duct tape. And so there are a number of stories in the book about, about that, about the differential between the process of how something is made and the outcome. And I often think in that context, when we start to talk organizationally about the work of Donald Wood Winnicott, the British child psychiatrist uh, who studied children who were taken away from their parents during World War II. This is particularly in um, the United Kingdom. And what he he found, he coined the term the good enough mother. I think we can all understand that in a less gendered way. But what it is um, for a person or for a creative being or idea to come into the world and the necessity of safety around that as the idea goes from the sort of, you know, perfect form into being part of reality and how, how that happens. And and the essence of Winnicott's work is the capacity for repair and what it is to be in organizational settings where there's a capacity for repair. And I think that that is crucial to how we think about um, teams getting comfortable with creative exploration and kind of where the rubber meets the road. I mean, one, I think you have to just say, OK, this question is important. This question is part of the portfolio of what we are investing in, but it's not something where we will measure the return in a tidy, quantifiable way. You might say this is the alternative asset allocation of what we're doing. And so we can have some control. We can structure experiments so that we're constantly learning, um, but we cannot benchmark this in a, in a way that we understand. And we have to develop a culture of curiosity, of discipline to the question, of collaboration, so that we can each bring ourselves to it and find repair if we need to. And the, just to, to put that in slightly less abstract terms before kind of throwing it back to you, um, one of the characters in the art thinking book, among many others I have real love for, is uh, Roger Bannister, the uh, first person to run a mile in under four minutes in modern recorded sporting history. This is in 1954. And Bannister's story is emblematic of a few pieces of what I'm trying to get across. Um, number one, he was not a professional athlete. He was finishing his training to become a neurologist. And he always maintained that his greatest contributions in life were to neurology and to his family. Um, but he only had an hour to train on his lunch break and then some time to train with his friends. Um, number two, he didn't do it alone. Two of his friends who were outstanding runners in their own, own right, one was a world record holder, one co-founded the London Marathon, paced him. Um, number three, there's nothing perfect about the circumstances in which he did this. Uh, it was a terrible day. The weather was bad, even by British standards. There was a false start. He almost wasn't able to do it. Um, and he had to give everything he had before he knew it was possible. So this portal of the ordinary and extraordinary is very close. And then number four, when, when he did this in the point A world, no one believed it was possible. They thought he might die trying. They thought the other runners who were trying to do this at the same time might die trying. They had pre-written obituaries. And then he did it. And then he only held the record for 45 days because 
to believe something is possible that you've never seen and do it is extremely different from seeing it's possible and trying to best an effort. And this economic logic is the latter. It's, can I be marginally more efficient at producing this thing that I already see is producible? And so art thinking is really holding space for the, the um, banister part of that. And I think for all of us, sometimes we need guardrails to do that. In banister's case, he had run in the Olympics in Helsinki um, in 1952 and come in fourth and been devastated not to medal. And he had given himself a grace period. He had said, I have two years and then I will have finished my medical training and I really won't be able to run at this level. And, you know, July 1952 to May 1954 is almost two years. Um, so sometimes we, we need that grace period. We need to say, this is the amount of time I can train. This is my studio time. I can't do more than that. This is the amount I can invest that I can afford to lose or treat as a tuition for learning. And this is the period of my life in which it's safe for me to hold and protect this open-ended space. Um, and these are the people I'm working with and we cultivate enough trust in each other that there's a capacity for repair, what Winnicott calls a holding environment. I uh, really would like to progress this a little bit further because this in itself is a very democratic act and a very democratic notion of art. And somehow I want to flip it onto the art world and uh, the art business now. Uh, <laughs> I have a little anecdote. I am not sure if it's true. I didn't check it because I want it to be true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was supposedly uh, Josef Beuys said to one of his students, in principle, everyone is an artist except you. <laughs> and what seems like an, uh, uh, what seems like an insult uh, uh, quickly uh, turns around and, and makes this person very special and a genius. And what I like about it is you have <laughs> both notions of art as something democratic, which is in the world, which is a basic human trait. And then you have this idea of a very special uh, person. And my question would be, uh, do we have in the in the art world uh, too much still the notion of the of the of the artist as something special? And uh, we, how can we bring more participation in the, uh, the open notion of art into the, into the structure, in museums, in institutions? Um, are there any uh, technical tools or uh, new developments? Mm. Uh, yeah, Gerfried, did you want to take that first or um, either way? You are our special guest. Please no, no, start. It's, uh, please start. No, no, it's um, it's my honor yeah. to be in conversation with both uh, of you. My remark would just would be to this as a starting point is I think we have to make a difference between what is art, what is the artwork, and what is the artist, and what is the artist's work. And I think the artist's work is not necessarily the artwork on its own. There is much more that you need to do as a work as an artist, and also much more of an impact that the work of an artist is creating than just, the artist is not only the producer of an artwork. The artist's work is not just only the process to create or produce an artwork. And then I think it, it immediately becomes for me much clearer why on the, in the same time you can really push for this democratic approach towards art, but still of course see the achievement of individuals who we call artists and who practice artistic work as something extremely rare, special and valuable. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. And I, I kind of um, riff off of that. I have some similar ideas. So I think because we're talking in a democratic context and, you know, forgive me my um, U.S. Uh, <laughs> context within that, I, I would be the first to say that the American democratic experiment um, is is extremely challenged at the moment. Um, but if you go to the foundational documents of it, you know, there, there's um, a value placed on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think that type of concept, pursuit of happiness, is very much how I think about everyone being an artist in the Joseph Boy sense, except that one student, of course. Um, the, the idea is that we're, we're not all artists. We all have an invitation to the pursuit of art. We all have innate creativity and the potential to make a unique contribution. And that to me is the kind of two-sided coin of optimism and respectfulness or dignity of what each person is in a democracy. And I think what happens is that 
um, the the democracy, and again, I'll just speak about the United States as a case study. Um, in the United States, there's no control around campaign finance, especially with a recent Supreme Court case called Citizens United. Corporations are considered people and spending money on campaigns is considered free speech. And so what happens is that we have what the political economist Will Davies at Goldsmiths, my PhD advisor, calls the disenchantment of politics by economics. So we have this idea of participation that is actually participation in markets, that's not participation in civic life and is not participation in bringing forth one's creative self. So in my opinion, um, what we need most to democratize this idea of everyone being an artist is this kind of degree of honesty and transparency about uh, how vulnerability is probably the first step in that. You know that. When you're making a, a work of art or you're trying to figure something out you don't know how to do you're you're in the weeds right you don't have this view out the airplane window where you're perfectly oriented and you're like oh yes there's a vista around that corner you're just putting one foot in front of the other and that can be really frustrating and uncomfortable but the alternative is kind of not being alive to your own life right so so it's kind of this idea of being in the weeds as being alive, I think is the first thing that we can really normalize. And then I think also these questions of relationship, the power of conversation, the necessity of building things that are larger than ourselves with other people as collaborators. I think we don't have a lot of space for that because even within the arts, the economic kind of concept of the artist focuses on the lone individual and tries to kind of have superstars who are kind of market darlings. And, and I think there's a lot of space that's opening up uh, in part because of technology, including blockchain, but other technologies as well, where there are ways that people can come together in cooperatives, in collective investment trusts, in, um, in what in the blockchain sense are decentralized autonomous organizations so that people can make decisions together and support each other and distribute surplus across groups. And I think some of that will reanimate the democratic experiment. Um, and in my ideal world, the arts becomes a hub for interdisciplinary problem solving and models of redistribution, solidarity economies, mutual aid that are developed in the arts um, well under the cloud layer of the shiny glittery art market among artists, that those things can become models for larger parts of our societies. Uh, I, I would like to continue here with the uh, blockchain technology, but what the heck is blockchain? I mean, I, I, I get it, and, and on a, uh, I somehow expected to uh, go up in flames saying this is electronic. Um, uh, no, I get it on a technical level, but once you fathom the possibilities of this, uh, of this technology, what you can do with it, it somehow, you immediately want to put a label on it. You want to say it's neoliberal, you want to say it's anarchist, you want to put a label on it. And then I thought, uh, in comparison to AI, there is almost no discourse on blockchain. Maybe a little bit on Bitcoin, but uh, it seems very tech savvy. Maybe we could go a little bit more into the potential of this technology. Maybe and, and leaving aside the blockchain, of course, has this huge problem with being an energy consumer that is uh, way beyond reasonab uh, reasonability. Let's assume that uh, in a certain amount of time, technicians are able to solve the problem and let's even assume blockchain could be easily uh, 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 created so that we can really focus on, I think, its potential to become a really new uh, player or a new driving force uh, in the way how economic relationships are, uh, are created. Because I, I totally agree and I support this strong criticism about the way yeah. how blockchain is now implemented technologically. But Absolutely. the problem is it turns away the attention from the much bigger issue. And this is really this shift of paradigm in economic relationships. So absolutely, absolutely. I, I think the way that I see a lot of people encounter blockchain is um, it's like they've asked the question, what is blockchain? And the answer is like, oh, don't worry, it's too complicated technologically. <laughs> and it's so fancy and important. Like I, I it's going to be the future and like, you know, very kind of like um, exuberant and dismissive and 
you know, don't worry, you're, you know, about the technology, it's above you. And, um, and I, I don't feel that way about it at all. And I'm actually in the middle of creating a series of programs around it. They, they'll air at one in the morning, Central European time, but they'll be recorded. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be some follow-up to what I'm about to say. Um, so blockchain has a lot of different stories that come together. Um, there's obviously a money story, cryptocurrencies. There's a technology story about what the blockchain is. There's a democracy story about how we might all interact. There's some art stories and artist stories. Um, but the one I always start with is the knowledge story because, uh, and I, I'm actually filming with these gentlemen yesterday and today, later today, US time. Um, the, the start of the blockchain is actually in a question, so like an inventing point B kind of question um, from the late 1980s, when people were starting to get personal computers at home and in offices. And the question was, it is so easy to manipulate a digital file. How will we know what was true about the past? And this is the democratic part. How will we know what was true about the past without having to trust a central administrator to keep the record? So why is that important? It's important because a central administrator could theoretically be corrupted the same way that a philosopher king could be corrupted. Um, and so that's why we have trust in a system of people. So, so these researchers, Stuart Haber and Scott Sternetta, who are working at uh, a Bell, it was called Belcor, a research lab of telephone companies uh, consortium in New Jersey, in the United States, they were um, trying to figure this out and they, could not figure it out mathematically. And then they looked at what the challenge was. And the challenge was like, if you have two copies of the record and a third person corrupts it and so on, ultimately you have all these different people and anyone could really pose a threat. And then what happened was um, uh, they said, actually, we can turn that upside down. And if anyone could pose a threat, then everyone can keep the system safe. We don't need to have this one copy of a record. We need to have many, many interconnected copies of a record. And if we do that, then we can trust a system and trust the information in the system without having to trust a central administrator. There's some very specific pieces of the cryptography that make that possible. And um, it's a combination of public private key encryption and one-way hash functions and a couple of other things. And if anyone wants to read about that, um, there are a couple of really great books. I actually have one on my desk right now. This is by um, Narayanan. Uh, this is a Coursera course. Um, uh, and I can email you some links. But, but basically, it's a, it comes about from a question of knowledge and shared understanding, um, pre kind of fake news or people living in different realities of information. And so, What's interesting about blockchain is that it allows us to know what's true um, in, in collaboration with each other. And it allows us to register ownership, including shared ownership in a lot of new ways. Um, so we've seen this develop in the arts through non-fungible tokens um, where artists um, have digital work and they can represent an original copy of it, an investable copy of it using registration to the blockchain. Um, but, but we're seeing a lot of systems come out of that where people use aspects of blockchain in order to structure decision making. So people talk about this, um, the, the Bitcoin blockchain was followed by the Ethereum blockchain protocol and Ethereum is based on a concept of tokens and, and smart contracts that move those tokens around modularly. So a smart contract is a self-executing contract. So you can specify certain terms. If I sell a work of art, 20% goes to a charity. If uh, Gerfried resells the work to Alex, 10% of it comes back to me. You can automate those processes without overhead and transaction costs in a blockchain world. Um, you can also just know the record. You can see that it was sold. You can see the title transfer. You can imagine those systems being applied to voting um, or to something like self-sovereign ID cards for refugees who are not in a nation state. Um, so they can have identity and autonomy that pertains to themselves, not just that's conferred by, again, a central administrator of a government. Um, and then what we're seeing develop now and is really exciting and is happening across a lot of artists and technologists is 
these governance systems. So let's say that we have an entity that sells a lot of artworks and makes money. Some, a lot of that may go back to the artists who make the work, but some of it is also surplus that can be shared across the group or invested in new projects that the group believes in. And that is a governance problem of how that money is distributed. So blockchain can also make these much more dynamic and complex um, it, sort of smart contracts that are called DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations um, where everyone's vote is mapped like a democratic system, but kind of technologically inculcated and governed. So, so what people are working on structurally within blockchain, some of it's so idealistic and could easily be regulated or limited out of existence by governments or companies. But it's so important as a active question as an art project that all of us kind of live inside right now. And I'd love to hear kind of what what you're thinking and if there's anything I'm saying that's maybe abstract or not clear that I can clarify. To me, it was clear. Uh, I get the, the idea of, for example, that it's good for provenance and, and stuff like this. But let us, uh, for example, speculate a little bit and don't worry about feasibility too much. <laughs> but it's a very uh, decentralized uh, technology. So let's imagine, for example, a festival that is uh, totally produced uh, via, uh, via investment through decentralized uh, uh, investors via blockchain. Let's say that's possible. So you being here is by decentralized investors, you being here by decentralized investors, me being here. So what popped up in my mind it's a very uh, different notion. So there is no, uh, an art institution also is a gateway. So uh, um, it's, it's a very contrary, contrary to existing centralized platforms mm -hmm. as governments or even museums. So for me, the question would be how to balance between this, because we of course need also experts in a way and how to balance governance in this area. I mean, what I don't like actually so much in particular when it comes to the NFT discussion now in the art world is that of course this whole frenzy about the blockchain is so much connected to a unquestioned understanding that the things of the world are there to be bought and sold and sold again and somebody makes a profit, sold again, somebody makes a profit. So of course, if this is anything we can ever think of as hum human society, well, then the blockchain is a great thing because it decentralizes things, it, uh, uh, it cr also creates uh, cr wonderful possibilities for autonomous uh, business made between machines. So what else could be better for the capitalists of the future that they don't even have to think of uh, uh, their stock exchange anymore, things like this. Their machines, their artificial intelligence is making their money for them. So on the one side, it's such a kind of inspiring technological development, but it totally ended up in repeating very problematic uh, paradigms of how uh, economy of human societies can work. A and then we see this in a moment of time where or we, we are in a moment of time where we exactly see where this brought us. I mean, the whole thing that uh, we have now with uh, our climate crisis is, of course, because of uh, an understanding that there is an endless source of things that you can own and you acquire it or you colonize it or whatever you say to it and well you make money by controlling the way how, how it's being sold so in this moment i think that the real problem of blockchain uh, isn't even the the problem with the uh, energy waste uh, the, the amount of energy because i'm sure this can be solved technically i believe in technology can do this but can we also fix this very stupid unilinear thinking of the way we make business as societies. And yes. that's what I'm really sorry because I think in the beginning when blockchain started to be also recognized in our artistic, cultural, alternative hacker communities, it was so much, I think, inspired that this would change the way how we think about economy and not just be a more efficient tool to do the same type of economy. I, I could not agree more with your articulation of the question. So if I 
uh, start at the beginning um, of what Alex said first. Um, Alex, you've exactly described the core problem of democratic governance, which is the balance between popular votes and uh, an elite insulated judiciary, how you have some, some determination by all of us and some determination by those who are most expert and informed. In this case, it's very difficult to understand blockchain technologically or to program it. And so how do we um, combine these things? Um, I always think of it as the Bodie McVote face problem um, or opportunity. Uh, after, I think in the UK, there is a boat that the government allowed the public to name and the public voted that the boat should be named Bodie McBoatface, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> and also you recognize the power of, of popular will. So um, I think that in the case of um, these kind of economic structures and how they're being um, replicated in, in the blockchain, um, to me, I just want to say the best way I can describe this is to say that I am working actively and will be for the next decade and have been for the last decade at least on ways that we can think about ownership and equity as enabling. So this is very problematic as a starting point. I'm speaking from New York City, which has stolen Lenape indigenous land. Um, so, so ownership is a concept that requires a lot of unpacking and some repair work. Um, so I'm also speaking with with knowledge and respectfulness toward that. Um, but but I want to talk from this perspective of artists as a starting point, because I think that equity is a very important um, underused political tool and that there's a lot of creative policy design that can come from being extremely disciplined and then subsequently imaginative about the difference between equity and um, handouts or just payments, things that exist in an investment world and things that exist in a transaction or economic or income statement world. So some of the work that I've been doing research-wise is on what would happen if artists retained fractional equity in their work when it's first sold. And I think this describes the problem, which is that take even famous artists like Jasper Johns or Robert Rauschenberg were making work early on before anyone thought it was valuable. They were investing resources in a point A world in the 1950s before anyone bought anything. If you look at that work, um, if you go to archives and look at the sales records, what you can see is that if those artists had kept 10% equity, so instead of getting paid $100, they got paid $90 and then owned 10% of the work. So they paid for the equity in foregone income they would have outperformed US equities markets by up to a thousand times or a 20 to 40% return every year from roughly 1970 to 2005. Now that sounds like a really capitalistic neoliberal thing to say, but what's interesting about it is that if you can get artists together in a portfolio of people where some are quite powerful and financially successful and some are just starting out, they're in that moment of having to invest to cover the research and development, you can create redistributive systems if everyone owns a share in this <coughs> kind of entity, some of the proceeds from those who are more successful can go to support those who are just starting out. That's the governance question of how to redistribute proceeds. And I think that with increasing income inequality uh, being one of the destabilizing influences in politics in and of itself, and also in political strategy where people who are wealthy and uh, racially privileged will often find people who are not wealthy and racially privileged and invoke racism to try to form an, an alliance to support their wealth. Those, and many, many, many other strategic variations on that. Um, you know, if you, if you can imagine a democratic system where we have equity-based systems of redistribution, where people own things together, there's less pressure on elected representatives to choose the amount that they give to people. They can't say here's $650 and you're welcome and that should cover your rent for the next six months. Um, you own a share. So if there are proceeds, it's governed by the system. You own a percentage of, of what happens, almost like a dividend. So I think that equity is an extremely underexplored structural policy tool 
with regard to reparations and redistribution. And I think that um, taxation of transactions is um, much more effective or actionable from a policy standpoint than taxation of wealth. So I, I think that there are ways that we can construct the economics to, to form what the blockchain collective data calls an invisible economy, an economy that it's both hidden and more transparent underneath the things that we actually value. So I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I'm not inherently interested in watching an NFT sell for a lot of money at all. And I say that as someone who used to watch this American game show obsessively called The Price is Right, where you try to guess what things cost. And I used to be really good at that. And I am terrible at guessing the price of an NFT, partly because I don't care. Um, you know, I care that people can make things of value and that those things can come to exist in the world. And I think a lot about the invisible opportunity costs of what doesn't get made and of who cannot be an artist because of the economics of it. So, you know, live and let live. If someone makes a lot of money in the market, fine. Um, and if someone makes a lot of money in the market who's created a lot of value and contributed to other people, fantastic. Um, but I, I think that ultimately value is really the um, driver of what markets can contribute. And we don't think about it. We just think about price. We just think about the shiny number on the front of the newspaper. But I think we have to really reorient to value, and then I think a lot follows from that. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, we could talk, I think, uh, uh, one hour more. Uh, it's Just very scratching interesting. On the surface <laughs> scratching on the surface. Scratching on the surface. Yes, and I really, uh, I like the approach to give uh, artists more economic stability. Uh, but <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, and I thank you very much for being here for this uh, interesting talk, also to you. And I'm saying goodbye and hand over to my colleague. Well, thank you, Alex Ferran, Gerfried Stocker, and Amy Whitaker for this interesting talk you had. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, we are uh, almost at the end of this session. Uh, we had a lot of very interesting guests and talks and it's not over yet completely because uh, we are now looking at our community projects to finish this session. The Experts of the Future community project, of course, where we imagine a world without sun. Then we're also going to taste some more soil. Taste Your Soil community project takes us to Araucania this time and uh, after that, after this session, I recommend to stay tuned as well because uh, one of the highlights is going to be a guided tour through the Cyber Arts exhibition, showing you more of the winning, pre-winning uh, works that we have this year. And after that, there's going to be another piece by the European Theatre Convention. 22 theatres from uh, all over Europe got together and uh, thought about imagined a renaissance of theater that's also the name of the project and we are going to see a piece from the theater in dresden so thank you for watching this is the Ars electronica channel i think in the future the sun will be gone and it'll be turned to a giant fusion reactor which is a technology that many scientists have been developing but yet you invent it so I think if they figure the technology out in the future, they'll probably dismantle a few planets to build it, most likely Mercury. And so the Mercury will also be gone. And the sun will look like a giant moon that keep transmitted power back to Earth. And which, whichever country that control the power source or the sun will be able to rule over the world and establish eternal peace because while other countries would be horrified by its endless power source, they can launch endless nuke across the world. So if the technology is achievable in the future, this world will be peace, which is a future world I think will happen.
I am trying to understand how it tastes. At the first time, I imagine I taste a volcano. I taste after a fire. I taste time. Welcome to this third installment of 3 Times 3 with Christian Zwanek, and it is my pleasure to welcome here at V2, first of all, of course, artist Christian Zwanek, with whom uh, we've already done uh, two editions of 3 Times 3 and will uh, wrap up this period of 3 Times 3 live experiment tonight. Uh, but we also have a very special guest to tonight's program, Zane Wayne Macy is amongst us and will uh, play a crucial role in tonight's live experiment. Uh, we're going to focus on a completely different aspect within uh, Christian's practice, which is uh, his uh, interest in the response of plants to sound. And more specifically, tonight's experiment will revolve around plants that can, can uh, more or less dance in response to their specific music preference, jazz. Yes, this is a very special experiment for me, which I have been actually preparing for maybe five years. And it involves a very special plant that I um, actually rediscovered. I read about this plant maybe 20 years ago in the work uh, by Darwin, uh, The Power of Movement in Plants, and that they react to sound but specifically to human sound. So I said it would be so nice to have like a plant that you can like have an interaction without like w wiring things, pr you know, in the, in the plant or, but just f physically have, have a relation with the plant through sound. And so from the hundreds of seeds, I had like three little plants and after like six months, they were maybe 30, 40 centimeters. And I knew that what I read, they only start moving when they're like, mature so like six months or seven or a bit mid more so every day I would like with my coffee would try something and if they would react to it or not and I was not you know not very successful and but then I, I just okay I'm just gonna play CD song song just anything and uh, yeah it was some more reaction and then I put on the Miles Davis uh, album with John Coltrane and I was completely surprised actually in the introduction of the album, first Miles Davis starts, but then Coltrane comes in and all their like little leaves were moving. So I was like completely like, wow, they're, <laughs> they're moving. And then I remembered that um, I met Zane, incredible musician, a great artist like in, uh, four years ago when he played at my opening in, in Den Haag. And I said, wow, I, he, he, sh he sh really should be the, the guy to, to, to play with the plants. And um, so that's what we are going to try. There were some interesting things already when we did some testing and he took uh, out some parts of his saxophone, but, uh, and we d already discovered some, some frequencies or overtones that they seem to really react to. Well, I think it's good to introduce Zane. Thank <laughs> you. 
I presume this is your first time you're playing with plans. Yes. Um, so how is this different from like improvising with, let's say, dancers? Because it depends. They only react to the sound I, I give them. So it's not like I have with dancers or other musicians. This is totally, man, it's on you. Make mm -hmm. me move, you know? I'm not going to move until you make me. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great lesson. So it taught me, wow. Sensitivity. They're very sensitive. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the more sensitive you are, the more they react. But it's very hard to see with the naked eye. Right. And this this specific kind of music um, makes them wake up. The plants are my teacher. I had to learn how to play with the plants. Yeah. Not, not uh, me just playing by myself. So it teaches me uh, a great lesson in, in compassion and patience. You know. Plants are very patient. Christian, is this also what you expected from this experiment? I didn't know what, what I, well, I, I knew if I had like, I've seen the effects when I played Coltrane. And I think the only person I know or uh, around here, like uh, somewhere near <laughs> is, 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 is <laughs> Zane. Because it's, it, no, it's the overtones, it's like, it, it's, it's yeah. and, but uh, I'm still, I'm still like wondering, of course, what it is. So it's maybe also a kind of intention and, 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 and yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, because I, 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 it's funny that I, I, have I have 24 of those plants, some even a bit bigger, some even a bit smaller, but I had to select like two or three. So what I did, I played again, kind of blew to them uh, a couple of days ago to see which one would like be best to bring, but it was a bit of discrimination because, you know, they were all, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> well, but they, those two said, okay, they were, but I played the whole album again, but they were all, at a certain point, they were all moving, moving, and then I had this completely stra really strange, dreams and and as if, if I was hypnotized by them and actually you know maybe their function is to hypnotize someone or some insect or it, it, that, that, that maybe it's that their mechanism is built to hypnotize something once again Christiane wow amazing artist fascinating artist I had the pleasure of working with him a few years ago yeah and that experience was amazing man I still have dreams about that but he Today, well, you go with it yourself, man. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, because you I prove that we are connected in this world, man. What more science? What more proof human beings need? We're all connected here. You see the vibrations. All vibrations affect all of us. This is proof right here tonight. Do I see more? I don't know. I think it speaks for itself. Well, that's a beautiful note to end uh, this session with. So that's it for us uh, here at V2 tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and see you at another uh, occasion in the near future. Thank you.
Welcome to the CyberArts exhibition. The exhibition showcases the winners of the Prias Electronica. And we used to present and especially to curate this exhibition since 1998. It is an interesting project which shows every year a development. You can see trends in media art and you can also explore what's going on in society always framed through the works which are honored from a fantastic jury every year. We are here at the Okaplatz, right in the city center of Linz, one of the many venues of the OÖ Landeskultur GmbH. And together we will guide you through this year's cyber arts exhibition. We honor a friend, a creative mind, Hannes Leopold Seder this year, which we sadly lost. He invented the Prias Electronica in 1987 as a visionary act to really give a highlight to media artists and other thinkers around in our digital age. We are here in the category of artificial intelligence and life art. It's a hybrid category, our newest category and it combines fields of biotech, robotics, kinetics and has a range very wide till performative and live art situations. Sound for Fungi brilliantly translates art science research and philosophical reflections on the nature of networks into a convincing way of audience interaction. The project began as a laboratory experiment in which Therese Schubert played sinus frequencies to fungi mycelia she collected from forests near her home in Berlin. After weeks of observing, most of them showed a positive response to the influence of sound by growing faster and denser than samples grown in the silence. The interactive and generative video installation simulates Schubert's experiments. The golden nica of the category artificial intelligence and life art goes to forensic architecture. It's a research agency comprising architects, journalists, software developers, lawyers, as well as artists. And they investigate state and corporate violence. The work which got the golden nica is about the air we breathe. There are several investigations combined to a fantastic video installation which brings together research from many areas around the world. In 2014, Israel began using aerial crop dusters to spray a toxic herbicide mix of glyphosate, oxyfluorphan and uron along the eastern perimeter of occupied Gaza. It did so in the morning hours, when easterly winds carried the toxic clouds deep onto Gazan territory, destroying Palestinian crops and livelihoods. With the help of facial recognition software, artist and activist Paolo Girio extracted the faces of 4,000 police officers that were taken during protests in France. He then created an online platform to crowdsource their identification by name. The next step of the project was to expose the officers' headshots in form of street art posters in public space. With his deliberately provocative project, Paolo Girio comments on the potential uses and misuses of facial recognition and artificial intelligence by questioning the asymmetry of power at play. The lack of privacy regulations of such technology eventually turns against the same authorities that urge the use of it. So this is my project TX1, uh, which launched fragments of my hormone replacement medications to the International Space Station. It was meant to enact a symbolic exodus to outer space for those trans, queer, and xenotypes who don't always find the Earth to be hospitable. Coupled with this project uh, is a three-channel video, which uses the TX1 project as a starting point 
for exploring questions of queer futurities, how we imagine life in outer space in Alienus. So the TX1 project is um, displayed here um, in a case that actually flew on a uh, NASA space shuttle mission. And so the magnifying glass allows you to uh, see this sphere is magnified. The Transparency of Randomness is an interactive installation generating numbers by using the well-known medium of the dice. In every box, there is a different material, for example, coffee beans, moss, cotton, or slices of an apple. With all these different surfaces, every box has its own characteristic, and nature is influencing the process of rolling the dice. But the result is still a random number, no matter which material is used. With our installation, we want to invite the visitors to think about what real randomness is, and also to think about their daily encounters with randomness. We also want to show that random numbers are a very important tool in scientific research, and they are also used in fields like artificial intelligence, physics simulations, machine learning, and cryptography. We collect all the random numbers generated by our installation and use them to calculate the number pi. The visitors can also walk through the installation and observe the perpetual motion of each individual box while they are generating the random numbers. They can also be part of the installation by taking control over one of the boxes with their own smartphone, and so they can generate their own random number. Geophagy is the practice of eating earth and earth-like substances such as clay and chalk. It is an ancient spiritual and healing practice and an integral part of culture in several countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. Masha Ru's cross-disciplinary project, The Museum of Edible Earth, presents a collection of almost 400 earth samples originating in 36 countries that are eaten for various reasons by different people across the globe. The project shows what stands behind these eating traditions and invites us to physically question our relationship to the environment and the earth. Alison Parrish pushes language into philosophical and sometimes humorous territory through a combination of phonetic embodiment and machine learning techniques. What we see here is AI-based poetry. Unlike complex AI art projects, which often require long technical definitions to be understood, the process of generating compasses is instantly legible. A model was trained with two parts, a speller, which spells words based on how they sound, and a sound outer, which sounds out words based on how they are spelled. And in this interaction, this poetry is the result. With Slave Rebellion enactment, black social and political artist Dred Scott has initiated the reenactment of the Slave Rebellion in New Orleans in 1811. He is reviving the strength of the community as they fight for emancipation and freedom. The community performance consists of more than 300 black and indigenous people dressed in 19th century clothing and traveling with horses for two days before they arrive in New Orleans. The jury has acknowledged the importance of this performance and the spiritual journey for the participants and the audience alike as extremely relevant on both local and global levels, while black history in America has proven to be misrepresented in the past. The Clean Room Paradox is a work that kind of unveils the praxis of kind of clean image of high-tech industries. Jin, the portrait of a former Samsung mobile phone factory worker, uh, kind of tells a lot of how the practice is. The video essay is combined with her personal story and with many experts who are telling kind of this systemic lack. The artist used corroded smartphones as kind of an ink 
to produce this portrait. And it's so toxic that it will kind of also corrode this portrait. And it is also inscribed in the skin of this person. Play is a project uh, where cucumbers and an AI-controlled robot engage in play. They explore each other through cucumber tendrils, which move and search for something to hold on to. And the artificial intelligence has its own metal tendrils, which it approaches the cucumbers in hopes for some contact. So in fact, this process unfolds outside of human time. And uh, we actually have a screen here that is doing time lapse in real time that shows the dynamic between the cucumber and the robot. And that is actually also precisely why we need a robot to play with cucumber plants, because we just don't have the patience to move so slowly. The category Digital Musics in Sound Art started in 1987 as the category for computer music. This category has changed a lot in keeping up with the digital development. There is a strong tendency in computer music towards immersive listening experiences and compositions that let the listener dive deep into imaginary soundscapes. And as expected, artificial intelligence also entered the field of music production. Organescape is a work that tried to recall the tradition of, of uh, organ sounds, uh, focus on the idea of mimesis. So I create for this project a set of compositions called uh, Variations, where I translate field recordings into uh, music for this instrument. And on the other hand, I create an automata with uh, different elements and small bellows that try to imitate uh, bird sounds. So it's like a, a mechanical ornithological study that uh, try to uh, go the idea of the Baroque organs when they uh, imitate uh, some escapes and include in the stops of the organ this kind of sounds of the environment. A Father's Lullaby is a community co-creative initiative uh, that brings this philosophical question that what is at loss in the absence of love. And it's centered on um, the absence of fathers due to the racial disparities of criminal justice system in the United States and the role of men in raising children in society. One of my main critical inquiries when addressing systemic inequalities is how we need to reimagine A Father's Lullaby is a multi-platform engagement, and immersive installations have three different layers of experience. One is the first encounter through this poetic lullabies and memories through multi-channel video and audio installation. The second is interactive component, that memories of fathers who are incarcerated are activated through your touch. The third layer is a public call for action to everybody to participate by singing lullabies and sharing memories and creating voice for this social justice issue. Convergence, uh, high-end music, stage, theater performance by Alexander Schubert got the golden Nike of the category digital music and sound arts this year. It's a performance in which avatars or AI-generated persons interact with the musicians in both kind of a dark stage, an uncanny situation. Peaceful. Invisible. A clear view of the night. Through a transparent interface. Always on.
Convergence features a duet between composer and electronics performer Douglas McCorland and augmented double bassist Alexander Gabris. The project explores interactivity and agency between acoustic and electronic elements and the mediation of gesture and musical materials in three-dimensional space. Using eight microphones, eight transducers, a sensor glove, audio controls and machine learning, these ideas collide in a densely chaotic and gestural work which encourages both performers to push their respective limits and the limits of this complex performance system. This year, there's a new special prize, which kind of memorizes Isao Tomita, a Japanese musician and really a legend. He combined classical music and instruments with electronic devices in a very innovative and interesting way. And he was inspiring so much, also a younger generation. And that's why Ars Electronica this year decided to invent this new prize. Abdome by Kayam Alami and Counterpoint got this very first Isao Tomita special prize because it is a very innovative tool for musicians. It's a project and a software system which enable to go beyond the Western canon, especially the notation system of the Western is so binding that not all kind of musical production really fits in. So it's a way to go beyond. I would like to introduce you the category of computer animation, one of the oldest categories of the Prias Electronica. The range of the category goes from abstract works to character animations, physical video installations, and all the way to virtual reality like VR, AR, or MR. In Weston, the visitor is watching a virtual human being that is a digital cross between a progeria patient, a person suffering of a disorder that causes premature aging, and a laboratory rat. The computer animation deals with the artist duo's fear for a future upper class with perfect people who can buy knowledge to stay young. The project wants to ask the unpleasant question about what will happen to those who have no access to the possibilities of genetic engineering. The Earth Scraper by US artist Peter Burr tells the story of a decaying underground megastructure, a digital portrait of a sick building. It simulates a habitat whose smart architecture is overseen by artificial intelligences, spatial and social designers that observe, learn, and make changes to the system. Unaware of the extended control by these entities, the members of this virtual community talk about their surrounding relationship and their mental health. In her cliché-ridden art documentary, Veneta Androva addresses the systematic discrimination of women in art and also the myth of the male genius that still prevails. 
Introducing the female AI artist Ava, Androva focuses on the lack of female perspectives in the field of artificial intelligence today. Be it Siri, Alexa, Cortana, Samantha, all these algorithms which are designed to serve human needs are gendered as female and by that tend to reproduce problematic stereotypes about the role of women in society. In an art world where women artists are still the minority on the global art market, I, as a male constructed, female, and an artist, have the task to contribute to more diversity in the art world. I'm giving a female perspective on things. Creativity and procreativity could also be female attributes. Ava looked at me through those mysterious eyes of hers. She is so beautiful, I thought. We asked kindly if we could silently observe her working process, and she gave us her permission. This year's Golden Nike of the computer animation, When the Sea Sends Forth a Forest, is dedicated to the Chinese inhabitants of Cambodia in the 1970s, which were expelled, persecuted by the Rouge Khmer regime. The artist Guang Li Liu uses regime propaganda videos as well as the horrific images that made the way around the world after the fall of the regime. By interweaving the old recordings with 3D images generated by a game engine, Liu tells a vivid story, narrated by a contemporary witness. A tender personal history unfurls as a virtual reality reconstruction of a very recent past. Opera by US artist Eric O oh is a huge installation that portraits our society and history with all its diversity of beauty and absurdity. A civilization rises and falls in a continuous movement. This exquisite work of animation gets your attention immediately and holds it all the way. The animated film is inspired by Renaissance fresco paintings and artists such as Michelangelo, Botticelli or Bosch. With thousands of details, Eric O recounts a repetitive human history and provides insight into the range of human emotions. His opera is hopeful and funny and thoughtful and frightening and sad all at once. It challenges us to question the mechanisms of society and our own behavior. The OÖ Landeskultur GmbH is currently showing various exhibitions. To two of them, we want to draw your attention. Here at the OK, we are showing this year's Höhenrausch, titled Like in Paradise. And at the Francisco Carolinum, the media art exhibition, um, Proof of Art about the origins of media art up to NFTs, is currently on view.
Mensch, jetzt hör auf, mich zu filmen! Ich habe keine Lust mehr, Placebo-Kunststückchen zu posten. Halt mal, ich mach da was ganz Neues draus. Hybrid, performative and funky. A star will be born again. In the shallow, shallow. Eine Auferstehung? Postmoderne Renaissance oder Neorenaissance? Du glaubst also an die Wiedergeburt des Theaters nach der Pandemie im Sinne seiner Erneuerung? Meinst du nicht, die Leute werden sagen, oh nee, nee, das haben wir aber schon immer so gemacht. Das kann mal schön so bleiben, wie es war, jawohl! Denk doch mal an Shakespeare, das elisabethanische Theater, die englische Renaissance, das war auch nach der Pest, nach der Seuche. Oder Italien, hey. Firenze, die Hallo. Sixtinische Kapelle, der vitruvianische Mensch, die Zentralperspektive, David von Michelangelo, Sgraffito an den Häusern, Massage, mit seiner Langhals-Madonna, die Kanäle in Venedig, das neue Harmoniegefühl in der Musik und die Etablierung des Dreiklangs in der Musiktheorie, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina und an der Loire das Chateau de Chambord oder in Deutschland Albrecht Dürer. Till Eulenspiegel, der Kranach, Alter, die 95 Thesen, tolle Frauen wie Katharina von Bohr. Ah. Mit Viereckausschnitt und Retikül. Obwohl, das kam später. Das ist doch der reinste Macho-Kitsch, den du dir da ausmalst. Kleine Lautenspielerinnen musizieren vor Ochsenblutrotem Samtvorhang. Das gab es damals nur für eine kleine Elite, die sich unheimlich bereichert hat. Genau wie heute wieder übrigens. Den meisten Leuten ging es nämlich beschissen zu der Zeit. Ja? Die hatten nichts von dem ganzen Gerede, von Humanismus, Gerechtigkeit. Die Etablierung des heliozentrischen Weltbildes. Aus Alt, mach neu. Wir feiern jetzt das anthropozentrische Ideal, das Maß der Menschen als Maß aller Dinge, die Befreiung des Geistes, unseren politischen und persönlichen Umbruch und Erneuerung. Ja, predige wieder das Ende der Kultur und den Theatertod, statt das mal positiv zu sehen. Die Situation als pandemische Geburtshilfe für Kreativität zu begreifen, das ist ein Lichtblick. Krise als Chance, das Prinzip der schöpferischen Zerstörung, künstlerische Blüten aus der Asche des Chaos. Auf welchem Trip bist du denn? Damals war es der Blutdruck, der Buchdruck. Heute sind es die digitalen Medien und die Social Networks, die alles verändern und uns in eine andere Dimension beamen. Mit der ersten Druckmaschine kam die erste Medienrevolution. 1455, the Gutenberg Galaxy was born. Oh. Wissen war nicht mehr in Klöstern versteckt. Es wurde zugänglich. Heute ist das Gutenberg-Projekt im Netz. Da kannst du nicht mehr zurück. Da steppt jetzt der Bär. Livestreaming. Damit kriegst du auf einen Schlag. 10.000 Leute! Genau, die glotzen doch eh schon den ganzen Tag auf ihre Bildschirme. Theater für Avatare, das hat nichts mehr mit Sinnlichkeit zu tun. Hirnfick ist das! Nee, nee, da gibt's ganz, ganz tolle, coole neue Sachen. Discord, twitch.tv slash Bluetronic oder mich auf Instagram. Du musst da ganz anders rangehen, dich als Schauspielerin neu definieren, eine Identität im digitalen Zeitalter kreieren und in ganz andere Sphären schweben. Die Wiedergeburt des Theaters aus dem Geist des Smartphones immer nach den Regeln, die Instagram und TikTok vorgeben. Ja, warum nicht? Theater muss interaktiv und digital werden. Ein Erlebnisraum, in dem nicht von oben, von der Bühne irgendwas heruntergebetet wird. Fluide Kommunikation. Alle sind Sender und Empfänger. Ein wirklich demokratisches Diskursmedium. Offen und veränderbar. Wenn das wesentliche Theater wie die Pest ist, so nicht deshalb, weil es ansteckend wirkt, sondern weil es wie die Pest das Hervorbrechen an einer latenten Tiefenschicht an Grausamkeit bedeutet. Wie die Pest ist auch das Theater zur kollektiven Entleerung von Abszessen da. Und was schlägst du vor? Wie ist denn heute dein Instagram-Page-Level? Hast du dein Community-Management aufgepeppt? Und dein Engagement-Index ist der nicht ein bisschen... Hello? Du hast zwar viele Likes, aber leider viel zu wenig Saves and Shares, Sweetheart. So wirst du nie vom Worst zum Best Performer. Your followers will be very disappointed.
with the very last session of not only today, but actually of the Ars Electronica Festival. It's coming to an end, my friends. We've heard and talked so much about the new digital deal, about how to deal with global challenges, how to move through the digital realm about the future of humanity and what comes what awaits us in the future and what possibilities and opportunities we might have. But it's not over completely yet. There's still some things to come in this closing session here. First of all, so we're going to stroll through two more gardens of the festival. And after that, we're going to talk more about today's big topic, art thinking. And we'll he hear from uh, Dominique Chen and also from Karen Palmer. We'll hear more about a project by Territorial Agency, but I'll come to all of this later. First, the gardens. The first one we're visiting is uh, based in the UK. And then we are moving to Austria's capital, Vienna. Enjoy these two gardens and find them all on the Ars Electronica website, ars.electronica.art. Hello, we are Kinda Studios, a creative science studio marrying neuroscience with creative arts. Please join us for our upcoming session in the UK Garden, Neuroaesthetics, the Future of Interdisciplinary Art. In this session, we explain the rising field of neuroaesthetics and understand why this is a crucial field for interdisciplinary arts and science collaborations. Through the workshop, we'll take you through our signature science-informed design process, which is our studio's unique method to underpin, develop, and complement creative work with neuroscience principles. We'll walk you through an example of a creative neuroscience experiment, which features works from Marshmallow Laser Feast, John Hopkins, and Tyos, helping paint a picture of how we can marry artistic and scientific collaboration. In this experiment, you'll learn about the new science of interoception, the ability to sense and feel our internal bodily sensations, and how we can use breath work and artwork to enhance this latent sense we all possess. Join us in the UK Garden at 4 p.m. Friday, the 10th of September. See you there.
these and many more impressions in all of the worldwide gardens that are part of this Art, uh, Ars Electronica festival this year. And today we've been talking a lot about art thinking, uh, an approach to try and find new perspective on things, on beliefs, on methods, on challenges by applying artistic approaches, artistic views on the world, uh, which focuses on trying to find questions. It takes curiosity to think out of the box and find a new way out of common beliefs and that's what art thinking is about. We've been discussing about art in different roles, art as journalism, art as a catalyst and also art as a compass and that's also what Dominic Chen is now going to talk about. Uh, he will be focusing on the problems of language. Uh, for example, uh, in the role of a divisioner, as we've been witnessing it in social networks over the last couple of years and months especially. So here's Dominic Chen about uh, art thinking. For me, the value of artistic expression lies in its power to provide us perspective to become others. Since the age of mythology and epic poetry, Literally works have enabled us to imagine the lived experience of others who are different from us and it evokes another life that we could have experienced. Literature can also become a compass to find a way out from our own bubbles. Humans live in an innate filter bubble without even being connected to the internet. Depending on the conditions of our birth and upbringing, the values of the people around us, we can easily live unaware of the diversity of perspectives available to us. I believe that literature allows us to get out of such a bubble imaginatively and creatively, to feel, empathize and approach the lives of people we have never met. This is why I have been working to create opportunities to gain perspectives to become others using artistic expression and design methodologies. Let me introduce some of my activities. In the installation work, Last Words, Type Trace, which I created with artist Takumi Endo for the Aichi Triennale 2019. More than 2,000 people answered the question, if you were to disappear from the world in 10 minutes, who would you leave a message for? The text, showing the process of more than 2,000 people who repeatedly stagnate, write and erase, and confront the finitude of their own lives, all resonates directly with the reader, like literally works evoking a life different from the one they have lived. By looking at the dynamic process of writing rather than the static text, there is room to better imagine the intentionality of the writer. Today we are still at the mercy of the power of words and social networking services seem to be destroying the democratic assumption that we can understand each other if we communicate rationally. Strong voices that incite confrontation and division are gaining more and more influence and we are frequently unable to understand each other even in situations where we should be able to. On the other hand, why don't we think of ourselves as inherently unable to understand each other? Even if we speak the same language, we cannot understand each other fully. If we think about it that way, I think we can recognize the value of the process of trying to understand each other. Following this idea, I directed the exhibition Translations, Understanding, Misunderstanding, held at 2121 Design Site, where I also took part in the creation of some of the works. In the artist Pei Ying Lin's video work, Unspeakableness, Personalized Language, she asked multilingual people to mix up all the languages they speak to write a text using the words they like best in each language and read it out loud. I participated in her work and read out the director's message for the exhibition in my own French, Japanese, English and Chinese words. This is a message that can only be understood in its entirety by someone who understands all these languages. But the text is much more nuanced and expansive than if I had written it in only one language. Normalement, quand on parle de la traduction, we refer to a situation in which other language dekakareta, spoken words, or dans d'autres langages, need transform. However, it's no language dekotoba has the process itself can be considered in sort of the traduction. And in found in translation, 
an installation work I created in collaboration with Google Creative Lab and Studio The Green Isle. We designed an experiment that allows visitors to experience the algorithmic world of Google Translate and be showered with multiple languages. Normally, machine translation is used for one-to-one -one translation, but in this work, when you utter a single word, it is translated into 23 different languages and returned to you as audio. When looking at a technological advancement, one might think as if all languages would one day become translatable reciprocally. But we should never forget that there are languages in the world that can never be accurately translated and that our thoughts and perceptions are also diverse thanks to this untranslatability. Based on the idea of linguistic relativism, which states that each language has its own way of perceiving the world, this work makes you realize that your words are potentially connected to a multitude of different languages around the world, but at the same time each language has its own world, or umwelt. I am also working to communicate with non-human beings, I like to grow fermented foods, and I want to know how the fermenting microorganisms feel. So I am researching and developing a robot called Nukabot that translates their status into human language. Hey, Nuka. An interesting finding of this project is that Talking to microbes on a daily basis can increase our attachment to them. The theme of building a relationship of mutual care with the most inscrutable of living organisms, the microbes, can also be a compass for us to break free of our anthropocentrism through our relationship with the Earth's soil, other natural entities, and more than human worlds. So that was Dominic Chen about art thinking and his uh, linguistic approach. And now we're coming to Karen Palmer, uh, who says that she's a storyteller from the future, who's come back to save us from what's to come by the power of stories and storytelling. Karen Palmer is an artist who creates immersive film experiences with uh, artificial intelligence and behavioristic psychology. And her work seeks to democratize technology and artificial intelligence through the means of open source solutions. Here she is about art thinking. My name is Karen Palmer and I'm the storyteller from the future and I've come back to enable you to survive what is to come through the power of storytelling. where I come from, we use the power of storytelling to envision strategies of liberation, empowering people to not just imagine alternative futures, but create the tools, networks and open source tech to fulfill the visions. This is known as world building. For world building. I'm currently in the time developing this blueprint now. I've titled this initiative, Hack the Future Labs. Think of action tanks at the intersection of art, tech, neuroscience, activism, social justice, spirituality, and the parkour philosophy of moving through fear. These labs inspire my immersive experiences. 
I create films that watch you back using AI and facial recognition. The film narrative branches in real time, depending on your emotional response, making you conscious of your subconscious behavior to enable you to become more self-aware and ultimately move through fear. I've titled this process Affirmative Impact. It was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. I felt the adrenaline through my veins now. It taught me something, it taught me a lot. It's like I've gone in and out of my consciousness, you know what I'm saying? Designed for the tumultuous world in which we now find ourselves, where people are feeling helpless and hopeless, these digital experiences are modern mythology simulations of rites of passage. Prime must no longer be passive observers in the narrative. In the same way, we can no longer be a passive observer in the narrative of our life. My immersive experience of Riot made the participant conscious of their subconscious fear. I just did the Riot experience and it was awesome. It was so fascinating. I'm studying to be a psychologist and I thought that this would revolutionize how we see and interact with the world around. Then Perception I.O. made the participant aware of their own potential implicit bias. Hey you! Ghost, we stand right there! We stand still. Keep your hands where I can see them. Keep your hands where I can see them. There's been a burglar in the neighborhood. You fit the description. That was Karen Palmer and her work. And now, in this next section, we're going to look at a project which is a good example for art as a catalyst. Territorial Agency, that's an independent organization, an organization established by the architects and urbanists uh, John Palmesino and Anne-Sophie Rönskog. Their organization combines contemporary architecture, spatial and territorial planning, advocacy and art, and so much more. They won the prestigious Starts Prize for their project Oceans in Transformation, which investigates the impact of human activity on the global oceans, which hence work as a medium. It's a project about the Anthropocene epoch and uh, as is generally the focus of territorial agencies work and here's a clip on that
Territorial Agency is an independent organization that combines contemporary architecture, art, technology, science, spatial analysis to advocate and act towards integrated territorial transformations. Our focus is in building capacity to act on the complex challenges of the Anthropocene. We work on architecture, the relation between polities and the material spaces of operation. It is a rapidly shifting relation with uh, both collective forms, the body politics and the structure and spaces we shape, undergoing complex transformations. They have shaped the magnitude of human spaces through incredible acceleration that has now impacted the dynamics of the Earth. Art thinking is for us a way of engaging different groups, individuals, organizations and institutions to reimagine the distributed agencies they operate in and depend on. We live in a world shaped by a multiplicity of forces acting simultaneously. A territorial agency, we devise aesthetic structures to form and give shape to public assemblies, where different ways of conceiving a space are simultaneously presented together. We shape spaces for diplomatic encounters between different ways of knowing, different modes of uh, being, different concepts of the contemporary. We operate public diplomacy as an arrangement where different researchers, institutions, groups and individuals set out simultaneously different visions where the values need to be renegotiated in order to be held in common. Oceans in Transformation is a research into the contemporary impact of humans on the ocean. We ask how to become sensitive to the multiple changes that are modifying the global ocean, how to encounter the many modes of thinking it, and how to form new ways to collaborate in order to safeguard the main source of life of the planet. The relations between the atmosphere, the land and the ocean are being radically altered by the intensification of these human activities. The rise of the Anthropocene epoch cuts across pre-existing territories. It reshapes boundaries, reconfigures long-term inhabitation forms and modes of being. Together with scientists and artists, we investigate how these disruptions are modeling different ways of knowing and being with the ocean. Oceans in Transformation addresses the contemporary transformations of the ocean by building complex dynamic images from oceanic scientific datasets. The oceans are still largely unknown. And the difficult and complex event of the scientific knowledge of climate change is bringing more and more efforts to understand their dynamics. Remote sensing, buoys, multi-beam sonar soundings, GPS tracking of animals, multi-year detection of geophysical parameters, complex circulation computational models are now being beginning to form a new image of the ocean. The project is organized through a series of uh, tangent lines that cross uh, the different oceans and encounter along their trajectories a number of uh, transformation processes. They are transformation processes of long-term inhabitation of different human populations in, of the oceans and they are the tipping element of the contemporary Earth system. We intersect along these tangent line a number of uh, different and adjacent processes, a number of different epistemes, a number of different ways of thinking, a number of uh, a growing uh, insecurity about what is happening to the ocean. The ocean is a sensorium. It records the transformations of the Earth in its complex dynamics, and it inscribes back its cycles in the evolutions and adaptations of life forms. The global ocean is changing its circulation, energies, interactions and ecologies. It is the most dynamic and sensitive component of our living planet, yet the most unknown.
That was the work of uh, Territorial Agency and their project Oceans in Transformation. And so this really is nearly the end of the Ars Electronica Festival 2021. I'm about to hand over this last session on this channel and on this day to the team who's behind of all this, to the team who's been working all year long to make this festival possible and especially hard over the last couple of days. Some bottles of champagne are being popped backstage and behind the scenes already now. And they are going to recapitulate over this festival, over their impressions and experiences and their thoughts and I uh, really want to take this opportunity and thank you all. Thank you for watching and thank you all, the whole team here on site, behind the scenes, behind the festival for making this possible. <laughs> it's been a pleasure being here. <laughs> and now I wish you a nice uh, more one more hour of session with the organizing team, the behind the scenes faces and brains of all of this. So, please, come on stage, people of the festival, of the Ars Electronica. Ladies, okay. first. Ich glaube schon, oder? Jetzt schon? Ja. Ja, und der Gaffer gibt einen Platz, oder? Fuck. Du musst dir die mit. Du kehrst da dazu. Nobody can escape. <laughs> no, it's like gotcha. such an in and out I'm handing over now. And so, the stage is all yours. Thank you Thank so you, much, Connie, Connie <laughs> for this fantastic <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, Muff. It's your turn. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I just repeat what, uh, what, what Connie said before. This is the last sequence of the this year's festival. And um, I see here lucky but tired faces. <laughs> 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 Behind these smiling faces, they are rather potato small, <laughs> potato <laughs> brains, <laughs> <laughs> roasted <laughs> and fried <laughs> over five days. No, uh, there is nothing, nothing too, too, many, too much to add. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, we had uh, um, a wonderful experience here. We will go deeper anyways afterwards, but it was not just us. It was the many, many gardens out there. Um, uh, we had one exhibition dedicated to uh, those garden partners. It is the, absence, uh, the Symphony of Absence, where we created like a space with uh, windows into those worlds that are not able to, to come to our world or to, yeah. Uh, but um, our partners did uh, wonderful programs and I think you are going to introduce us a little bit in that. Yes, but first we should have a look at what the Symphony of Absence actually looks like. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Once and for all now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you to everyone out there. Thank you for preparing this incredible festival. Thank you for bringing in your team, the artists, uh, the garden partners, everyone that was so much involved in making this festival into this incredible platform all around the world. 
we couldn't be more happy about what we've seen in the last five days all the engagement online all the interaction there the friendships that have been made and especially a huge thank you to all of our garden partners who spent countless nights and days developing their program in the last weeks and months actually i think we should say yes. cheers to that cheers to cheers. <laughs> cheers. cheers. Cheers! Also, also cheers to us. Yes. Oh, yes, of course, that comes next. <laughs> no, but in, we really, I mean, we had uh, 86 gardens around the world, and garden means that usually there is not just one institution involved, but at least two or three with countless team members that are working behind the scenes with artists that have been invited. Some of them were able to travel there. They invited their guests to come there. They staged physical exhibitions, conferences, and so on. And the gardens actually were in total whoop, um, 186 partners that were actively involved and they all came from uh, 47 countries. I think that is simply amazing and I'm more than proud and happy that yes, we all together managed this again. But let's have a look at this incredible video where you see at least a little bit of what the gardens did this year. So, recap Wednesday. I think we are going through the whole festival week now and uh, think a little bit or talk a little bit about our highlights. If you ever have looked at the schedule of the festival, you know, if you're really taking this serious, then <laughs> we probably s are sitting here for several hours because actually we should start with Tuesday highlights, okay, which was the, <laughs> the uh, opening already of our... Um, presence in the center of the city and I think in terms of highlights really to start is of course this combination not only just single projects but to really have so many places here in the city in the center with the Oka with the cyber arts with the art university with the Arts electronica center and only this and the arts amt mm -hmm. I mean the incredible exhibitions uh, one of the highlights on Tuesday and then I come to Wednesday <laughs> was definitely uh, the, the super super nice way how the uh, father's lullabies have been installed in the cyber arts oh. exhibition the project itself of course is really a great project mm -hmm. this was clear from the beginning but you could do it quite normal and then the way, of course, how the artists uh, conceived it, but also how the OCA team together with the artists were able to realize it, really exceptional. Yes. The next highlight for me is in the Ars Electronica Center, really the, the new exhibition, There is no Planet B. Uh, Martin is one of the key responsible person behind this. It's such a nice combination between information, technological facts, and then wonderful art projects that are really uh, creating the context. And I think this is the way uh, mm. that uh, Ars Electronica is always working at its best when we are really combining the three things, art, technology, and society. And on Wednesday, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> Please. But I have to say the highlight was actually the opening speech of our president. Yes. Right? I yes. mean, For I was sure. <laughs> we're, of course, we're all excited that uh, the president himself came not only to the opening. I mean, he spent the whole day from 10 o'clock in the morning mm. until the evening. At Ars Electronica, he even stayed quite a while at the uh, reception, drinking some beer and, of course, smoking. This is his, I think, <laughs> brand. Uh, this is kind of yes, yeah, very special thing. Uh, 
And uh, the, the speech that he gave, also it was like, I think, three or four times as long as planned. It was just wonderful. Mm. And uh, well, of course, there were a lot of interesting art projects as well. But we <laughs> might see some of them now on the video that is prepared to give us an idea of uh, the beginning of the festival. fantastic team members and also responsible unit managers in our team uh, and one already is on stage is Christina Mora who is the head of EU projects within our team and who would suit better than actually introducing uh, this year's Starts Day. <laughs> Yes, uh, I am super happy to talk a bit about uh, the highlights of the Festival Thursday. So among other things, the Ars Electronica Future Lab was dedicating an entire day of inspiring lectures and performances to its 25th year of existence. Mm -hmm. um, personally, <laughs> <laughs> myself, however, I spent the entire day in uh, the Circus des Wissens, um, organizing the Starts Day and overseeing the this year's Starts Day. So Starts stands for sci Science, Technology and Arts. After five days of festival, <laughs> it can be a bit hard to. Um, and it's an initiative by the European Commission all about artist-led and artist-driven innovation. And we had some really amazing speakers like uh, Tactical Tech Territorial Agency, Anastasia Pistofido and Marion uh, Real together with the Remixes Collective of the IAC, uh, we had Julie Freeman, um, we had uh, Michaela Magas, Madeline Gannon, so it was a wonderful packed day of uh, fantastic speakers and my personal highlight was kind of seeing all of the discussions that were coming out of all of these yeah, conferences really, yeah. and lectures. Um, but a lot of other things were also happening, so let's take a look at the recap of Thursday. So welcome back to the stage um, where I am now super happy to welcome Emiko Ugawa, who is the head of the pre as Electronica. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. But, uh, I would like to introduce the highlight of Friday. So Friday, was first of all, um, we start with the Blanche Magazine Symposium. Blanche Magazine was the, um, the winners of the ASOC Tonica Award for Digital Humanity. They took over and host the theme, ex uh, theme conference. And uh, they, uh, the various symp uh, symposium speakers really discussed that how internet can serve the uh, environmental sustainability or the collective 
freedomness itself. And then afterwards, right after the symposium, we did the our ceremony so that we celebrated the eight winners, but unfortunately still uh, all of the Godenica winners, um, Start Flight winners could not come, but still it was a very nice moment. And the final one continued to the big concert night. The Bruckner House Orchestra Linz, um, conducted by um, Markus Poschner, they played the wonderful Bluk uh, Anton Bluckner uh, symposium, uh, <laughs> symposium. Oops, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> symphony number nine. And in the outside, um, that audience's experience. To me, it was a so much nice highlight with this physical experience, meet with people, celebrate together, together with people, and the weather was so nice. We see the beautiful <laughs> stars and enjoy the sound. So please have a look at the video. And now I would like to introduce our colleague, Alala Wesenbach. She is the head of um, uh, export. Please introduce your... Saturday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we arrived on Saturday, right? It was a iLab day, the European Artificial Intelligence Lab, which is co-founded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. Ah. Yes, uh, it allowed us to do a really nice deep dive, dive into the topic of AI. We had a huge uh, conference program that yeah, was quite comprehensive and uh, it's also worth checking it out because some of these programs, or actually all of them, of the conference programs, are still available uh, on our Swapcard platform, so that is definitely a place where you can re-watch the talks, which I will definitely do. Um, yeah, right? <laughs> um, uh, what, o what else happened on Saturday? It was uh, the Create Your World award ceremony. It's also one of my personal highlights, the youth program, the youth prize. pre Ars Electronica is not only for the established ones, it's the ones, the next generation, and the really young ones. And the energy that you can feel at this ceremony is so unique. Yeah, it's uh, a, an event that I can highly recommend for every festival. Um, my very personal hi highlight, however, was uh, to have the opportunity to interview Cosima Terrasse and Moritz Riesewig from two of the trio from Gruppe Lao Kohn. They have an incredible artwork also in the exhibition, Made to Measure. It's also available online, so maybe check it out online. It's also a great experience there. Last but not least, we had also uh, <laughs> the <laughs> farmer's market. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I did this once and I'm already still nervous. We had the farmer's market here. Uh, it's also a highlight because it brings in the local shops and local farmers with their produce. And I remember that I had to pick up Martin when he was getting a labor cars. And uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's a culinary uh, journey <laughs> through <laughs> Upper Austria. I do. So, yeah, that was definitely a really amazing Saturday. And uh, after wrapping up the day at the university stage with a little dancing to Zanjin's uh, DJ set, it rounded up the, the day perfectly. Let's take a look.
except on Sunday, it's the last day of the festival. And honestly, I'm a little bit sad. And I know that not everyone shares this feeling. <laughs> but besides being a little bit sad, I think we're all rather tired. But we had the chance of actually going to the OCA Center quickly to have a look at the Cybers exhibition. Gerfried mentioned it already. It really, really is well done. It was an actual pleasure, pleasure to be there. But also here on campus happened quite a lot. We were still in the lucky situation of just having a couple of rain drops in the morning and then the sun came out. And I think now that uh, outside everything is closed, it can rain again, finally. <laughs> no, 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 no. I have to intervene. <laughs> First of all, it shouldn't rain because there are all those super guys out there who are now doing the dismantling That's true. That's and true. they deserve nice weather as well. That's true. But Good also point. this year the festival is not really finishing because no. we have the festival university. That is true. One yeah. more week, really exciting work well, with wh the Why students. do you need to remember us now? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about highlights, you know. Yeah, yeah talking about highlights absolutely. <laughs> Highlight Festival University, please have a look at this. Yes. We're not done yet. <laughs> no, I mean it was a really beautiful day actually that mm. we had here. A little bit more chill. Um, it was a really nice atmosphere. We had the pre forum and we had the art thinking forum, so still really high level, fantastic content but also the time to relax and enjoy what we've created, have a final look through the exhibitions before now again they are dismantled. But back Soon. to this university. There okay, was yeah, go for the university, please. <laughs> no, but, just, <laughs> but just quickly, because Laura said that uh, only the U19 ceremony created such a positive energy. No. It was so authentic and so <laughs> grounded, so to speak. But the same happened today. It was yeah. this, this, this group of people who were actually were presenting, they op were occupying uh, the entire stage that we built actually for them and we named after them. And they were presenting to themselves. And the big hands they gave to each other and the quality and the toughness yes. of those guys. I mean, they, that reminded me really on these small kids uh, from U19 presenting their pieces. It, I told them then you brought in an, not only this energy the festival needs, but they brought in a new color. I mean, this is a new epicenter of a yeah. festival of the 21st yeah. century, exhibiting people's opinion mm. re represented by themselves. Yeah, having it's them here with us to voice their amazing. opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. And I think what is most astonishing with us within such a festival production is really that every single program, every single session, every single format is produced behind the scenes with so many team members. And this is really a big thank you to all of you out there, to this wonderful, fantastic, exciting, inspiring mm. team we have. That's the biggest asset, I think, of our Ars Electronica, and it is a quality assurance it is a joy to work with all of you before you start please go <laughs> go to the toilet before or uh, uh, get some drinks because it would simply disrespectful if you would break this um, two hours and a half last yeah, we might need a little bit of time now. All, and everybody no because we have such a fantastic team we I think do have it's worth yeah. reading out every single yes, name yes absolutely it's the most important as electronic lecture yes. <laughs> exactly <laughs> I am actually starting in an... Well, we should start with uh, <laughs> Karl Julian Schmiedinger, who unfortunately is not with us, but who is the head of the, or the technical head yes. of the festival and who is outside there already running around with his team to dismantle, unfortunately, again, everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then we should also mention Hans-Christian Merkel, yes. who is uh, the head of the U19. And do you have some more to mention? <laughs> I have okay. uh, let's plenty. Go for this now. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we should get yeah. a refill in wow. between. Yeah. We need a truck to do. So, I think she wants to start. Yes. 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 Cheers to okay. Pablo Alejandro Lopez Alonso, Lea Sophie Bernhard, Klaus Birkelbauer, Hortense Boulet Ifrin, Bernd Breitenauer, Michael Burgstaller, Anna Maria Carabellea. Magde Magdalena Giegler, Hannes Franks, Petra Freimund, Marion Friedl, Jessica Galerov, Nils Gallist, 
Katharina Knafaki, Roland Grillberger, Jürgen Hagler, Jakob Hanna, Rita Heinz, Moritz Haringer, Caroline Heim. It's only a age. Come on, come on, come on, come on. <lacht> Alex Hens, Randolf Helmstetter, Markus Hilbrand, Manuela Hillmann, Ferenc Hirt, Miko Jeffries, Jovano Jankov, Lisa Keins, Alexandra Kalinowska, Mirela Kadanska, Katharina Kleubhofer, Ruth Köchel, Lisa Lepschi, Maria Koller, Andrea Kohlhut, Veronika Krenn, Gisem Kuss, Katja Lux, Severin Mate, Maya Makino, Claudia Moser, Andrew Newman, Daniel Nimmervoll, Emiko Gaba, äh, Maria Nefeli Panetzos, Victoria Pila, äh, Benjamin Peter Chatter, Roman Beersdorfer, Christina Radner, Marco Reiner, Alexander Röck, Annika Rode, Michael Samhaber, Mariana Schädler, Thomas Christian Schlager, Julian Schmiederer, Armin Seidel, Lisa Schekelgolva, Carla Spilotini, Maurizio Suarez, äh, Bich dran, Lukas Draxler, Felix Tröbinger, Jochen Tu, Edin Turalic, jo jo Joschi Wittiger, Helena Wittiger, Laura Welzenbach, Alexandra, Alexander Wörern, Vivian Zech, Christopher Sonnleitner, Robert Bauernhansel, Shirin Davis, Martin Hieselmeier, Barbara Hinterleitner, Johanna Leitner, Katja Kreuzhuber, Mario Gomerda, äh, Romerda Gomez, Mario Schmidhuber, Jastan Zahn, <lacht> Eva Zagmaktian, Katja Bosic, Manuela Bruckner, Manon Chavot. Then we have Dominik Lengauer, uh, Omar Jum Omari, Florian Miesenberger, Patrick Buchinger. I shouldn't have started with the Prosecco. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have, of course, a fantastic team at Ars Electronica. That was only those who are actually actively participating in the production, but there are so many people behind also in the corporate services, in the management, also in the museum, of course, mm -hmm. in producing the 25th anniversary of Future Lab. So actually, it's probably even 200 more. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's, 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 and then we right. have, of course, also so many other team members from subcontracting parties, from companies, technicians working for us, with us in uh, all the production departments. So yes, this is a fantastic team and a big applause, I would say. Yeah, we want to that <laughs> To give you also some spirit of our team, we have prepared a behind the scenes video one day before the festival. So when the adrenaline was still there um, and um, the excitement uh, was a heads up, let's look into it. <laughs> The video was, was actually shorter than the wonderful <laughs> recital <laughs> that um, Froni gave. And I mean, I think it all uh, shows very nicely this energy and the spirit in our team. And again, this was just the Linz team, uh, thinking of the 86 yeah. garden, thinking of the 180 something institutions <laughs> behind it. And each of these institutions having their teams on their own being distributed all over the world. I mean, this is not just for the fun or for the sake yeah. of it. 
this is of course an energy that unfolds because I think everybody in all these places who participated and also our audiences really believes that we need to get into action. I mean, this idea of calling the festival title this year the new digital deal is of course not just a nice theoretical reflection and having a great week together, but I think it's really also a wonderful recipe. It shows almost like a kind of toolkit of possibilities for all of us how to get into action. And uh, we see this as a very uh, important uh, call for action towards us, towards us electronica. I think with projects like the Festival University and many things that we are already planning also in this collaboration with the university, in collaboration with many partners, um, we will continue this work to really bring in art as a very important contribution to the not only discussion but also to the development of alternatives models for our future. And this is definitely something that I want to extend to all of you now out there, to all the partners keep on doing this, uh, and to all the people who might have been inspired by uh, individual programs or projects of this festival, keep on doing this, uh, think of new activities. In particular, when we think of a call of action, it's also a call for collaboration. I think a very important part that this festival shows that it's not the effort of individuals, it's not the effort or the achievement of individual institutions, it only works if we work together. And this was also a motto that I found very nicely in the conception this year of our big concert night, the format that we are having for so many years already, where just the encounter the combination of the world of Ars Electronica with the world of classical music, the laptop musicians of Ars Electronica with the whole orchestra and the instruments of the Brucken Orchestra. This year also with a wonderful choir, the Company of Music, where suddenly the music of uh, the last, last century connected with the music of the last century leading to music and sound art of our days. This journey through uh, the time, but also this combination of the physical human analog world with the digital world. These are very paradigmatic uh, elements uh, that uh, these art projects are always really putting up uh, so super nicely. And I think we have a also very nice um, video which only shows only a, a small excerpt of this concert night because the concert night was actually going on for many, many hours. But I think the video shows this spirit, this energy, and it also shows how nicely this environment here really works for a festival here at the JKU. And I would like to use this also uh, as an opportunity to really especially put a big thank you to all the people from the JKU mm -hmm. that helped you and your team really to put this up. I mean, you have to imagine this is a university. They are used to certain kind of procedures, how things are happening. They're used to a summer. They, and and they, they are usually used that uh, summer should be maybe the time where it's not so super packed. But then all these hundreds of people that you mentioned, it's, it's like the swarm that <laughs> is coming here and converting uh, the university. But the, the, the warm welcome, yeah. the, 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 yeah, the, the will, to help us to make things happening here is just incredible. And of course, uh, on top of it is Meinhard Lukas, the rector here of the university, who is also as a person very involved uh, in the development of the festival. Any s other things I have to mention? <laughs> but the good thing is, you know, I'm the artistic director of Ars Electronica. But there is this guy who is <laughs> <laughs> responsible cheers, cheers. for all the activities of the festival. So if I make a mistake, it's not a problem. But you have now the final task. <laughs> make the final moderation of this year. Um, I, I have a microphone. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you are the director. Right? Uh, yeah, everything set. <coughs> that was the festival, and it was a festival. It felt like uh, a real one. No, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, uh, we enjoyed it. it. We will be there next year. And um, good night, John Boy. <laughs>
<laughs> Good morning to the other side. <laughs> so, hello, uh, friends from Ars Electronica. Uh, my name is Renata Avila. I'm 40, almost as old as the festival and the initiative. And um, this is my call of action. My call of action after, like, uh, you know, hearing all the talks and witnessing all the action here is to connect technology with politics. So my ask to the community is get involved into pol in politics. You don't need to be the candidate, although it might be great to have communities and people and leaders that understand and love technology and the emanci emancipatory power of technology to get involved. Uh, but demand it from your political party, demand it from leaders, demand a positive vision that will take back the tech for the people and mobilize to get the funding, to get the support, to get the action we need to re-democratize technology. We cannot leave the future, leave our digital future to tech giants from abroad. We need to see the digital future here, now. Get involved, get active, demand it in the polls, or maybe, you know, run as a candidate and bring the amazing agenda of Arts Electronica, of the positive emancipatory power of technology into the mainstream of politics. I'm Glacier Kuang, a Hong Kong activist born and raised in Hong Kong. I'm currently living in self and post exile in Germany because of the activism that I do fighting for freedom and democracy in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is in dire straits right now. The civil society has been dismantled by the government and activists have been cracked down on. So I would love to ask you to share news about Hong Kong, to understand what's happening in Hong Kong and the threat that's coming from China to, de to the democracy in the world. I would also love you to share news about Hong Kong and the social media, to talk about Hong Kong with your friends and family and understand China's influence in your own country. I hope that one day I'll be able to return to Hong Kong to talk about the stories that I've heard from different people on different parts of the world fighting for democracy. And I hope you would help me do the job as well. Thank you very much. Tech cannot belong only to those roughly two billion people who are connected, who are well educated according to standards, who are the ones who live usually in what we call the global north and the rich countries of this world. We are 8 billion and so that must change. AI, um, augmented and virtual reality, digital development, that belongs to all of us. And why do we need it? Because our globe can only survive if we can understand it and if we comprehend it as a brain. The more connections are made, the more synapses opening, the better and the more sustainable our Earth, our globe will manage the challenges, which of course are just seemingly unsurmountable. But we can do it. We have invented a lot. A lot of people have tried things. A lot of people have good practice, but also worse practice, bad practice. These are experiences we need to share. And that sharing, that sharing that must also be accessible to all those who are disconnected, dispossessed populations in the parts of the world which we don't even see. Making that knowledge available, that is what we call the switchboard, the global switchboard, the social switchboard of this world. And um, there's no reason that we can't take those uh, resources, those capacities, those technologies in our hands and make our world a little bit more just. Technology is an extension of our mind and our bodies and has already dominated the way that we think, we judge, we explore and we imagine. My call to action has three folds. The first one is a radical shift, a call for radical shift in our philosophy. 
of how we have been um, defining interest and profits based on individualism and individualism alone and how we really need to reevaluate our values um, of what is considered worthy of investment and that's from social justice to environmental to geopolitical um, conflicts. The second is um, to the top decision makers who exclusively have the say on what the technology should do and look like. And that's for um, a call to share the table for decision making. And when we consider inclusion at the table, is not an act of charity and it's not a favor to others. Without it, it's flying with one wing and seeing through one eye. And the third call to action is to all individuals to take ownership of uh, the change and technology and what we want to imagine for the future. And it is through that collective wisdom alone that we could reimagine our human society. So then, it seems that was it. That was the 2021 edition of the Ars Electronica Festivals. A new digital deal was it titled. I think this was not just a festival like we had it in the last years. We were offering ourselves as a platform and you, you partners, you protagonists, you participators, you friends, you were utilizing us. And we were asking you what would be the action if a call to action would, would be out there. And there came so many extremely clever and interesting things, so many things and suggestions that were showing us or that are showing us that it's not done so far, that there is still a lot of opportunity for us, a lot of opportunity if we keep on collaborating, if we keep on listening to us and to what is going on out there. Us as us Electronica, an association, we will not go into the winter sleep now, like we did it in the last years. Wake up again and wait until our artistical director comes with a new title for the next years. We take what you said on, us, on our platform serious and we try to involve and embed this in, into our daily actions. Us as private persons, the entire team, and I know that, but also as a group, as a swarm, that together makes this wonderful brand so shining, the Ars Electronica and the festival. I think it is time that we stop blowing out hot air and that we start trying it. It is totally clear that we will make a lot of mistakes, but I can promise that we will keep on trying it. And next year when we meet again, I will come up with less pathetic words than rather more with real things that we did thanks to what you did on our platform. I see you hopefully soon and in person. Bye bye. <laughs>